Okay, so let's see. Let's wait for a few more minutes. Just let people join us. Okay, so let's see. Let's wait for a few more minutes. Just let people join us. Have, All right, I think we can just get started. Um, welcome everyone to this workshop. This is a virtual online uh, Acura uh, workshop on visual inertial navigation systems. And um, it's, been, it's been two years since we last, last time we, we had this uh, workshop at IROS 19 at McCall. And I think it's, uh, uh, it's good to you know to continue these efforts because we got many requests from a community, and uh, so we decided to to have this workshop at Acura. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we cannot meet uh, in person physically. So we have this uh, virtual meeting, and uh, but this is still good. I think we have even probably we can reach even broader um, um, audience. So as of now, we have over 50 people uh, online. I think there are also um, quite a few people on YouTube channels. And because of course, because of the um, time differences, it's sometimes it's difficult for some people to join, um, for example, from the West Coast, which is too early for them. And uh, also it might be le too late for those who are in, in Asia, for example, for the late part of the uh, program. But anyway, um, we, uh, you know, as we promised, we, 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 we just go ahead to, to have this meeting online. And uh, again, welcome everyone to online. And my name is Paul Huang, and I'm from um, Delaware. And uh, I'm along with the other um, organizers to organize this uh, virtual uh, workshop. So just to um, to kind of to get started, why we are why we are interested in this uh, workshop and why we care about the visual inertial navigation systems, and one of the motivations is because these two sensors are commonplace and people truly um, can envision that there are many many potential applications by using these two sensors from AR VR to to drones, to, to autonomous vehicles. And uh, really the motivation is driven by the, the potential applications. And the goals of this workshop is really try to bring together people, in particular the, the, the top researchers and scholars from both academia and industry to share this, their cutting edge results, their insights, their thoughts on, on visual inertial navigation and beyond. And, I think there's some talks, um, really not just a visual inertia. I, I think it even go beyond the visual inertia navigation. Talk about perception. Talk about, um, you know, working with the different robots, and we also try to, of course, try to uh, promote the, the results, the, the the latest research results from again from both uh, academics and uh, and uh, industry. And we hope, hopefully, we can also open a discussion in the community to to continue the discussion. Um, what are the technical challenges and what's the future directions for this uh, very promising, very emerging 
technologies going from here. And uh, just just kind of to um, to give people um, kind of a glimpse of who are working behind the scene. So my, again, I'm Paul Huang from Delaware, and uh, along with the the, the other four um, four guys, and uh, probably no more to to introduce to to introduce. Like Soji from uh, Hong Kong uh, University of Scientist Technology and Michael Case from CMU and Sturgis from Minnesota and now is at Apple and John Leonard from MIT. And we were the, the organizers and uh, tried to you know, bring together all the people from, from academia and industry to, to share some of the, um, the insights and also some of the latest results with the, the community. And we are very, very happy and very, very, very uh, honored to have all these uh, invited speakers um, and just listed here. And some of them, uh, most of them um, probably are very familiar to, 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 to the people who are working on this domain. For example, Stefan Lutnick from uh, TUM and uh, used to be his you know, Imperial College. And Luke Carnell from um, Carnell from MRT, Morris Fallon from Oxford, Giuseppe from NYU, and then Jonathan Kelly from Toronto, and also we also lined with uh, quite a few people from industry, from uh, Pin Tan from Alibaba, and uh, Abby from Skydial, and uh, Chow from Google, Kujian from Unreal, and also Patrick Delaware, my, my student. He will uh, start begin with the the, the first talk. And the, the program and the invited talks, uh, we have basically we have 10 invited talks and basically spend the whole day from, from early morning to, to early afternoon. And hopefully, um, you know, uh, all of you can, can make it. I think these talks are, are definitely gonna be very, very interesting and also uh, very, very insightful. And uh, along with this, uh, this invite talks, we also very uh, happy to have uh, quite a few um, paper contribution submissions. And we, in the end, we will select, we probably due to the time constraint and also space, we cannot accept all of them. So we accept the seven and to present at the workshop and 10 minutes each. And it's a short talk essentially. And because again, just be aware of that because of the, the time um, differences, difference, and some of them may just uh, present live, some of them um, uh, submitted the, the pre-recorded videos because the time is not friendly for, for, for all. Um, but we do have um, presentations for each of these seven papers. Okay, and all these papers should be very, also very, very interesting, just by reading these titles. And some important notes, because uh, uh, as of now, we are still quite, uh, you know, have uh, plenty of rooms for, for people to join in. But just in case the meeting has a maximum capacity of 500 participants, and just in case for those who are not able to join in, you can, you can go to the YouTube live stream channel. And uh, also the whole workshop will be recorded and will be made available at the, at the, at the website after Acra. And uh, also just uh, we have a physical launcher, which of course has to be for those who, who, um, who attend the meeting and physically. And uh, we have a launcher, launcher um, um, yeah. Um, June 2nd, sponsored by Maytran and UAV, which we are very, feel very, very grateful for their sponsorship. And um, also uh, just a kind of a request by my friends, also my, of course myself. We also have a special issue, uh, not, ne not necessarily for, only for this uh, workshop, but it's open for all. Uh, this special issue is about a state estimation for mobile robotics. So we lined together quite a few um, nice, um, you know, all these people, guest, guest editors, probably familiar to all of you. And uh, so if you, you, you have, uh, um, have some work along this line, very, very welcome to, to submit to this special issue. And uh, 
With any further ado, I think let's just start. The first talk will be given by Patrick Geneva. Geneva. Um, it's about visual it's an introduction to, to the Venus. And uh, Patrick is uh, my student. He's a senior PhD student in my group. And he's also, he's the, the author and the maintainer of Open Vins. Hopefully some of you may have already played with the, played with the Open Vins. And he's the, the main guy behind this effort. And uh, his research interest is really on, on visual inertial estimation, primarily focusing on the, the efficiency and the robustness aspects of, this, of the, the system. Uh, okay, so, um, so with with this really short intro, I think I, I leave the um, Patrick can take the the floor. Patrick, let me um, stop my sharing. Okay, uh, let me see. If we're beginning. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, today I'll be presenting a talk entitled. Visual Inertial Navigation Systems, an introduction. So first, a bit of a high-level outline of the talk with, along with setting some expectations. Um, I'll first introduce the visual inertial problem, which will then divide, uh, dive into the details of existing popular visual inertial estimators. Then we'll cover some of the key building blocks to VIN's algorithms, along with open source systems, data sets, and evaluation tools that you can leverage today. Um, finally, we will discuss some possible future directions of the field and then conclude. Um, I do want to note on the onset um, that while here I present, uh, I try to present as much details as possible. Um, every slide on its own can be a complete presentation. Um, so I encourage those interested to revisit the slides and investigate the citations at the bottom left um, for further reading. Uh, these slides uh, will be uploaded to the workshop website, along with the video, which will be on the YouTube channel. Um, so don't worry about trying to take pictures uh, of the presentation during it. Patrick, unmute yeah. yourself. Oh, do you hear me? Uh... This slide, do you hear me on this slide? Good now, it's okay. good now. Mm -hmm. um, so robotics ranging from extraterrestrial robots, autonomous driving, or AR and VR experiences present challenging environments for realizing estimation, perception, and slam. Visual and inertial sensors are well suited for these applications due to their low cost, small form factors, and complementary sensing modalities. Cameras provide rich environmental information while inertial measurements provide insight into the system dynamics. Visual inertial navigation systems, or uh, the acronym of VINS, describes the class of algorithms which try to leverage the camera and inertial information and produce estimates of the location of the robot. There's been significant research challenges and open problems for visual inertial navigation systems, including their computational efficiency, robustness, and accuracy. The direct improvement upon the state of the art allows for both cheaper and lower cost computational platforms to be leveraged and reductions in computational energy, which directly impacts the length of robotic mission times. And even more, and even more importantly, better robustness and higher levels of accuracy open new gateways for more demanding robotic scenarios. I'll now co cover some high level details of the current state of the art VIN systems. First, I'll cover the multi-state constraint common filter or MSEKF, which is a filter-based estimator. Then I'll cover a general batch least squares from a factor graph perspective, which leverages pre-integration. Finally, we'll touch on incremental square root information forms and discuss the equivalence of all the discussed methodologies. First, let us define the visual inertial problem that we wish to solve. Consider the case that a camera and IMU sensor pair are traveling through 3D space and the camera observes an, an environmental rock. 
As this pair moves over time, this rock is trapped in the image temporally, while we additionally collect inertial information from the IMU between each of these imaging times. The final end goal is to take these 3D bearings to this feature here denoted as Z and the inertial readings here denoted as U and try to recover the inertial states and the position of this rock. Here, each at each time step, we have a six degree, six degree freedom pose and the feature, which is represented in a common global frame. Each pose, which is shown in this XC state vector, is represented with a quaternion, which rotates from global to the local frame, and a 3D position, which is the IMU local frame seen from the global frame. The inertial state, which contains the latest pose at time, uh, at time k here, uh, contains both the latest pose, so that's orientation and position, along with the velocity, which is also represented in the global frame. There are also time varying biases, which are used in the inertial measurement model. The key question is how do I take these camera feature bearings and inertial measurements and calculate this inertial state XI, the pose at each time step here in the XC and the position of environmental features in the XF state vector. First, let us define the inertial kinematics, which describe how our system state is related to the angular velocities and linear accelerations from our IMU sensor. The angular velocity measurement is in the local IMU frame and is equal to the true angular velocity plus a linear bias plus some unknown random noise. The linear acceleration on the other hand is a function of the true acceleration and the global gravity which has been rotated into the current IMU frame. There additionally are a linear accelerometer bias and unknown noise. We can now relate these inertial measurements to our state through a state evolution model. Here I show the continuous times evolution form, which describes how the time derivative of the state evolves. For example, we can see here that the derivative of the position is equal to the velocity. And we can see that the derivative of our velocity is equal to our acceleration rotated into the global frame minus the global gravity. In particular, our accelerometer introduces many nonlinearities, which makes the inertial measurement model complex in nature. These dynamics can be integrated to get a continuous time evolution model which I've just simplified here to an FC function. For the rest of the presentation, we use a simplified discrete state model, which I denote here as FD. We now look to define how a feature, a 3D feature, can be related to our state estimates. When we have performed feature tracking on our Im camera image, we are performing this on the unrectified image. We can relate how this distorted raw UV point is to an undistorted ideal image plane through our camera distortion and projection model. Some example models include radio tangential and equidistant fisheye pinhole. We denote this camera here, or we, den we denote this function explicitly as HD which when added to the unknown pixel noise is equal to the raw measurement on the image plane. This undistorted point can then be related to the perspective projection of a 3D point in the camera frame C. This projective function here denoted as HP simply removes the depth of the feature and creates an idealized bearing to the feature seen from the current camera frame. This 3D point in the camera frame can then be related to the global position of the feature using both the camera pose and camera extrinsics. Here are the function HT uses the global position of the feature, pose of the IMU and camera extrinsic to perform this transformation. 
First, we transform the feature from the global into the IMU frame, which we then transform from the IMU frame to the camera frame using the camera sensor extrinsics. The combination of all these functions allows us to, to define a very flexible measurement function, which requires a 3D position of the feature, camera pose, IMU extrinsics, and camera intrinsics. This can be summarized into a single nonlinear function here, h of x, which relates the state variables to the raw feature track measurement. Having now defined the problem and the measurement functions, we can start to discuss about how we go about fusing this information. A common filter is one of the methods we'll discuss today to perform the state estimation task. The extended common filter is a two-step recursive algorithm which takes incoming measurements and estimates an unknown state x. We first start with a Gaussian prior distribution and state, which we have denoted here as xk minus one hat and pk minus one. The hat here denotes that the variable is an estimate while the subscript denotes the time step that the state is at. The first step of the EKF is to perform propagation of our state using our IMU information forward in time. Here we use the function FD, which takes the old state at time K minus one, the inertial measurements UK and measurement noise and brings the state forward from the K minus one to the K state. This propagation brings both the state and the uncertainty forward in time. We denote here we denote this here as xk hat with a minus and pk with a minus. We can now do our second step, which uses our camera measurement information to correct this state. These measurements are related to our state through the, the nonlinear uh, function h of x discussed on the previous slide. We can then, we can correct the state. And what we end up with is we end up with a corrected state covariance here, which we denote with a plus. The extended common filter is then formulated by linearizing this nonlinear measurement function at the current time step. Thus, using a Taylor series expansion, we have that the measurement is equal to the measurement function evaluated at the current estimate xk minus plus the Jacobian times the error between the true and the current estimate. This is then a nonlinear measurement, or this is this is then a linear measurement that we can use to update our state. The standard EKF equations can be seen in the bottom of the slide, which require the computation of S, the common gain and residual R. After performing this update, the state can then be propagated forward in time to the future time step and the cycle, this whole cycle repeats. The key takeaway here is that we only process measurements once and we only track the current state XK as compared to a whole history of states. This leads to a very computationally efficient estimator. Now going into the specifics of how the MSEKF enables VINs, the key novelty was enabling the update using features without inserting them into the state vector. If we insert features into the state vector, the state size would grow, which directly affects the computational efficiency and can grow cubically in the worst case. In the following slides, we will detail how the MSCKF gets around this issue. The big picture here is to convert all these independent observations here into a single measurement, which constrains all poses and is no longer a function of the 3D feature. This then allows for an efficient update and constant state size. Going into a bit more detail, we can first define the minimal case where we observe a 3D feature from two camera angles. This allows us to define two measurement functions. Here, we have a measurement Z1 and Z2. Linearizing these measurement functions and stacking them leads us to the following equation. It's important to note that the measurement is a function of the pose xk minus one and xk 
which here has been summarized into XK, along with the feature. We can then apply the MSCKF null space trick to remove the dependency of the feature. Computing the null space of HF and defining it here as QN, we can project the entire measurement function onto this null space. This causes the HF Jacobian to go to zero and thus creates a measurement that is only a function of the camera poses in XK. An alternative, an alternative perspective is that this is equivalent to the case if we inserted this feature into the state vector and then instantly marginalize that feature from the state. After computing this new measurement, we can apply the standard EKF update to correct the state. I restress here that the elegance of this MSCKF update is its, removable, its removal of the need to insert the feature into the state vector. This allows for a large amount of features to be used to correct the state. In summary, we have briefly covered the EKF equations along with how the MSCKF removes the need to estimate the 3D position of environmental features. The MSCKF is a lightweight EKF, which has two steps, which first propagates the state forward in time using the inertial information, which then is corrected using the visual information. We additionally note that many MSCKF variants additionally keep a small subset of long tracked features as SLAM features, which are inserted into the state vector. These features greatly improve accuracy and robustness, and additionally can be refined over time through additional measurement updates. We now switch gears to the batch optimization visual inertial estimator form. It is useful to change perspective from instead, instead of looking at the evolution from one time step to the next time step to instead a factor graph representation. Here in this factor graph, the nodes represent the state at each time along with the 3D position of the feature. The edges of such graph describe how each state relate to each other. For example, the X0 state here is related through the visual edge ZK minus four to the feature, along with the inertial pre-integration edge UK minus four to the next state X1. There's a really nice one-to-one, -one, which makes visualizing the problem as a factor graph elegant. It's also important to note that we have this prior edge on X0, which anchors the graph and constrains the optimization problem, similar to how an MSEKF or a general EKF starts up with some initial prior covariance. We can now define at a high level, three different cost functions, which, which capture all measurement information needed to perform visual inertial state estimation. The first shown here on the left is our prior, which constrains what the value of the X0 state is. We then have the inertial cost in the middle, which uses the inertial measurements to evolve the start state at XK minus one to the current state K. After evolving, the current state XK should be equal to the predicted state using the IMU measurements. Finally, we have our feature bearing cost which is our camera feature projection model. We can take all these cost functions and define an optimization problem, which wishes to recover all states at each time step from X zero up to the most recent time. This can be solved using Gauss-Newton op optimization and requires first that all of these cost functions are linearized at the current state estimates. These linearized systems can then be used to compute an optimal state update direction, which can be used to correct the current state. This cycle of linearization and then update is repeated until the optimization problem converges. The key takeaway here is that we're able to relinearize our measurement functions with new state estimates and thus allows for accurate parameter estimation.
<clears throat> Another challenge of batch leach square methods is that it is important to ensure that the number of states do not grow large in size as the computational complexity quickly grows past real time. Thus, there are a few commonly used solutions which ensure that the optimization problem does not grow to an unwieldy size. The first is a sliding window optimization or fixed lag smoother class of solvers, which limit the number of nodes to a certain length of time. For example, here in the bottom right figure, we only wish to keep a second's worth of states. Thus, we wish to marginalize and remove the x, the x0 state. So we only have x1 and x2 left. We can perform this marginalization, which creates a new prior that constrains and correlates all states which the marginalization was connected to. Another class is, a, is sparsification methods, which perform the same dense marginalization as in fixed lag smoothers, but then sparsifies the dense prior into one that is sparse and thus can gain further efficiencies. Incremental optimization solvers, which we'll touch on in the following slides, include the class of estimators such as ISAM2, which incrementally build up information and have heuristics and methodologies which allow for cost functions to not be reevaluated to not be reevaluated at each time step and instead are only updated when directly involved with incoming measurements. This allows for large sparse graphs to be built that are efficient the majority of the time. It is worth to mention here a bit more detail about how we perform this marginalization in the very popular class of sliding window batch least squares optimizers. There are a variety of different marginalization schemes which introduce approximations to improve both the sparsity of the problem and thus improve the efficiency of the sliding window BLS. The key questions that one should ask yourself are what states should I perform marginalization on? And when should I perform this marginalization procedure? We want to minimize the amount of states we marginalize since they will never be able to be relinearized. The measurement functions will never be relinearized. Additionally, when we perform marginalization, this introduces density into the problem and thus typically correlate many states together. Some methods include keyframing of historical poses or dropping of feature measurements instead of marginalization to remain sparse. Other methods include the duplication of measurements to remove correlations between states, sparsification using nonlinear factor recovery, or simply using the dense marginal factor but limiting the sliding window to be of a very short period of time. Looking at the inertial cost function, which predicts uh, the future time step, if we naively use this cost function here on the left, we will need to reintegrate the function fd at every single time step, we have a new state xk minus one. This can be computationally inefficient if the IMU is operating at a high frequency. Thus, the idea of inertial pre-integration is to separate the state and inertial integration so that we have to avoid, so, so that we can avoid reintegrating FT. Shown here, each one of these red boxes contains variables which are only of the inertial measurements and the IMU biases. We can remove the dependency on the biases through an, a linear approximation, which is well suited due to their slow varying nature. This makes the red boxes independent of the state and thus can be pre-computed or more accurately pre-integrated. The actual integration can be performed in a continuous time form or discrete form. In summary, we have briefly covered a batch least square optimization method, uh, which has been presented from a factor graph perspective. This factor graph has nodes which represent the state and edges slash costs which represent the measurements. It's important to see that this higher level abstraction to a factor graph away from the underlying linear algebra of the optimization problem can provide an elegant and unifying design language to talk in. Shown on the right is a big picture that shows that incoming measurements are first constructed and then added as factors into the graph. 
After performing iterative optimization, we can then marginalize states to ensure that we remain real time and quote unquote, slide the window forward in time. Incremental methods leverage an equivalent square root information matrix form of batch these squares. The advantage of such form is both uh, is better numerical properties. Given a new measurement, the square root information can quickly incorporate the new information. One downside is that once measurement cost functions are appended to the square root information matrix, they cannot be relinearized unless the whole square root information matrix is recomputed. This is okay if we don't want to perform relinearization of, of measurement costs. At the bottom of the slide, we have an example transformation of the standard batch least squares into equivalent square root form. This shows the exact equivalence of the two methods. First, we take the derivative of the quadratic cost function to get the optimal update direction delta x, here denoted as h transpose h times delta x is equal to h transpose residual. We can take the QR decomposition of this big Jacobian matrix and construct an equivalent derivative u times delta x is equal to q transpose r. This can then be related back to the cost function shown in the equation two. Note that we never actually compute this h q, this, this h uh, qr decomposition, and instead directly track the square root information, the square root information information matrix u, which is an upper triangle. The square root information allows for very quick back substitution to solve for the state variables in equation two as compared to the original batch least squares optimization problem in one. A more specific example is if we start with some prior cost, which is described with a square root information matrix U. We can then define our inertial and camera cost, which here I have generalized into a simple Jacobian and residual form in the bottom left of the slide. The issue that arises is that these Jacobians ruin the upper triangular structure of the original prior cost. And thus we need to perform this process called a retriangulization. This can be efficiently performed using Givens QR, which efficiently updates the existing square root prior with this new information. In closing, I wanna briefly address the question that is often raised. Why choose one estimation methodology over another? It has been shown that the EKF is equivalent to a single Gauss-Newton iteration of a batch these squares problem. It is also well known the covariance and information forms of the problem are exactly equivalent along with the square root information form. Finally, there is a really nice equivalence between the MSEKF null space projection and the marginalization of features in a batch these square problem up to linear up to linearization areas, of course. The main takeaway that I wanna point out here is that if all forms are equivalent up to linearization areas in theory, the choice will really depend on the end application. For example, if the computational complexity is a big factor or power consumption, then one would likely recommend a filter as compared to a full BLS solution. On the other hand, if accuracy and the ability to read linearize measurements due to poor initial guess of the state is crucial, then the natural recommendation is batch least squares over any other form. We'll now move on or move into covering some of the fundamental building blocks. Uh, this is the best title I could think of. Um, fundamental building blocks required for visual inertial algorithms. Um, specifically, we'll mentioning, mention feature tracking and matching, system observability, filter consistency, degenerate motions, initialization, calibration, robustness, and long-term navigation. These are very high-level slides. Um, so I, I really do uh, want to remind people to please check out the citations in the, in the bottom left of the slide uh, for, more for more details. One of the first crucial building blocks is the processing of visual information. 
The general definition of this task is taking an incoming image and creating a measurement which can be related to the state. Two of the classical methods to convert a visual information into measurements are indirect and direct image-based tracking methods. Indirect methods track geometric points or lines which have been extracted from the image using image detectors such as FAST or SIFT. These detectors look to extract points which are invariant to changes of viewpoint and exposure, which are likely to be redetected in future images. After performing detection, these points and lines can be tracked forward temporally in time from one image to the next using methods such as KLT or descriptor matching. KLT is an optical flow method, which tries to find the same patch in the future image, which is much similar to the current images patch. Descriptor matching is based on descriptors, which are extracted or defined or created to be invariant and given two images should be similar if it's the same environmental feature. These methods, of course, can have outliers and thus ransack or other robust rejection criteria can be used to determine if a match should be taken to be true. Direct feature tracking and matching, on the other hand, relies on extracting interesting image patches, which are then tracked image to image. These image patches are arbitrary, but are typically extracted at high gradient locations, such as corners and edges. The primary advantage of patch-based tracking and intensity-based updates is that even in a low textured and low light environments, low gradient patches can still provide constraints where typical indirect uh, extraction methods will fail completely. Additionally, intensity-based feature matching or intensity-based feature measurements skip the need to define a reprojection error and allows for the capturing of all information contained within the patch based on the intensity. One of the main drawbacks of direct methods is that the measurement size of these extracted patches is directly proportional to the size of the image patch and thus can be computationally expensive. Additionally, Typically, a high quality photometric calibration is required a priori or will need to be calibrated online. The observability properties of VINs is crucial to understanding the practical estimator design. Observability describes if we're able to recover the initial state given all collected measurements. The question is, can I recover all states if somebody hands me a bunch of image and inertial readings. To perform observability analysis, we typically construct an observability matrix, which here I've presented as the matrix M. This matrix is stacked, is, is a stacking of measurement update Jacobians and state transition matrices at every single time step. One can see that each row captures the evolution of the X1 state to the kth time step, which is then projected to our measurement space using the Jacobian. If one is able to find a matrix N, which makes M times M equal to zero, it indicates that we cannot uniquely identify the initial state purely based on the measurements given to us. The matrix N is by definition, the null space of the observability matrix M and describes and describe the unobservable directions of the system. One might ask, why do we care about performing this observability analysis of VIN system? How does this affect me? First, the observability can provide insight into the minimal number of measurements needed to recover the state. Additionally, knowledge of the unobservable directions can inform consistent estimator design which we'll touch on in the upcoming slides. Finally, observability analysis can help identify degenerate motions or trajectories, which can hurt performance and prevent states from being estimated. Shown in the bottom right of the slide, for VIN systems, we typically have four degree of freedom or four DOF unobservable directions, which correspond to the global yaw about gravity and position. This implies that if we rotate the global frame about the yaw and translate it, then the collected visual measurements of the system will not be infected. 
Intuitively, this makes sense. Since gravity is a two doff constraint that can only constrain our roll and pitch, but not the yaw. Additionally, our camera and inertial measurements are just relative to the first frame and thus can't capture a fixed global 3D position. This means that these four DOF directions can be arbitrarily picked on startup for most VIN's estimators. And normally we pick these to be all zero. Estimator consistency is a crucial property of estimators in general. The consistency of an estimator is defined as follows. The estimation error should be zero mean and the estimated covariance should be larger or equal, larger than or equal to the true covariance. Another way of saying this is that we should be able to estimate in an unbiased nature and the estimated covariance should capture the true uncertainty. This is very important. And I'm gonna stress here that this is very important important for practical situations. For example, if I wanna perform obstacle avoidance while flying through a forest, and I want to avoid a tree. I would need to be able, I would need to, or I'd want to use the uncertainty of my pose. If my estimator says that I'm accurate, plus or minus 10 centimeters relative to this tree, I should be able to trust this value. But if I have an inconsistent estimator, the actual error in my pose could be a meter, and I could incorrectly fly closer to the tree than I should and possibly crash into that tree. One of the crucial, crucial observations is that we have four unobservable directions corresponding to the global yaw position for a typical VIN system. If we gain information in these directions, this means that we're actually able to estimate and recover their values. This of course is incorrect and thus it's an in inconsistent estimator. One of the primary focuses of consistent estimator design is, is ensuring that information is not gained in these unobservable directions from our observability analysis. And this means that we do not change their values or variance since we know that they're unobservable. There are quite a few existing algorithms which look to address these issues and improve the consist consistency of the estimator. These include the ro robot-centric formulations, first estimate Jacobians, observability constrained EKF or OCEKF, and the invariant class of filters. Each has different approaches to trying to improve the consistency of the system. We can also see how, the, how practically estimator consistency can play a large role in the performance of the estimator. Shown on the figure on the right are some uh, shown on the right are some normalized estimation error squared figures or NES on the top, along with the RMSE pose error on the bottom. The NES, this metric up here, captures both the bias and overconfidence of an estimator. If an estimator is conservative or its covariance is conservative, then the NES should be less than or equal to one. But if the NES is larger, then that means that either the estimator is biased or overconfident. This means that the estimator is inconsistent. Here we can see in the top figure, a blue line, which is the traditional EKF, which incorrectly gains information in these four degree of freedom unobservable directions. And thus the NES grows to a large value. OC VINs and the ideal VINs, which use the uh, ideal VINs uses the true state estimates to show what the most ideal performance is both of them have very low NES values. Additionally, we can see that this inconsistency directly impacts the accuracy of the system and increases estimation error in the RMSC plots. Additionally, it's even worse in the real world. Inconsistencies can cause robust outlier checks such as chi-squared to perform poorly, which has even larger impacts when deploying VINs to real world applications. Degeneracy describes situations or trajectories which cause additional unobservable directions for state parameters in VIN's estimators. We split, we split degeneracy into two cases, system degeneracies, which are unobservable directions of crucial state estimates, 
and are likely to cause the system to fail, and calibration degeneracies, which can degrade performance if inconsistencies are introduced, but typically can be handled due to the priors on the calibration parameter. In general, we want to avoid degenerate motions since they weaken the system's robustness. For example, shown in the top right table, some system degeneracies for, are, are some system degeneracies for monocular vents. We can see that under a pure translation case, we're un unable to recover the global orientation of the IMU. An even more common case for autonomous driving applications or wheeled vehicles is a constant acceleration case. This causes the scale of the system to become unobservable, which has a massive impact on the system's ability to triangulate features robustly and recover an accurate velocity. The intuition is that the IMU's gravity, which allows for a recovering of the scale due to its known value of 9.81, is indistinguishable from the accelerometer bias. Many works have got around this by either using a stereo camera on autonomous cars or by using a wheel odometry sensors to provide another source of scale information in this degenerate case. Another byproduct of degenerate motions is their ability to evaluate and test estimator consistency. This is due to the fact that, the, uh, that a consistent or uh, estimator consistency and information gain in unobservable directions are very tightly intertwined. For example, looking at the bottom right figure, we can see an example of performing online calibration of a gyroscope uh, IMU inertial intrinsics. This estimator, which leverages first estimate Jacobians to address the inconsistency, we can see that the variance shown here by the dotted line for these first two parameters do not change over time. If we gained information in these unobservable directions and our estimator was inconsistent, we would see our variance change or decrease because we become more certain or we gain information. On the right, we can see two parameters which are observable and thus their variance, the dotted lines, decrease as they gain information and improve their estimates over time. Here also, as a side note, I wanna point out that an estimator which, is, which has unobservable directions is not necessarily inconsistent in nature but estimators with degenerate motions are more vulnerable to noise. We now look at, state, at the state initialization problem, which is the task of recovering the observable initial states of the system. Specifically, we look to recover the initial state shown in the top right, which occurs at time zero. Since we have four, four DOF unobservable, we can arbitrarily pick the initial yaw and position of the system. The question now is how do I go about recovering the rest of the state parameters? There are quite a few different works which look to recover the states, either using closed form solutions, directly using visual features, or algorithmic processes which leverage vision only structure for motion. An example procedure is shown on the right. In this procedure, first a window of measurements is collected, then using structure for motion and vision only uh, feature tracks, the camera trajectory is recovered up to scale. Then this camera trajectory is used to recover the gyroscope bias, after which the gravity direction and velocities can then be recovered. To further improve the accuracy of initialization, typically all this procedure is followed by a full batch of squares, uh, which jointly improves uh, the estimates of all states. I wanna specifically call out that there's, there's significant challenges to the initialization problem, which primarily arises from conflicting goals. Particularly, we want our estimation procedure and our initialization procedure to take as short of a time as possible. We want to get state estimates for autonomous robotic task as soon as possible, while also we want this initialization to be accurate and robust. A problem with very short time periods is that these periods are likely to be degenerate motions, such as constant acceleration or little to no camera rotation. As mentioned earlier, these trajectories introduce unobservable directions and thus prevent a full recovery of the initial states. 
At the same time, longer periods both increase the computational complexity of the initialization problem, but additionally can introduce larger errors due to poor time offsets priors, inertial noises causing larger accuracy impacts over the, the, the larger time window. All of these issues combined make the initialization problem particularly difficult to robustly perform. Calibration is another crucial component of FINS. Shown on the right, FINS has a large number of calibration parameters which can be accounted for. These include the camera IMU spatial temporal parameters, camera intrinsics, and inertial intrinsics. Shown in the, uh, uh, as presented before in the camera measurement model, there's a lot of different parameters, including the camera intrinsics, the extrinsics transformed between the IMU and the camera. But additionally, what, what I want to call to here is the middle figure, which, which uh, mentions that, that there can be a time offset between these two sensors. For example, if the IMU stamps timestamps, or if a camera stamps timestamps using different clocks, or for example, there's a uh, delay in, in uh, receiving the measurement, which is then timestamped, uh, the timestamps between the camera and the IMU can be offset by some unknown uh, time offset. If we knew this temporal offset between the two timestamps, we would be able to transform all the timestamps to a common clock frame and then perform visual inertial fusion. The calibration of all these different parameters can be performed offline prior to performing state estimation, online during state estimation, or both. Offline calibration has some key advantages, including its ability to perform highly accurate calibration using a controlled sensor motion and non-real-time optimizers. One of the main downsides is that offline calibration might not, might not always be possible for large-scale robots or systems that have varying sensor payloads. Online calibration, on the other hand, is crucial for the practical deployment to robots which have poor initial calibration values. Online calibration could handle values such as uh, ones that are hand measured with a ruler or generic values which are close but not exact to the current sensor configuration. Additionally, online calibration allows for the handling of time varying parameters which can evolve over time, such as time varying offsets or flexible platforms. Finally, by modeling the calibration parameters as uncertain, the robustness and consistency of the system can be improved. One of the downsides, as mentioned earlier, is that these additional, that, that additional unobservable directions can be introduced depending on the motion of the robotic platform. Robustness and resiliency is another building block of fins. To simplify, I've split the challenge into two separate classifications, hard and soft failures. Hard failures are cases when the entire sensor stops providing information, such as a sensor failure or a camera staring at a blank wall. Soft failures, on the other hand, are a bit more nuanced, and they're when the data or the measurement of the sensor becomes corrupt or invalid. For example, consider the case when my IMU all of a sudden starts reading an additional five meters per second squared on one axis of the IMU. How can I handle this robustly? Some other examples include an unmeasurable external force, such as using VINs on a moving platform, such as a vehicle, dynamic environments, such as walking through crowds of people, corrupting the visual measurements, or sensor variance, variations, such as changes in exposure or temperature. Each of these are challenging and are difficult to be robust to. Some can be addressed through using multiple sensors instead of a single camera inertial pair. For example, our group sought to address the hard sensor failure problem in a general multi-IMU, multi-camera framework called Mimic VINs, which could handle multiple losses of IMU and camera. This was due to basically introducing redundancy of many cameras and many IMUs. There are still a lot of open issues to address and improvement to ensure robustness is very important to the practical deployment and commercialization of VINs estimators. 
Long-term navigation is another crucial aspect to Vince. Here, when I say long-term, I refer to the operation of a robotic application for an extended period or extended mission time, which can range from hours to days. An explored space of a long-term mission can be on a small scale. It could just be in a single room for an entire day, such as the AR VR experience, or it could be as large as a city for an autonomous uh, taxi service, for example. Each of these robots will operate for a long period of time, but each require different, different magnitudes of loop closure detection and correction. The accuracy of VINs can be improved through the incorporation of loop closure information. Loop closures are defined as the redetection of a location that has been visited before. Loop closure constraints can be either directly incorporated into the original VINs estimator mentioned before through a variety of different schemes or used in a secondary optimization problem. For example, an MSCKF filter or sliding window BLS could be used as a, a, a lightweight front end, which provides poses to a back end optimization, which incorporates these loop closures in a non real time manner. This front end can be computationally efficient, but can drift over the long periods of time. And this back end can correct this drift and even bound, bound it as uh, the mission continues. Some of the challenges for long-term navigation is how to perform this optimization. If one should directly incorporate this information or decouple them into separate problems. Additionally, as the length of the mission increases, the complexity and memory usage becomes an issue and how to optimally select states and measurements is very challenging. Finally, robust loop closure detection and loop closure measurement constraints are challenging to create and design. Now I want to point out some of the existing open source systems, data sets, and evaluation utilities that everybody can start using today. It is really great to see the research community embracing open source software and reproducible research results. I've presented here a small subset of some interesting open source code bases, which have been released in conjunction to their papers. There's been a wide variety of estimators being used with different functionality, making it great for those getting started to quickly have a baseline system to compare to. I, of course, want to mention our group's project called OpenVINS, which is a relatively feature complete filter system for use on resource constrained platforms or as an odometry front end. Going into a bit more detail about our OpenVINS project, at its core, it's an on manifold sliding window EKF with a modular type system for state management, which was inspired by GTSAM. One of the proudest achievements of the project personally is the detailed documentation and derivation website, here docs.openvins.com, which acts as a reference book and includes much of the details and derivations crucial for students or new researchers. Where there are quite a lot of features of the project, I wanna point out some of the key ones which you all might be interested in. First, we have a simulator, which takes a trajectory and automatically generates environmental features. This simulator is really crucial if you want to evaluate the consistency and convergence of calibration parameters, which is extremely difficult or maybe even impossible in the real world. We additionally support out of the box sensor intrinsics and extrinsic online estimation, which, which helps expedite deployment to real world, real, real world robotics systems. Finally, we support a large number of data sets out of the box for researchers to experiment with, with a very nice evaluation toolbox, which also supports timing and direct plotting of results. Additionally, there's a lot of other secondary or code-based extensions surrounding the project, which I encourage everybody to check out. Here, I've also created a small summary of some interesting inertial data sets, along with some standard data sets that we use for evaluation. There are quite a few that I want to bring uh, some attention to. But first, I want to state that there's a wide variety of data sets. And additionally, there's a wide variety of quality of ground truth. There are many data sets which provide additional sensors on top of visual inertial, which make it interesting to do aided ends. In the recent years, there have been some really interesting data sets released, 
which I recommend that people check out. More and more of the recent data sets have focused on challenging scenarios, which VINs have had trouble with, including high-speed MAVs, rough terrain, large-scale trajectories with dynamics or dynamic objects, vehicles. I finally want to touch on algorithmic evaluation. I do want to draw attention to that some data sets have relatively poor ground truth accuracy. Thus, the metrics used should vary data set to data set. For example, uh, on, a, on an outdoor autonomous car data set, usually just an RTK GPS is provided as ground truth. This metric makes it difficult to evaluate orientation and thus metrics that use orientation, such as relative pose error, shouldn't really be used in this case. <clears throat> Going into the metrics shown here on the right, the goal is to provide a fair comparison between different algorithms. Thus, it's recommended to run each algorithm multiple times to find what the quote unquote expected or the average performance of, of the algorithm should be on a given computational platform. Going into the specific metrics, we have uh, the very classical absolute trajectory error or ATE, which is the average RMSC of the 3D position at every single time step after performing trajectory alignment. Note that here we take the average over N runs of each algorithm. The relative pose error, or RPE, should be considered the gold standard of evaluation criteria if the ground truth is accurate enough to, uh, to use it. RPE takes a specific trajectory length, here uh, trajectory length D, basically, um, and evaluates uh, the accuracy of this trajectory, or the, of this uh, specific segment of the trajectory. This allows for inspection of how an estimated an estimator would be expected to work at, let's say, one meter versus at 100 meters. And this provides a lot of insight into how the VINs algorithms are expected to perform in the real world. Finally, and also mentioned earlier, the NES, or Normalized Estimation Error Square, evaluates the consistency of the estimator and is typically only used in conjunction with a simulator where we can guarantee that the noises are Gaussian and that we're able to initialize with the true ground truth states. Shown in the, on the bottom left, there are quite a few open source evaluation toolboxes that are, that are available, including EVO, RPG trajectory, and, and RPE trajectory evaluation. I, of course, want to mention the OVEVAL toolbox contained within the OpenVINS project, which provides a very high quality interface, uh, plotting, trajectory recording, and other utilities, such as timing, um, along with all the metrics shown on the right. Um, I really do recommend that, that uh, people do check this, uh, this utility out. It looks like I'm on time here. Um, now I'll do a quick uh, conclude the presentation with a brief discussion of future directions, followed by a quick summary of what, we've, uh, of what I've covered. The natural qu question is what's next? Hopefully some of the presentations later on today can help answer this question, um, but it's a very, very open and uh, it's tough to you know, predict uh, what, uh, what, what's, what's, what's going or what's the future directions. Um, and so the, these are just some opinions, of course. Um, and, and really what I ask myself is what is the next interesting area which is unexplored and promising? Here are a few that might be promising, but it's by no means inclusive. In VINs, there's a large amount of outstanding issues. Practicality, for example, has continued to be challenging due to the sensor variations from platform to platform and degenerate motions which hurt performance. If I take a VINs that is a handheld or good on a smartphone, it won't necessarily work on a vehicle or it won't necessarily work on a legged robot. Robustness is king in commercializ commercialization and practical deployment. And if the VINs, if the VINs uh, estimator is not robust, then it is tough to trust the output of such an estimator. There are additionally promising directions in semantic mapping and understanding the environment beyond just geometric features such as points and lines. Object-wise or using uncertain neural networks as measurements could further improve accuracy, robustness, and the ability to loop close in future systems. As more and more robotic platforms continue to miniaturize, and as mission time becomes more significant in length, the computational complexity will continue to be at the forefront 
of one of the challenges. Reductions in VIN's computation directly allows for its deployment to embedded systems and also decrease uh, and also can uh, decrease estimator latency while also extending mission times. The use of other, other sensors or aided ins is also promising, along with the use of exotic sensors holds great potential. Cooperative multi-robot fins can introduce a, a wide magnitude of challenges, including measurement selection, distributed computation, and scalability challenges, which are all interesting. Finally, a tighter design incorporation of system dynamics of the actual physical robot that the VINs is, is being run on uh, is, is, a, is a promising direction. So in summary, in this presentation, I first introduced some background of some traditional VINs estimators at a, a course very high level. Um, then we discussed some challenges and basic building blocks of VINs algorithms. Finally, presented some of the current, source, co current open source code bases, along with some interesting data sets and evaluation toolboxes that you can get started using today. Um, my contact information is in the bottom left if you do, need, if you do want to reach out to me with any further questions. Um, and of course, uh, please check out the OpenVINs project uh, and which contains both the evaluation toolbox and a state-of-the-art MSCKF filter. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, great, we are on time. We have a few more minutes, three to three minutes. Um, we can open for a very short few questions if, uh, if anyone has. Um, and I, I do see there's a question from YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. here, and Patrick, would you say that in MSKF we can use as many features as you want, but um, actually we, in many practice systems like AR Core, AR Kit, we only use a very small number of features. Um, why that's the case? Or we do, do we really can handle many, many features? So, yeah, so the, the, the primary reason that like, you know, like, so basically uh, the, the, let me repeat the question back or my interpretation of the question is, you know, if I can track, like, let's say I have a visual front end and, and, and also remember that the visual tracking front end is normally maybe 30 to 40% of the computational cost. So it's, a, it's an expensive operation. So as we increase the number of features, that operation uh, computational cost will also increase. Um, but let's assume that we're able to track, let's say, a thousand features. Why would I uh, use the thousand features versus a hundred features? And my answer, my natural answer would be uh, diminishing returns. Basically, as you add more and more features, there's going to be less and less accuracy gains or robustness. Um, and so really there is, you can, you can try this, for example, you can use open bins, use the simulator and vary the number of features in each, uh, you can do like, you know, 20 features, hundred features, 500 features, and you'll see eventually the accuracy will plateau. And really this is, uh, this is due to, I don't want to go into that much detail, but basically your, your viewport, right? Your field of view is limited, right? From your camera. And there's only a certain amount of information that can be gained from this specific viewpoint, okay, about your ego motion. And so eventually you'll saturate and uh, the additional features won't, won't necessarily help you. They will, of course, they, they might help robustness. Um, and I can't really, uh, uh, can't really give yeah. any specifics towards that, but th that would be my, my natural response of why. And, if, and of course, efficiency is, is a big thing. Okay. Um... I think uh, we, we just try to keep on, on time. And uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, actually, there's a question in, in a chat. You can respond in the chat. I'm, um, my chat is not popular. On. Sorry. Let's just move on to a uh, next talk. Um, we will have uh, the next talk, which is given by um, Professor Ping Tan. And uh, Ping, can you share your screen? If you are on, I saw you online. Um, Ping, hello. 
Um, oh, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, just unmute yourself, Ping. Um, oh, yeah, it works now. Sorry yeah, okay, good. Can you share your screen? Yeah. And the ping uh, is, yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and Professor Ping, uh, ping Tan is, uh, I think, currently is a scientist at Alibaba AI Labs. And he is also a associate professor from Simon Fraser University. And he is primarily working on, has done some great work on 3D reconstructions, dense mapping. So he will talk about, tell us uh, some interesting results along this line. Okay, Ping, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me to this uh, very interesting workshop. Um, good morning, everybody, and uh, good, good evening for those uh, collecting from China. Um, so I'm Ping Tan. Right now, uh, I'm directing the AI lab in Alibaba and also an associate professor in Simon Fraser University in Canada. Um, so tonight, I'm going to talk about visual localization and the dense mapping. So um, basically, dense mapping is to create a dense 3D map of an environment. By dense, I mean we want to have uh, every single object in the environment reconstructed. We don't want to miss anything. So Hello. Oh, Bing. Hello. I think we we lost your your voice. Bing. Hello. Are you still here? technical problem, I guess. Um, let's just give, uh, give me um, a second. Hello, Ping? Oh, we can, we cannot hear you. Still no. Patrick, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, he might want to uh, exit and rejoin, possibly. I'm not sure. I've never seen that before. Okay, let me. Or try reselecting uh, which microphone and which camera you want to use with the little arrow next to the microphone. Oh. oh, say something. I still know. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Try to rejoin, I think. Let me ask him to rejoin the call that well. Yeah, that's the challenge um let's bear with us just give him um one more minute and just ask him to um to rejoin okay let's see oh he's coming good
Ping, we still cannot hear you. And also cannot just see the black screen. Yeah, it might, might be that bandwidth issue. I'm not sure. Bandwidth issue, probably. Mm. Yeah, that's the only problem. Okay. Okay, we can see your slides. Can you say something? Or still? Have you tried uh, muting and unmuting yourself? Patrick, can you do that? You are the host, you can, you probably just, yes, sure, you can turn off your video, but we still cannot hear you. Mm, nope. Can you select a different microphone source? Oh yeah, do a phone call. That's a good idea. Okay. So, yeah, just be patient, everyone. I apologize for that um, because we are all from all over the world. The, the connection definitely um, um, varies. Um, oh, we can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Great. Oh, okay. Somehow. Yeah, good. Um, <laughs> good. <Let's continue. laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So okay, should we continue? Yeah, just continue. I, okay. Yeah. You can see my screen, right? Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry for that. I, I don't know what happened. I can always <laughs> hear you guys. I, I don't know why. Um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Um, well, I am. Um, yeah, I just uh, talk about. Uh, uh, oops, how how do I hide this? Uh, anyway, I think I want to hide this command, this this panel. Uh, but anyway, uh, let's let's go ahead without further ado. Um, so, so basically, uh, I introduced the localization and the mapping, and then uh, I will talk about the localization first. Um, so, previous localization methods, generally, um, they many of them are based on geometric methods. Um, they solve sparse key point matching, and then based on those matches, use PMP algorithms to solve the camera pose. Uh, those matches can be obtained by handcrafted features or deep features. Um, but a limitation of this approach is that they only solve the localization problem. Um, they cannot obtain a dense map to facilitate, to facilitate occlusion or obstacle detection in robotics. Then also learn, learning-based methods, for example, uh, poselet can directly regress the camera pose from a single image but this type of methods usually need to have poor accuracy and the generalization. Um, there are another type of learning-based methods uh, that will try to regress a dense map of scene coordinates of the input image and then uh, apply PMP algorithm with this coordinate map to solve the camera pose. Um, this type of methods usually requires retraining for every different scene. So in this talk, I will focus on the dense coordinate regression methods and try to improve it um, to work with an arbitrary thing without retraining. So um, to understand that, let's firstly talk about uh, what is dense coordinate regression. So 
typically this type of methods uh, they take a query image and a reference thing as an input and then output a um, dense map of thin coordinates. Here I use the RGB color to represent the X, Y, Z thin coordinates uh, for this query image. Um, this task is slightly different from a single view depth estimation uh, in the sense that the thin coordinates are defined in the reference coordinate system uh, given in this reference thing. Um, if we can estimate such a thin coordinate map, then we can use the PMP and the RANSAC algorithm to solve the camera pose from 2D and the 3D correspondences. So um, these methods, they can be uh, classified as scene specific or scene organistic. Scene specific methods requires retraining for each different scene. Essentially, these methods, they memorize a specific scene in their network parameters so that they need to be retrained for every different scene. In comparison, um, two years ago, we presented this scene organistic method um, that can work on an arbitrary thing without retraining. Um, this type of method, they can they essentially learn to localize instead of memorize a specific thing in the network parameters. But um, a disadvantage is that generally their accuracy is lower than the same specific method, which is understandable since um, they are trying to get a better generalization capability. So um, in the following talk, I will present a method to improve the accuracy of this kind of thin organistic method. Um, so to understand this, let's look at how this thin coordinate estimation works. Basically, um, what we need to do is that given a query image, essentially, we need to match every query image pixel to the reference thin images and then generate a 3D coordinate for that pixel from those matches. And in spirit, this approach is somewhat similar to what is happening in optic flow and stereo. We are trying to build pixel-wise correspondences to get some 3D coordinates of query image pixels. And in optic flow and stereo, usually uh, the state-of-the-art methods they employ cost volume filters. So we think maybe cost volume filtering can um, improve the coordinate regression as well in this scenario. So here is an overview of our uh, proposed algorithm. Given a query image, uh, we use image retrieval techniques to identify multiple scene images um, from a similar viewpoints. And then we build feature pyramids for the query image and this reference scene images. And then from these pyramids, we gradually generate a dense coordinate map at higher resolution and higher accuracy. And uh, uh, we might further include temporal information for better accuracy if the input is a video clip. And once we have this um, scene coordinate map estimated, we can then uh, use RANSAC and the PMP algorithm to compute the camera pose. So um, the most important component of this pipeline is this DSM module, which we um, name it as dense scene matching. Um, this is how the DSM module works. Um, it begins by building a correlation tensor between the query image pixels and the 3D scene points. And uh, with this correlation tensor, uh, we do a simple sorting to, to build a cost of volume with the top K highest correlation values. And we further append the same coordinates of these top K same points. And then we filter the appended volume to regress the same coordinates for the query image. And of course, we can further uh, evaluate the result confidence and the involved temporal correlation and then re-estimate the same coordinates to get a better results. So um, in the following, I will explain the computation of this 
uh, Korean nations. In the Korean nations, we, we, we actually have two kinds of Korean nations. Firstly, we compute the same Korean nation, uh, which is to compute the similarity uh, between a query pixel Q and a 3D sim point P. Here, we do not exhaustively check all the sim points, but instead, we only focus on the sim points that is within a spatial neighborhood of Q's uh, result from the previous iteration that is in a low resolution um, image. And then for the temporal coordination, uh, we compute the similarity of the query pixel Q and a 2D pixel P prime in the previous query image frame. P prime is generated by projecting the previous P into the frame T minus one. Uh, and then we compute their coordination. Finally, we fuse the temporal coordination and the same coordination to get a final coordination according to some confidence score. And with this coordination, we build the DSM module. And then with the DSM, we can, we can generate the uh, same coordinate map. Here we show a comparison of the same coordinate maps generated by the SALET and the DSEC++ and our method. And as we can see from the column B, SALET, although it's thing algorithmic, it can work on anything with just one training, but uh, it produce blurry thing coordinate maps um, that also explain its uh, lower performance in terms of localization accuracy. In comparison, DSEC++ generate a sharper coordinate maps, but uh, it has some artifacts at uh, um, occluded regions or, or, or unoccluded regions in the query image. But in comparison, our, our DSM module can generate a bit higher quality uh, sync coordinate maps. And at the far right, there is a ground truth coordinate map for a reference. And here we show the um, quantitative CDF function of the uh, coordinate arrows in the estimated uh, coordinate maps. So here we look at uh, a cutoff threshold of 10 cm arrows. We can see that the highest curves corresponds to our method with a video clip input or with a single image as an input. Uh, in general, our method can get about 75 to 80 percent of the pixels with a coordinate uh, within 10 cm um, arrow. Uh, in comparison, um, SALET or, or uh, DSEC++, uh, they, they, they have a lower accuracy. Here we show some um, quantitative results on the uh, data set called Seven Things, uh, which is an indoor data set. Uh, we, can, we can see that generally speaking, our method uh, can produce comparable results with um, the previous state-of-the-art methods. Uh, please note that the methods indicated with a star, they are the same specific methods. This method requires retraining on every specific thing. So although our accuracy is comparable with this method, but our method is, um, is more generalizable and it can work on a, on a novel thing without training. Uh, on the top row, we show some sparse methods such as in-lock and edge-lock. Those methods, they only solve the localization problem. Uh, they do not try to estimate a dense map of depth for, 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 for example, occlusion or obstacle avoidance. And this page shows our result on the outdoor Cambridge dataset. And similarly, our accuracy is comparable with the same specific methods and the sparse methods. And in the next, I will talk about dense structure from motion. Uh, its goal is to create a dense 3D map from multiple input images. Structure from motion usually minimize a photometric loss or a feature metric loss uh, by some energy optimization formulation. Uh, in, this formula, in this formula, uh, here II indicates the color, the RGB color or feature of the i input image. D is a 3D model, maybe represented by a depth image. And the TI is the eyes 
camera pose, and the pi is the projection. It projects the 3D model D uh, to the eyes image. So essentially, this energy minimization try to um, make sure that the projected model is consistent with the observed image. So usually, um, bundle adjustments solve this structure from motion problem by iterative optimization. Uh, we, can, we, we begin from some initial results of T and the D, and then at each iteration, we compute an update to, to update it to the next iteration. Um, typically, this type of method is solved by gradient-based method, such as Tyler expansion. Um, with a Tyler expansion, generally, uh, it's like in the solution space, so we have this complicated energy function. We do a Tyler expansion to compute its gradient direction, and uh, um, we, we have a residue of our um, parameter, and we have this Jacobian matrix, and then uh, you know we, we, we can solve then an update uh, delta D by, by, by uh, linear equations. Um, this, this is good. It's, it has a closed form solution. It's efficient and analytic, but generally this is limited to sparse reconstruction. Like for example, in LSD SNAN or DSO, we can only solve for uh, pixels on image edges. While for the other pixels at homogeneous regions, we cannot do anything. So um, the methods try to um, use known the regularization to solve a dense depth map. Uh, for example, in this BA let uh, we published two years ago, we try to learn to represent the dense depths as a linear combination of some basis functions. So uh, D is a depth map, and this B1 to BK are some basis depth maps. So we represent the original depth map by, uh, say, 100 basis functions. And then instead of solving for the depth map, we can solve the combination coefficients instead of uh, solve the original depth. In this way, um, we, we, we can regularize the problem and solve a dense depth map simultaneously with, uh, uh, with solving the camera poses. And uh, um, more recently, there is uh, a new optimization method approach introduced, um, which is this uh, GRU applied to solve the optic flow. Uh, in particular, they formulated the optic flow as a uh, minimization problem and use GRU to compute an update of the optic flow. And in this way, they, they, they generate very strong results. Uh, in particular, in this formulation, they include uh, cost of volume of the optic flow as an input to the GRU. Well, this cost of volume, essentially, it's, uh, uh, it's a kind of a sampling in the neighborhood of the solution space. So instead of solving, instead of looking for the gradients, it look for multiple discrete samples. In, in a spatial neighborhood. And then the GRU look for an update vector to improve the optic flow. That is the basic idea uh, of this approach. So um, in our work, our motivation is that um, we want to apply this GRU to solve the dense bundle adjustment or dense structure from motion optimization. Uh, we separated the original optimization uh, into two branches. We have one GRU to solve the depths and another one to solve for camera poses. And we, uh, instead of using cost of volumes, we trade temporal information for spatial information such that we do not need to use a cost of volume uh, for better efficiency. So here is a brief pipeline of how the method works. We begin with an, in, with an initial depth and the camera poses, uh, T0 and uh, D0. And then uh, we have two GRUs to generate updates respectively for the camera poses T and for the image depth D. Um, and then with these two updates, we are going to 
update the poses and the depth maps and uh, until um, it converge. So this is the basic uh, uh, procedure of our algorithm. And uh, this is how the network structure would look like. Um, in, this, in this structure, we show the case of two input images. Um, we have two, we have a reference image IR and uh, another input image II. We use a feature let to extract the features. And then we, we have a two, uh, two, two, head, two networks to generate the initial of the depth and the camera poses. And we then have another iterative refinement network to improve the depth and the camera poses. Uh, in the middle of this iterative refinement, we have a cost map. Uh, let me introduce the details of it. The cost map essentially compute the residue of, an, of, of, of a feature map to evaluate the quality of the current solution. Basically, um, DT is the current solution of the depth. It's kind of a 3D model. And as I explained earlier, pi is a projection. It projects the 3D model DT according to the camera post TI to try to replicate the ice image. And then we compare the difference of the projected model and the observed image. And then we get a residue. Uh, this residue is the so-called cost map. So once we can compute the cost map, we can calculate the depth map, the image feature, and the cost map as an input to the GRU. And then we can compute an update of the depth. And similarly, we can calculate the pose, the image feature, and the cost map, and then update uh, the camera pose delta t as well. So here we show some intermediate results during the optimization. Um, on the left, we show the energy, the, the plots of the energy functions and the, the uh, arrows of the of the camera pose, and and we can see that generally. Uh, over the iterations, the the error will be reduced, and as well uh, when 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 the cost is reduced. An interesting factor is that the the cost does not decrease monotonically. Um, that the cost is indicated by the blue curve. Uh, it sometimes will go up a little bit and then goes further down, indicating that this optimization have the capability of jumping out some local minimums. And on the right, we show um, some intermediate results uh, of the optimization. Here we show uh, the cost map. Initially, each row is the result at the different iterations. On the left column is the uh, cost map. We can see the cost becomes lower when it becomes dark. And on the, on the right, is a warp aligned image. Basically, we use the estimated depth and the camera pose to warp one of the input image toward the other one and then compose them together. We can see gradually the warp aligned image becomes sharper, indicating that the depth and the camera pose becomes better. And the, um, this approach can be applied for both supervised training and unsupervised training. For supervised training, we use the um, L1 arrow of the depth maps, and we uh, also use a pose arrow as well. Um, and then for unsupervised training, we use the SSIM between a synthesized photo and the reference photo, and we also use a smoothness NOS. Uh, I'm not going to explain the details of these formulas. If you are interested, uh, you might refer to the paper. And here we want to uh, show some of the results. So these are the results on the Kitty data set. Um, what I want to highlight is that at this row, uh, we show our method. Um, we, we can see that in the, in the second column, uh, we indicate this method, the, fir the first row, uh, the first three rows are unsupervised methods, while the others in the second, uh, on the lower half, are the supervised method, we can see that our unsupervised method generally produce a smaller absolute error uh, than 
all the previous supervised method. And uh, um, this indicates our optimization method is very strong that uh, it works, it produces very good results even in the unsupervised setting. And this are uh, re the results on the scan net. And uh, similarly, uh, we can see that uh, our unsupervised method can even outperform the previous methods, uh, the previous supervised methods. And uh, uh, finally, we show some efficiency um, experiments. Uh, our method is usually our method usually converges after 12 iterations. Uh, it's uh, highly efficient. Uh, for example, compared with deep V2D, uh, we takes one sixth of the mem memory consumption and is more than 10 times faster. And our method is uh, also more accurate than uh, their results. And here we show uh, a simple experiment by directly collecting the, uh, concatenating the two frame reconstructions on a video input. Uh, notice that we do not use multi-frame optimization at every time we only take two frames and solve their relative pose and then concatenate them together. And we can generate the dense 3D reconstruction and solve the camera motion at the same time. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, finally, um, let me quickly summarize um, my presentation. So in the first part, I introduced some localization methods. Um, we basically try to localize in a novel thing without retraining. And then um, we, we, we believe that a cost of volume filtering can benefit this uh, kind of dense coordinate regression. And then for the dense bundle adjustment, uh, we find that, that GRU can be applied to solve the dense bundle adjustment. And uh, we avoid using cost of volume um, by looking at the temporary information to get a better uh, efficiency. And thank you very much. And very sorry about the letter work problem in the beginning. That's all good, all good. Great, great, thanks, Ping. Uh, I think we, we do have a few questions from chat, also from a YouTube channel. Patrick, can you read some of them? Uh, yeah, one from the YouTube chat is uh, from HC. What's the benefit of using dense visual localization over sparse visual localization methods like HLOC, H-L-O-C? Yeah. Uh, we had uh, some brief discussions here. Basically, uh, sparse methods, they only solve the localization problem, while uh, the dense method, they solve the localization at the same time of estimating a dense depth map. And that depth map might be used for occlusion or obstacle avoidance in robotics applications. Okay. So essentially, um, dense approach can also provide the, the dense map, which is, of course, which is useful for, for many applications, for example, I guess. Exactly. Obstacle avoidance planning. Okay, yeah, I see. Exactly. Mm. So basically, here is the 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 same pipeline of this uh, dense coordinate regression methods. They take a query image and the reference thing to estimate the three D coordinates of the query image, and and that coordinate map essentially is a depth map. Okay. So what's the the, the computation computation um, comparison between the dense approach versus the, the sparse approach? Oh, it's, it's a higher. The computational cost is higher. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we have, um, of course, we have a, a few more minutes. Uh, any question? Uh, There's one question from from a chat uh, from. Uh, and Chan, um, can we do one more ICP after top case sort of cost volume to further increase the 2D to 3D matching accuracy? 
That's the question One. from. Well, there's the second uh, part also. Oh, that's we, I don't quite get it. What do you mean? One more ICP after the top K? Yeah, it's uh, to be honest, I also don't understand the exactly what the question about. Um, if Ch if Ren Chen is online, you probably you can unmute yourself, you can ask um, or clarify your question. Ping, can you can you also you, you can also check out the chat room? Yeah, the question. Uh, let there. me see. Uh, well, we see. Just click the chat. Is well, is the chat on on about oh, yeah. the three dot and then chat? Okay. Can we do one more ICP after top case sort of cost of volume? Uh, actually, we 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 didn't do any ICP here. So what we did is that. Uh, after we get the coronation volume, we do a sort uh, to pick the top K matches. And uh, we keep the, the, the coronation scores here. And we further take the coordinates of those top K matches to get this, uh, I call it appended volume. And then we filter this volume to regress the same coordinates map. I'm not sure okay. you, I answered your question. Yeah, I, I, I didn't do any ICP here. I think you did, you do. Because, uh, you don't just say I see in the chat. So I assume uh, you did an answer his question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And there's another question actually in the chat. Um, P, uh -huh. if you, you can just read it yourself. It's from David. Um, yeah. Is it possible to incorporate some sparse depth measurements? to improve accuracy and speed for dense mapping? That's uh, I think a that's very a really, interesting point. Yeah. Uh, let me see. I, I, never thought, I never thought about this problem that way. Um, but uh, I mean, it might be possible that, but uh, it's, it's hard to fit it's hard to fit it in the current formulation. Right now, the formulation is more or less uh, the conventional structure from motion formulation. It's like the photometric bundle adjustment. Uh, yeah, I, I was a little bit fast. I, I thought I running out of time. Um, um, maybe I didn't explain it very clearly, but uh, basically the idea is that uh, we are minimizing this kind of feature metric loss uh, it's that you have a reference input image, and that on the on this uh, formula you got this uh, reprojected image from the from the three D model and the, the camera pose. So you want to um, minimize the difference between the measurement and the, the predicted according to your model. Um, so so then um, if you have some sparse measurement. Um, yeah, it's, it's possible that you can constrain that your, your solution D should be consistent with those sparse measurements. Um, but I'm not sure how much improvement that will bring in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, uh, recently there's uh, also, I saw uh, Ren in the chat also respond, the depth completion. Yes, people, I think people mm -hmm. are using, uh, try to, Leveraging the sparse depth information into the the depth right. the, the dense um, the, the depth mapping or depth learning, uh, I think that's a way to incorporate a sparse depth information. Okay. Right. Um, great, great. I think that's uh, I think there's no more questions, and uh, yeah, also time's pretty good. Um, thanks, Ping. I really, really appreciate your your your, your yeah. support. Thank you guys very much, and uh, sorry again for the network no, problem. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Yep. We we are patient. Thanks again. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to the next. We we still have a few minutes, but uh, you know, I just just give uh, give a minutes to to set up.
Uh, our next speak is uh, Stefan uh, Lutonega from uh, TUM. Uh, Stefan, I saw you online. Are you here? You should be here. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, Stephen, you, you, can, you can share your screen then. Um, but Stephen is now is a system professor at TUM. And he, uh, he used to be, or still be, <laughs> still uh, a faculty member at the Imperial College. And he's also co-founder of the Slam Call. That's, 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 that's great. And uh, Stephen is basically, I think most, probably all of people here uh, know his work, for example, OKVIS, for example. That's one of the very earliest open source uh, vision, vision system. That's a, that's a fantastic open source systems. And uh, so today he will, he will tell us about his some of, I believe some of the recent results on still in this domain, visual inertial slam and a special AI for, for, for mobile robots. Stephen, the floor is yours. Hey. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, thanks a lot for having me here. It's really a, a big pleasure and, and such a nice event. Um, all right. So then let's uh, get into it. In, in, in fact, I'd like to uh, structure a little bit of thinking around um, you know, robotic vision, uh, uh, spatial understanding um, in, into levels. So perhaps the sort of lowest level of what you might need to do, to do uh, basic things is, is all around motion tracking, um, where perhaps you reconstruct the environment to, to some extent, um, which is mostly something that you just do in order to, to actually, you know, as a byproduct of, of, your, of, your, of your system. So for instance, doing visual inertial localization and mapping um, as we were doing with, with OQUIS and, and um, there's a sort of new iteration and um, not quite, not quite uh, released yet, but hopefully soon. So this is all about robust and accurate motion tracking for position control of a robot. And obviously a lot of, um, of, of you here have been working on, on similar systems to, to try and achieve this. And, and then perhaps the next level is, is all around uh, dense structures that you would like to understand around your robot. Um, this is obviously important to things like motion planning, collision avoidance, and so on. So you really want a richer, more dense understanding of the environment. And also here, um, together with my team, we were involved on, on, on some of the, of the works that are listed here. The next one then uh, perhaps includes some level of semantics where you would like to not only understand um, that there is stuff there, but you would like to understand actually what it is. And I, I believe this is quite important if you're uh, trying to solve some more advanced task planning. Um, also, if you're trying to, to have some more natural interaction between uh, a human and a robot, where, for instance, if you had a vacuum cleaner, you could now tell it to go clean the floor underneath the bed here. Um, so it becomes quite obvious that the robot has to have a sort of joint understanding of both 3D space, um, of course, it's this location in there as well, and the uh, semantics that is associated with the, uh, the, the, the 3D scene. Um, but then, of course, it doesn't stop there. Um, typically, things aren't just, it isn't just kind of static and, and, and just kind of painted with some semantics. It's, um, it's more complicated than that. You, you might have different objects um, that you might want to uh, distinguish you might want to also include some, some tracking of dynamics that's going on, perhaps even people. And, and also here we were involved in some early works, but I think this is perhaps where, where still most research is, is, has yet to be done in, 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 in this kind of space. And it is also very clear that um, you wouldn't need, you know, the highest level uh, here for any robotics application. I think it's quite important to think of, of this perhaps concept of, of, of task sensitive uh, uh, level here that for, for some things you, you, you can clearly get away with just doing visual inertial uh, slam, for instance. All right, so I'll, I'll be talking about some of these aspects. And since this is a WINS workshop, I will of course start with WINS and, and, and briefly then talk about that. Um, yeah, so first of all, though, just to briefly mention that as well, Paul has already done it. So I, I, I wanted to briefly uh, say that with Slamcore, uh, the spin-off from Imperial, we are kind of following a similar approach in terms of thinking of levels. So we, we're working on uh, visual inertial, um, sparse visual inertial uh, Slam systems, and then um, adding some level of, 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 of three, then 3D understanding and, and semantic understanding that we are currently working on. Okay, but I don't want to spend uh, uh, too much uh, uh, time on 
this one so you can go on the on the web page and, and check it out of course if you're um, if you're interested in, in some more details okay so so let's go into uh, sparse visual inertial and um, patrick has done a lot of the, the groundwork already to explain it so i can kind of skip through the basics here so uh, coming from the kind of computer vision side and and uh, bundle adjustment um, of, of things. Uh, the, the way we think about here is that we would like to jointly estimate 3D landmarks and poses that observe these landmarks. So you have a bunch of, of, of 3D points here that are observed in, uh, in your frames and you can formulate a 2D reprojection error by comparing these um, associated 2D measurements with these uh, projections. Um, and so you will have to associate, track these across different frames and you can go in and say, let's just uh, formulate this batch nonlinear least squares problem um, that is, is, is following the assumption that you have uh, Gaussian um, noise on these measurements and you can very nicely linear, uh, very nicely uh, solve this problem as a, as, as a nonlinear least squares problem. Okay. So, so here's the involved um, variables, right? You have the landmarks here, you have the, the transformations of the individual poses, you have the projection function here, and you can compute the difference between um, the measurements and these projected um, 3D landmarks. All right, so the underlying graph structure of this uh, vision only problem looks something like this. It's really a purely uh, spatial kind of a structure here. And there is no temporal constraints between the individual poses. The poses here being uh, being visualized as these these round uh, circles here, the gray circles, and then the landmarks being visualized as um, as, as as this uh, red kind of cloud of landmarks. And then I have kind of summarized individual observations in these green boxes here. So this is what's happening in in in, in purely vision only um, bundle adjustment, right? So you have an associated cost function here. Um, you're, you're summing over all the uh, weighted squares of these reprojection errors. So you're, you're summing over all the, uh, the visible um, uh, projections and you're, you're summing over all the frames that there are. And, and perhaps in this case, you might have a multi-camera system. So it can also sum over the uh, multiple cameras that are on, on your, on your um, robot. Now with visual inertial, and you know, we have seen that already, then you're really introducing a, a temporal model. So this is, is fundamentally different. And I guess that's partly what makes this combination so strong is that now you're introducing temporal constraints, temporal error terms uh, that, uh, that can connect successive camera poses uh, through these um, typically pre-integrated um, nonlinear I new error terms that you can formulate uh, in this way. You have to slightly um, extend your state here. So we have um, also speeds and biases, I new biases that we, we have to simultaneously want to simultaneously solve for. So it becomes slightly more complex as a problem, um, a bit more expensive to solve perhaps. But clearly the main issue is that if you just keep doing that, if you're going around with your robot, uh, this, this problem just keeps growing and um, at some point you can't solve it in real time anymore. So it might still be great for calibration and so on, but really can't be used as a, as a real time system at some point. So all of, the, all of the work that most of us here are doing, I guess is, is, is trying to figure out how to keep it somehow bound it such that we can still keep it um, uh, solvable in real time. And um, coincidentally, this is the same figure that was already shown before that uh, um, outlines a bit the, um, the approach in, in, in Oquist that we were taking here, um, which was really all about trying to keep long-term correlations, spatial correlations, visual correlations through uh, a number of keyframes here, the poses of which we keep estimating together with the live frame and also some nonlinear links between these live frames. Okay, so there was some, some heuristics that we came up with to, to try and, and, and keep all of these correlations in a way where it, it would still allow us to, to, to solve for, um, for the solution here in, in real time. And, and the key to, to actually achieving that has all to do with uh, marginalization, which is which you can really think of as um, when you're building the Gauss-Newton system that is, is, is underlying um, this nonlinear least squares problem that you're just linearizing. I mean, this is the, the linearized uh, system, the Gauss-Newton system, and then you do variable elimination in there. Okay, so um, the way we were doing that was that um, in, in one of the cases when 
um, when no new keyframe is inserted, we were actually not even marginalizing, we're just ignoring, we're just dropping uh, um, key point uh, measurements on, on this on the frame that was, was, was going to be dropping out of this, um, out of this recent, um, uh, this window of recent uh, frames. However, in the case when you're introducing a new um, keyframe in order not to accumulate this number of keyframes, then we were doing something a little bit different and, and we're actually marginalizing out landmarks. And, and in hindsight, this is very similar as an idea as, as what is happening in, in the MSCKF that was previously explained in a bit more detail, where, where basically um, you're doing this marginalization of, of landmarks. So you, you, you hope that you have observed these landmarks well enough that you know the 3D uh, the underlying uh, 3D positions well, and then you can you can get rid of them, you can marginalize them, and you can in this in this way you can still keep what is here indicated in purple a kind of linear constraint, uh, a linear relative pose between these these recent keyframes. Okay, so so that was the idea here. Um, a, it's been a couple of, of, of years um, since we have done that. Again, in a new iteration, we are we're doing things uh, now slightly different and also trying to bring back loop closure constraints and post graph optimization into the system, which is a bit of a challenge. And uh, I'll, I'll be talking about this at, at some other occasion. Um, now, one of the things, of course, that you do is you want to evaluate such, uh, such systems. And back at the time, Oculus was doing uh, fairly well. Now it's, of course, been outperformed many times and I'm very happy about that. Um, but I wanted to say a couple of things about evaluation because um, I, I think a couple of things are perhaps not so obvious um, also to the community. So I, I, I thought it's, it's maybe a good, um, good point here to talk about a couple of what I think might be still, still issues that we have in, our, in the current way we are doing evaluation. So, so let's see here what's actually happening um, if you're talking about the visual inertial odometry system, let's say we have some form of ground truth here. Um, part of that ground truth will be that there is a, a body frame associated uh, with it. And so what we can do is we can do this, uh, this, this relative position error relative to, to, to an initial body frame. So um, you would have your, your, your own system here which um, does something like this, right? So it's, it will drift a little bit um, after a while and you can kind of analyze the error of, of what's going on here. And because you have everything referenced to some initial body frame, um, you don't have to worry about any world frames and it's just going to kind of work out like that automatically. And, and then what, what we do, um, what we've seen before already is that you can perhaps do some statistics about there where you might be chopping up this trajectory into individual segments here of, of a certain length and you can analyze the error at the end of this uh, segment and you can repeat that. Um, you can you know, uh, compute this error here and put it in a plot uh, for this specific um, distance that you have traveled and you can evaluate the, the relative distance um, error here as, as you know, something like meters per meter traveled, if you will, in, in percentage. And then you, you can repeat this thing. Um, you can take the next segment and you can um, you know, you, you get your next measurement here and you can accumulate the statistics and you can do um, the whole thing for several uh, incremental distances you can chop up this, uh, this trajectory in, in several ways. So that was, that was the way we, we evaluated things in, in, in OCVIS and it gives a relatively complete uh, pictures of, of, of what might be going on in a specific trajectory. And you can also do um, the same thing for, for orientation changes, perhaps for all of the different axes separately um, and it's, it's a very similar idea here, right? Except that you get something like degrees per meter um, to, to evaluate your drift. So, so that's, that is a quite comprehensive thing and perhaps a somewhat accepted standard by now as, as how to, to evaluate it. But I wanted to still bring up a couple of issues um, that, um, that can be overlooked here. And, and one of them is the following. So assume now, um, we, we have a slight error here in the ground truth orientation. Um, this is something that can happen quite easily, actually. Um, you know, this, we, we all do our best with, with, with ground truth, um, but you know, it will never be perfect. So if you have a slight error here, then all of a sudden, um, this initial alignment is going to be wrong. And through the lever arm kind of effect that you get here, you all of a sudden get a really big error. Right? even though actually you had a fairly good uh, performance in your VIO system. 
Um, so a slightly wrong orientation ground truth leads to very wrong drift evaluation, and that can get quite confusing. And what, what might be, um, well, there's actually a similar effect and might be even more common that uh, you might have a slightly wrong orientation estimate. So that's something that can happen quite easily too. And we've seen some uh, degenerate cases before, for instance, when you're translating at sort of constant speed um, or especially in a, in, in a monocular visual system, you, you might have some uh, quite easily some, some difficulties to distinguish um, accelerometer biases and, and orientation, right? Um, so it, it's something that can happen quite easily and you will get the same effect. So you don't even need to have a slightly wrong um, ground truth um, orientations. So that, that is something that we should be aware of. Um, I'm not sure um, there is a, a very easy way around it because I still think this is a good way to evaluate things like that, but perhaps um, a possible solution might be to do a trajectory alignment rather than going through a sort of common body frame that you just assume is correct through, through, through correct um, orientations. Um, however, now you have just um, added new problems here um, because you don't now know how long in time and or space should this segment be um, to, to, to use for alignment to then afterwards um, do um, this, the same relative position um, error assessment again. And also what if that alignment in itself has some observability issues, for instance, it might be a straight line, straight line segment or you might not be moving for a long time. So, so what are you going to do um, if, if this is kind of a degenerate case of, of alignment in the first place? So just pointing this out, that is actually not so obvious that some of, some of the um, um, evaluation metrics that we use, we, we need to just uh, maybe use a bit of care sometimes and, and, and look at these, so perhaps a little bit not, not so obvious effects that we get. Another one that I wanted to briefly talk about has actually to do with the scale. So again, if now we make a little bit of a mistake in terms of uh, scale, so we have this kind of uh, visual inertial odometry estimator here, and it, this is actually something that again happens quite easily. It, it might happen if you're and sort of translating at constant speed or so and, uh, and, and or structure is, is far away. You have a monocular system, for instance. Um, then, then that can happen quite easily that you, you have these this slight observability issues and you misestimate the scale of the whole problem. And so in this kind of exploratory um, type motion, that might not be a big problem. You might say, well, you know, you, you are actually getting a larger error here so, you know, this will show in your evaluation and, and that's right. But how about if you have a more loopy type motion then things are a little bit less obvious. So you, you might be coming back to a similar place as where you started. And uh, if, you, if you're looking at a certain length of a segment and um, all of a sudden your, your error is actually kind of really small except quite outrageous scale errors that you had here, right? So, so this is, it's just something that doesn't show in a, in a very intuitive way. Um, so you might be evaluating quite long segments and you might think, well, actually my, my algorithm is really great, even though you have a huge scale error. Okay. Again, I'm not sure there is a, a simple way around this. Um, and perhaps one thing that one can do, and, and some evaluations do that, for instance, in, in, in Orb Slam 3, I've, I've seen it that um, you, you assess the scale error separately. You could do some, uh, some optimization um, to optimize for the scale between these two. And, and you can report that separately in terms of percentage perhaps of, of scale error that you're making. It's, it's however still not so easy to do because um, it's not so clear what now again the segment length is in order to, to do this assessment. Um, of course, if you have still have some, some drift and then you're trying to align very drifted uh, trajectories, it's, it's not so obvious if you're going to get the right, the right scale there. So you have to kind of still choose the, the right segment length. Also, what if your scale estimates perhaps change or your scale misestimations uh, change over time? It's not so optimal, uh, not so obvious how, how you might be able to report that. So I just wanted to point these out um, because I think it's, it's a great opportunity here um, having this, this audience that, um, that uh, very much works with um, visual inertial navigation systems. Okay. Um, the other one now is about SLAM. Um, in, in SLAM, we've already seen that um, typically trajectory alignment is performed and then absolute trajectory error is 
um, is reported because the notion of drift is, 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 is not so obvious anymore. This is exactly the thing that you're trying to avoid uh, or limit if you are doing loop closures. So, so typically what you do then is, um, or what's happening is that you have your, your trajectory here, you, you pretty much have some sort of visual inertial odometry behavior first, and then there is a loop closure happening. Um, and you might have this kind of a jump and if you're now reporting what is a causal trajectory, um, then you know that's what's what's going to be in your ultimate trajectory that you write into your file that you, you evaluate that there is going to be this jump. You cannot retroactively somehow propagate loop closures back in time. Um, otherwise, that would make it a non-causal uh, trajectory. So basically, reporting your life poses this is kind of what's going to what it's going to look like in a global frame. That um, whenever there's loop closures, there's going to be these little little jumps here and there. Of course, that will limit overall the the, the absolute trajectory error. But um, at the same time, you can't completely get rid of, um, of of the kind of errors that are also induced by these jumps. Um, so. On the other hand, you can of course still do things like backpropagating these, these errors and report, report an on-causal trajectory and that will be typically smoother. This is your post-run kind of final, final trajectory um, where, where you, you won't have these jumps and typically lower errors. So this again, this sounds like a very obvious thing when I'm saying it like that, but, um, but I think it's very important to be aware of these differences and also to make sure that we are stating it in, 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 in the papers that we write, what they actually is that we evaluate, um, because quite obviously there will be different performances. Okay, so now I've talked about um, sparse LAM or sparse visual inertial navigation systems. And I want to now move a little bit up the the levels of the, of, of, of the sort of um, spatial AI pyramid and talk a little bit about dense LAN. Now, of course, you could use a, a sort of sparse, sparse visual inertial navigation system to, to, you, to take your quite accurate poses from and then do, do dense LAN on top of that. But in the literature of, of dense LAN, um, people are also trying to, to use the dense map directly for, for tracking. So to have a sort of, um, yeah, you know, um, purely dense system, if you if you will, and and here what what people use, including also including um, our own work, um, is is typically if you're lucky enough to have a depth camera that you can use ICP alignment. Um, so you have your live frame here, and you're trying to align the 3D measurements, the projected out uh, depth measurements, with the uh, the structure here, the uh, the, the, the black line would be the dense structure. And you can do things like um, associating every pixel through projective data association with a keyframe. So you have your keyframe depth map here and you can associate the, uh, the, the live um, measurements here um, in terms of pixels. And you can now evaluate the sort of projected normal distance perhaps to this, um, to, to this map. And we can do that for every pixel and we can just try and minimize this, uh, this, this distance for all of the pixels, right? So that's the traditional uh, ICP um, via projective data association. Now we can, on top of that, we can of course also align colors and that's particularly important if we don't have any, any um, depth measurements in our live frame and we can you know, just formulate the color difference in a similar way via projective data association and try to minimize that color difference um, in between the live frame and the keyframe. So, so that's the typical mechanisms of doing tracking. Now, of course, we were actually deviating now from this very nicely probabilistic formulation, right? So we have introduced a sort of inconsistency here in an estimator because we are freezing uh, the, the 3D structure, we're just assuming it's given and we are only optimizing for, for the 6D pose. Because simply optimizing jointly, at least in a naive way, the dense geometry would be something that, um, that's not really very tractable for a real-time system. Um, but still we can try and do a, um, a, a sort of dense tracking based visual inertial navigation system. And it's something we did a couple of years ago here. Um, so this built on our previous system, Elastic Fusion, which was purely an RGBD um, system. 
So if you look at the underlying factor graph structure of, of such um, a tracking system on, on the top left here, it looks quite simple, right? Because all you're considering is your current pose and then you're taking these ICP and RGB residuals. Um, so, so you're just solving for this one variable uh, block that's here, that's, a, that's your pose, right? And um, there's nothing else involved. I just got a lot of residuals here, of course, to evaluate. So we'll, we'll typically do that on a GPU if you want to be fast. Now to do it with visual inertial, then we had to be a little bit creative and, and extend, expand this, uh, this, this factor graph a little bit. And we actually um, simultaneously estimated also a past uh, pose. So here you have your current pose and then there is one pose in the past. And then these two were related together with nonlinear, with the nonlinear kind of pre-integral type um, IMU factor is basically the same as I've shown before with, with OCVIS. And so we augment also the state here with speeds and, 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 and IMU biases. Okay. And we were then um, using again marginalization here to uh, keep a uh, linear prior on that, uh, on that previous pose. So this way we still have a sort of filtering based um, estimator, but importantly, an estimator, a visual inertial estimator that didn't optimize simultaneously the, um, the 3D structure. So then you, you, you get your new pose and you just kind of fuse new information into the 3D map, into the then 3D map, and, um, and, and you hope that goes well. So in order to make that go well a little bit better, one, one thing that we did is to make sure that in, in, in some map optimization that there is down here, there is um, there's also a term that makes sure that the, the map keeps aligned with gravity, right? So in elastic fusion, there's this mechanism where we are optimizing, we're effectively um, elastically deforming the 3D map um, uh, when loop closures happen. And, and here we have to make sure that when, when these deformations happen, that we don't deform the map um, out of this kind of globally observable gravity direction. So that, that was a trick here. Um, otherwise, yeah, you would ultimately, through these loop closures, potentially get some, some, some kind of uh, inconsistencies again, some very obvious inconsistencies. So, so here's a, a quick demo of that system. That's uh, my former student Tristan here showing it. This was again, it was a real time dense visual inertial system. So he's, he's moving this uh, real sense uh, RGBD inertial camera around and, and building a map. Um, so it's, it's not as, dense as you might like it to be. So there's some, some stuff missing here and there, uh, but, but still it's a, it's a fairly dense map that you can build up that way. And here you can see the loop closures where these, these kind of alignments, realignments of the old map with respect to the new map actually occur and things are kept consistent as, as a proper slam system. And the map itself is this kind of little circles. So it's, it's almost, it's a bit like just a very dense point cloud actually that is also colored. That's our representation here. And so this is just a uh, difference here now, RGBD only versus RGBD inertial to show a little bit the difference in terms of drift. Here we have loop closure disabled. And, and you can see here how really the inertial measurements can help you a lot uh, in, in such otherwise a traditional uh, dense, visual, uh, dense vision only RGBD uh, SLAM system. Okay. So I want to just briefly also talk a little bit about representations. You have seen before, this was a, a sort of point cloud, uh, a circle cloud. And you might argue to what extent that is useful for, for robotics. Um, it can be in, in, in some way. Um, I'm, I'm still unsure about the bit this point. Uh, but I think as an alternative, um, then, Sort of volumetric uh, mapping is actually is, is very interesting too, um, and perhaps certain advantages over it. So I wanted to briefly talk about that. Where other than sort of explicitly storing um, a surface, we, we want to go along and, and store things volumetrically in, in 3D space. So for every point in 3D space, um, we, can, we can store something. And in the case of a science distance field, you are effectively storing the different the distance, sorry, the distance to a surface. So you typically then truncate that. So you limit this, this representation as to close to a, to a surface. So here you, you, you see here as a, as this snapshot from perhaps what was observed from a depth camera. You have the distance here in front of the surface and behind the surface as you could extract it from, for instance, a depth map directly. 
And then your surface is implicit at the zero crossing of that, of that function. Um, also, this kind of truncation that helps us um, about memory footprint that we need, because we can now only store stuff where it's actually needed close to the surface. And you can do that, for instance, with, with an octree representation. So that's something I want to briefly talk about. And it's something we've, we've done quite intensively recently. So you're kind of using this, uh, this recursive subdivision of, of space until ultimately um, wherever you need it, you can uh, allocate some dense memory block and store your TSTF um, values here. Um, because this thing has actually the advantage that um, it also integrates very nicely with this concept of adaptive resolution. So I want to briefly talk about that um, because I think it's, it's it's sort of important concept um, and, and it's quite tightly coupled to the projective nature of, of cameras. That when we move far away from stuff, we, we simply won't see the details anymore. We're we not really don't have to be interested in the details anymore. But when we are close by, we, we want to be and we have to be, right? So in, in this way here, we can really select the scale of our 3D uh, space according to the distance to the camera. And we can do that both in the at the stage of, of tracking. So doing something, for instance, like ICP and or um, RGB uh, based tracking, we can we can access the um, the volume to, to render a depth map to ray cost depth map at the right scale. And we can also do the same thing when we are integrating new information when we're fusing new information from from these depth maps into um, into space. So that way, this also helps us not only with speed, but this also helps with avoiding aliasing artifacts. Um, and so here's the system that we put together. It's now also a couple of years ago. And um, you can see rendered the, the scale that is, is dynamically selected. So the red one um, would, would be you know, a, a sort of next coarser scale. And then when the camera moves even further out, you can see the, the kind of blue scale that, uh, that appears. And we're doing the color fusion here as well into the volume in a, in a similar way as a sort of uh, moving average kind of color fusion. And here also, we are, we are actually selecting the scale for, for both the rendering and the integration uh, according to, to distance in exactly this way that I outlined. Now, of course, the tricky bit, and I'm not going to tell too much details about it, but the tricky bit here is a bit um, around how you would actually keep things consistent and, and, and doing that in real time. So we have some lazy evaluation system that does that um, under the hood. And basically what you get is, is, is really quite a lot less of these kind of aliasing artifacts. So that helps with also better tracking, of course, and you have more correct details in your map. And you, you won't really see these differences maybe as much when you're moving your camera at a sort of nominal distance uh, around space. You won't really see much, but when you're really moving it in and out um, um, of the scene, then, then you get to see these differences. Okay, so I want to just briefly also show an extension now to occupancy mapping where we adopted basically the same uh, scheme. And this is something that is shown here at ICRA. Um, this year, um, there's a presentation about it tomorrow. So we can go and see some details there, but basically, and I think that's quite important for robotics. And um, we wanted to have explicitly represented fully in a dense uh, uh, and complete way, the space that is actually free. And again, that integrates very well with this notion of adaptive resolution, because then you need means you can really represent the free space at the kind of coarseness that there is. Um, so we can we can keep um, updating these quite big chunks of space here at, at the coarse resolution, but still actually knowing that it is free, right? So we don't just focus on surfaces now, as with TSDF mapping, we really focus on, on consistently integrating and probabilistically correctly in integrating these depth measurements into space. And then still maintaining the sort of efficiency that you need in order to actually do planning in here. So you can see these kind of cuts through space, how, how we are trying to be as coarse as possible here everywhere. So you would have fine resolution at the surfaces at where things actually happen and, and, and otherwise as coarse as possible. And then we can also have this kind of fine resolution of the boundaries of what is observable of what and what not. And this way we can really 
I would say, correctly plan things like a flight corridor, for instance, through, through such a map, where you really wouldn't want to go through a part of the map that hasn't been observed before. So you might not have an evidence that there actually, um, whether there is surfaces there or not, um, but, um, but you, you really don't know. So you can, this way, you can explicitly avoid it and concentrate on free space. So this is, it's a real-time system as well, just to point that out. It's, uh, it's in many ways very similar in terms of speed as, as the, the system I've shown before. And it can even be used, the same kind of reasoning uh, around multi-resolution, adaptive resolution can also be applied to LiDAR-based mapping. So that's another uh, ICRA work. This is a collaboration with um, Maurice Fallon's group and Maurice might be talking about it later and there will be a presentation later at ICRA about it too. Um, so the same idea can even be applied to sort of larger scale LiDAR based mapping. And just briefly, one of the things that will happen is um, typically, you know, in, in depth cameras is that you will have holes in your depth map. And that, of course, in this kind of thinking um, of occupancy mapping is going to be a big problem because if you're conservative about it, you will now have a lot of places in your map that are actually unobserved. Um, and then if you're conservatively planning through that, you, you're going to have a lot of, um, uh, well, a lot of issues around finding paths. So we were just trying to look at um, how we could fill in the gaps here. Um, so using a, a, a convolutional neural network to, to make depth completions, uh, but not only to complete what, what is, what is uh, not observed and you know, the, the big cues are here in the RGB image that let us sort of fill in the details that we can learn in this way. But we didn't want to just do the completion of depth, but also think it is quite important to know about uncertainty about that. So we have trained it in a way that we are predicting uncertainties with it. Um, and, 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 and that's actually, I think, then quite nice because you can integrate it um, directly as the uh, measurement likelihood function into occupancy mapping. And it's, it's kind of okay, actually, if you're not so certain about, you know, certain things. As long as you know that there is some free space in front of your camera, you don't really have to know how many meters exactly this is now away. Uh, and you can still do quite a lot of um, uh, discovery of free space this way without actually destroying your, your 3D reconstruction. So in this way, it's kind of naturally uh, doing both free space mapping in a complete as complete as possible in our way and accurate uh, mapping. So you can see here a bit the differences in terms of uh, space that is being discovered. Um, so you will get a little bit of, of wrong, uh, incorrect free space, but it's typically um, relatively uh, small. And um, as soon as you're getting actual observations of that space, it will immediately correct it again. Okay, so this is just a bit of an example. Uh, as you can see, evidently it's occasionally getting it wrong, but, uh, but then it's, it's kind of okay um, because the robot can still move into that direction that otherwise the robot wouldn't be able to. And, and of course, this, you could do this in a smarter way as well and, and using multi-view constraints and so on, but it is a fairly sort of lightweight way of bootstrapping your, your uh, dense mapping system in a way that uh, discovers the free space quite efficiently. Okay, so finally now I want to, uh, however, move up the levels even a little bit more and just briefly talk also a little bit about, um, uh, about object-based uh, mapping. So this is a uh, work that we did where we were using also this um, volumetric thinking of the map, but uh, just decomposing the map into individual, well, individual maps uh, per object, uh, maps that can also move around, as you can see here. So we're in this case, it's quite a tricky case because we are tracking the camera motion, we are tracking the individual object motion, and we are also reconstructing the, the map, and we are also reconstructing the individual object. So there was really no 3D uh, uh, pose and uh, um, geometry information that we're using. And of course, as you can guess here, we're using uh, something like an instance level convolutional neural network uh, for, for semantic segmentation. Um, in, it is mask RCNN actually um, coming off the shelf here that lets us bootstrap this process uh, in, in 2D, uh, how to initialize these, these individual objects. But then we still have to do quite a lot of work in terms of um, determining how, how that relates to 3D and which ones are actually uh, moving and which ones are not. 
So we can see here in the stream down here, there is a, that this is the sort of more traditional part of the pipeline where um, we're actually analyzing um, the residual error statistics after an initial tracking step to determine which ones of these objects are actually static and which ones are not. So you wouldn't want to just assume any of these objects are uh, moving anyways, um, because this way, if you look at a lot of objects that might be potentially moving, you couldn't track your camera anymore. So you really, you kind of want to on the fly uh, determine which ones of these objects are actually moving and which ones are not. So we're really doing this uh, residual analysis of exactly the ICP and the RGB photometric error that I was introducing before. Um, and then after an initial tracking and, and, and mapping step, you can then also uh, do the tracking of the individual objects with the camera that has been tracked already in exactly the same way, ultimately, as you track the camera with respect to the static background, you can now track between a moving object and, uh, and, and the camera that's already been tracked. Okay, so, so here is uh, just a little bit more results about this. Um, so this way we can now deal with a scene as static that otherwise would be quite disastrous if you were to, uh, to do the same thing um, with, a, with a SLAM system that uh, assumes, sorry, I sort of stopped playing here. I don't know why. Here we go again. Okay, so, but it still isn't perfect. As you can see, there are these kind of ghosting artifacts. There's not always perfect tracking. There's not always perfect mapping. And, and one of the reasons we think is, is because of change of illumination. And, and that's particularly bad uh, if you have moving objects, because even if you have Lambertian objects, they will actually change the shading, right? As they change orientation, especially, they will change the shading. So this kind of um, RGB alignment uh, might become a problem. So more recently, and that's also again, work from here from ICRA, we were looking at uh, doing feature metric tracking, a bit similar as what we heard before, to, to see um, how could we deal with these kind of uh, changes of illumination uh, in a way that is also learned. Um, so we're actually, rather than trying to just align the, uh, photo, the, the, uh, the uh, brightness values, we are trying to align features that are being learned. And this is, this is very much um, uh, based on this uh, deep inverse convolution uh, compositional uh, work um, that was, was, this is now about a uh, year old by, um, by Daniel Kramers and, and others. But additionally to that, we are now also predicting uncertainties. So we are, we are trying to learn which parts here um, are actually uncertain uh, in terms of the features that we are getting such that we can better balance uh, these things with respect to one another. And another thing that this, uh, this system actually does is that it predicts a, an initial pose. So it also takes these uh, feature encoders that are coming here from both of the images uh, and then at different scale levels. So we're taking these uh, encoded features also to predict an initial, to have an initial pose regression here um, that is then refined in iterative alignment, a sort of course to fine alignment through uh, Gauss-Newton uh, optimization, basically. And the whole thing can be trained end-to-end. -end. That's, that's the nice thing about it. Okay, so I'll just uh, slightly skip through these. Yeah, you can see how the, the individual images go in, both left and right and right and left. Um, and we're computing these feature maps and sort of confidence maps um, in the network. Okay, so yeah, perhaps most interestingly, um, some results here. So this is the alignment with respect to a fixed keyframe as a sort of two view alignment. And then we're disturbing it here with some, some change of illumination. And you can see how very, you know, the naive RGBD uh, approach is very easily disturbed. Um, and, and also some, even ICP can be uh, potentially problematic if, if you don't have enough depth. Um, and so with ours, um, we, um, we get quite nice robustness here. So this is really trying to uh, address this robustness. Another nice aspect, I think, of this weighting with uncertainty is that you can actually quite easily combine it with ICP because you, you have now a natural weighting of the uh, individual uh, feature error terms. Okay, so very finally though, I just wanted to briefly show a robot as well, um, just because, you know, this is ICRA. And, and I thought I need to show that we also do some actual robotics. Um, so 
Of course, one of the things that we would like to, um, to do is apply some of the spatial AI, the different levels of spatial AI to, to actual robots um, and drones. So here is one. And here's a, a drone that we have equipped with a delta arm and uh, that has this, this pen uh, attached to it. And uh, we wanted to use it to actually draw something on a, on a whiteboard. Okay, and we're using a, a control scheme here that integrates now um, a penalization of the drone state together with the end effect, the lateral position, as well as a, a force that is exerted onto a, say, whiteboard. So we can do this kind of joint control of, of drone states and end effector states in a, what is effectively here, a nonlinear uh, model of predictive control scheme. So I just wanted to show this briefly. Um, and wouldn't it be nice here if we had the full sort of spatial AI stack that would tell exactly where the drone is, uh, where this whiteboard is, what the geometry of it is, and could do that completely autonomously. And now, of course, here we're cheating a lot because uh, we, we were using still a Viken system to at least reduce the complexity of all of this a bit. We were telling it where the uh, whiteboard was, uh, this was hard enough to do as a control task, right? But um, I just wanted to leave this as a sort of inspiration for future work that of course we want to now bring these things together, the advanced uh, spatial understanding together with uh, quite interactive, quite advanced robot control. Okay, and I'll just let it play a little bit more because um, part of the difficulty when you're trying to do something something like this is that it doesn't just work once um, but that it works robustly so you know this is the same as for our spatial ai systems uh, robustness is really important also on the control side here so even when you're varying speeds for instance a little bit when you're doing successive experiments you want to make sure um, that this is really working all the time All right, but I'll leave it at this and just have uh, one slide of conclusions. I talked a little bit about spatial AI from sparse winds to dense winds to different map representations to also semantic and object level maps. I've shown this example about aerial manipulation. And as you can see, there's a lot of challenges, I think, that are still quite open. Uh, one of the obvious ones that um, uh, I, I think there is, is, is how can we more tightly couple uh, the uh, uh, advanced inertial um, systems with this kind of dense semantic object level spatial AI. It's not quite obvious to me how we can, we can really combine these things in a consistent way. Um, also, just what are really the right representations, especially uh, in terms of maps, what are the right representations that we need for different robotic tasks? Also, what are the right representations for interfaces between modules, between you know, uh, planning and, and, and spatial AI, between um, also how to control then these robots and, and what is happening on the sensing side. Um, and, and how can we do this in a more task adaptive way? I think often we are, we are sort of being very absolute. You think, okay, this it has to be, robotics has to be done in this way and not in the other. Um, but really we do a lot of very different things with robots and, and things go in and out of, of context. Things are far away and not, not important. And then they come into a field of view again and they become important and you do very different things with different robots. So I think this whole question of how can spatial AI be adaptive to different applications, different tasks and even within a task uh, to, to just adjust what immediately you're doing is, is, is a quite open challenge. Um, in terms of the sort of higher levels of spatial AI, like what, what, what is the, the dynamic scene content? What is the temporal dimension? How, what is going on here? And, and how can we forecast what's going on? I think that's also another one where, where we are just starting to scratch the surfaces a little bit. And finally, I think the aspect of robustness is just something that's going through all of, all of this, right? I mean, this is really why stuff is, is, is not quite viable yet, is that at some point all of our systems break. And um, yeah, we, we have to work on it, I guess. So um, let me finish here and uh, maybe we have time for one or two questions. Yes, I think there are quite a few questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, Stephen, probably you can just read yourself. I think 
two from Yulin and two from Sinsin. And um, okay, okay, so, so yeah, could right. you respond? So, um, do you want me to start with? Let's yeah, just uh, the from Yulin Yang. The, from Yulin, uh, okay. Yeah. So the question is, uh, first question from Yulin, when using RGBD uh, camera, do you have experience on calibration for RGBD? Uh, depth scale, time offset? Um, yes, so this is actually a very good point. Um, it is something that I would argue you should do for highest accuracy and, and, and robustness. And I have to admit, we haven't done much uh, about it. So I, I definitely do think it would be an important um, aspect to do. Um, and the second question is about um, simulator using for the uh, MAV manipulation experiment. Yes, this is a good point. So simulation was really crucial here in, in the development of that. Um, so we have a whole kind of ROS gazebo based uh, simulation environment for, for all of that. Um, where we are, we are also simulating the, the full nonlinear uh, drone dynamics, of course, this is also based on, on rotor S, uh, that's, that's from ETH ASL. Um, and then even also the visual part of things, we are, we are also um, currently looking into integrating visual feedback directly into, into the control there. So, so you know, um, we really wouldn't have a chance, I think, without a, a, a simulator to, to do that. Okay. Great. So from Great. Xing Xing, if we have, do, yeah, do we have also has to, <laughs> oh, there's more. Uh, just, just for a second time, Stephen, uh, Steph, could you just uh, respond in a chat and we just move on to the two seconds? Okay, I will do that. I will just respond in the chat. All right. Good. All right. Thanks, David. It's Thank great. Thank you time. very much. Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, let's move on to the next talk, uh, which is given by Giuseppe Riano from uh, NYU. Giuseppe is an assistant professor at NYU. He was uh, used to be working in the Kumas group at UPenn, and now he has his own group and doing some <laughs> great work here on the math, right? Giuseppe, okay, great. <laughs> great. Thanks a lot, uh, Paul, and thanks everyone for, uh, for joining. And thanks for accommodating the different time that uh, I requested because I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm running also another workshop. So I'm a little bit tight in terms of availability. So I think you can see my screen, right? Okay, so the talk today will mostly focus on uh, resilience, visual inertial estimation for uh, agile aerial robots. So I've been working uh, quite a while on uh, aerial uh, robotics and uh, especially on the autonomy side using uh, cameras, uh, RGBD, and other types of uh, visual uh, sensors. Um, so pretty much what I want to start is a little bit about the past. So I would say that visual inertia odometry is clearly a success of the robotics uh, uh, community. So many people have contributed to, uh, to bring this kind of uh, aerial robot, for example, among all the other robots, um, to uh, a level of autonomy that was uh, not imaginable like uh, just 10 years ago. If you think in 2012, uh, we're still working most of the people with the motion capture system. And I can almost say that uh, we're in 2021 and <clears throat> Excuse me, the mo most of the motion capture system is used just for uh, validation, but basically uh, it's, it became really a commodity uh, to have a visual inertial uh, system uh, that you can just buy and uh, plug it on your robot to just do a little bit of integration and basically get the, uh, the sort of a basic autonomy, uh, at least on the trajectory level that in the past was only achievable uh, using a, a motion capture system. Uh, so this is a little bit what, uh, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I can feel we, we reached in the past, uh, let's say 10 years. You can see that from that size of large robot went to a small robots, uh, about 15 centimeter where everything <clears throat> basically runs on board uh, with the monocular camera for state estimation and then a stereo camera for mapping. 
this project was done for an inspection of uh, um, of uh, uh, let's say uh, nuclear uh, power plant in reality was done for Fukushima then we didn't test that cause of, of COVID uh, but you can see that the mission is completely autonomous the robot is able to find the ramp at the, at the, at the, 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 the bottom right of the, the video as you can see here uh, and then uh, uh, once the, the ramp is found basically it's able to, uh, to, to get into the main area uh, and get into the core of the reactor, where you can see that there is lots of uh, challenges in terms of navigation for uh, aerial uh, aerial robots with lots of fog, rain, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, this kind of uh, system that, that this kind of uh, let's say um, uh, the, um, disturbances uh, that the system is able to. Uh, to 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 handle, and then the robot finish the missions and uh, and goes to back to the original location. So as you can see, the other difficult thing is that this is happening completely in the dark. Uh, so with the, we had onboard illumination uh, provided by the robot. You can see this video because we used IR uh, basically uh, cameras. So. So really, we went to uh, the, the, the really visual knob odometry open up a wide range of opportunities uh, for our aerial robotics community, ranging from not only anymore photography, which was the main market, uh, let's say up to five, 10 years ago, but also in infrastructure monitoring, in air delivery, uh, precision agriculture, and also in uh, search and rescue, what we have just shown. And finally, as well, there's going to be a lot of development also in the swarm, uh, so in multi agency system in the in uh, in the, in the future so this i believe is one of the aspects that still the uh, the visual inertial uh, uh, community has still a lot to work on because it's uh, at least for from a distributed perspective it's very hard uh, to obtain uh, like a sort of both consensus and estimation for large number of of, of robots uh, so uh, really, what is next that I think it's interesting? So pretty much we've been interesting in the in the past to large robot. Large robots are very nice because they provide resilience, uh, but at the same time you need uh, lots of like uh, power and lots of computational uh, computational capabilities that the small robot do not have. But at the same time, smaller robots provide uh, agility. So I, I think what's also next for the for the in visual, in, in visual perception is also the ability to have a small scale system that are at the same time, uh, not only agile, but also uh, resilient. So I think that is, that is one of the main uh, future let's see the direction that we are trying to uh, achieve uh, and i think the three main uh, key ingredients in my opinion are basically the use of uh, better models that tries also to couple perception and actions in both directions uh, then the second way is to use a lightweight representation of our environment and then the third element that can contribute really to improve resilience at small scale is really the, 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 the number of robots. So you can, due to the smaller size, you can exploit a large number of robots to solve your uh, problem. But of course, I mean, this requires uh, collaborative and cooperative uh, state estimation that it's difficult to achieve uh, compared to the single robot uh, case. So I'll show some of the results in these uh, three main areas. Uh, and I'll try to connect these results basically to the uh, main objective that's ob to obtain resilience basically at small uh, scale. So in the first area, uh, uh, what, have, what we have been really uh, working is why we need a better model. So most of the visual inertial odometry system have basically a kinematic approach, which is kind of quite good in terms of generalization because it's robot independent, but at the same time with the information that's given by the dynamic system of the robot, we can improve basically the, the, the modeling of the, of the system. We can get certainly more uh, information. Um, uh, the IMU is generally assumed that the system is sort of fully actuated once for many systems, basically this does not happen. And basically in pre-fall, uh, there is a problem because the, the inertial navigation system doesn't give us uh, correct basically uh, information. So um, what we've been proposing is really to use the dynamics of uh, completely of our system and see what we can get basically as a complementary um, information compared to a simple kinematic system. So the idea is to use the full system dynamics 
dynamics. So start from the rotor uh, information that are the real control inputs of our system. So of course, what do you what do you gain here? You gain in terms of information, but of course you have a complication in terms of your model that becomes a little bit more complex. But at the same time, th these models are not that complicated. Uh, that are, are, let's say are not that prohibitive. Uh, in terms of computational uh, requirement. It just requires a couple of extra state within the, the, the system, uh, within the model. And uh, you can get basically, for example, in this case, the mass, the moment of inertia, the center of mass, the different position between the center of mass and the inertial measurement unit and the, the, the camera. And we can basically sort of even certify the vehicle because in addition to the kinematic parameters, we also get all the system dynamics. So we can potentially go to a level of auto tuning that was not possible with the, uh, the simple kinematic algorithm. So just not to go too much into the detail, but the, the system are basically the full system dynamics and the state is basically divided into a state that depends on the time that basically position and orientation of the vehicle. And then a couple of auxiliary states that divide Biases and all the uh, mass inertia and all the uh, difference in terms of you know relative position between the sensors and what you can clearly see is that we are able to uh, basically this requires an inertial measurement unit just the the, the the rotor information and additionally a pose sensor that can come from a visual inertial system or from uh, even a motion capture system or a lidar system if you prefer another system and so this is one of my students valentin us that now is that now is at the epfl during his phd with with Dario Floreano, he did this master thesis with me. And basically, the, I'm just gonna go to the main experiment. So we fly and the main ability also is that we can uh, in real time, basically re-estimate all the parameters. So this is the simple case of a free flight. So we estimate all the parameters. And then once we estimate all the parameters, that's this case, my students goes to put I'll show you real time another element at the bottom of the of the robot, and you can clearly see that all the parameters get re-estimated online, uh, and they are com and we also have an observability analysis that they showed that, that where we showed that this is uh, this is clearly possible, and uh, this works also for a different configuration of the platform. So you can see that here we have a front appendage, and uh, and once we we. Um, we estimate all the parameters. These are the main dynamics parameters in terms of uh, inertia and, and mass. Uh, the, due to the configuration is mostly the Z and the Y that gets affected. So that's why we, have, we don't have the X. And you can see that the parameters immediately reconverge basically to the new value uh, once they, the, the system gets, uh, gets, uh, gets, um, gets the, the, the information from the, uh, the sensor. So um, the, the main problem is that what about if we don't have uh, even a camera? So what can we do in that case? This is the interesting case where the camera basically fails uh, or you have such a small vehicle that is basically impossible even to put the camera in terms of computational uh, capabilities. And so uh, the main thing is that what can you do with the DMU? Well, what can you do with the DMU is that basically we can show that with the DMU using uh, some kind of a, a drag information. For example, at high speed, uh, it's possible to estimate the full velocity uh, and as well as the uh, part of the orientation of the, uh, of the robot uh, itself. Uh, so uh, what we do is that uh, uh, so the drag information this time is added to the uh, to the system, uh, and we get the information from the, the drags thanks to the accelerometer. So thanks to the difference between the predicted part that's given by the rotor basically thrust and the, the data that is given by the accelerometer, we we are able to uh, estimate these. Let's say. Uh, 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 sort of estimate these drag forces, and in this sense, we are able to estimate the linear velocity of the uh, of the system. So, in addition to all the uh, drag coefficient as well as the uh, IMU biases and so on. So, we in the in the, in this paper, we have also an observability analysis uh, related to this uh, uh, aspect. Um, so to, to, to give you an idea, we estimate the, the 3D velocity, but also the tilt. So the tilt we have divided, instead of using an Euler parameterization, we used uh, 
spherical um, S2 cross S1 just to divide the observable from the unobservable because the yo is still unobservable uh, because it's just the information just come from the uh, the gyros and what so in, in reality what what we get is that we basically get all the information related to the tilt to the velocity in the body frame the biases and the coefficient and the uh, the um, also and the yo as an auxiliary state uh, that is the only state that is possible being estimated by the uh, by the vision system. Um, so in, in overall, without going too much into the details, these are the main uh, the main equations that are given the velocity in the body frame, the yo, and the uh, the basically the tilt uh, that represent the two degrees of freedom for the uh, orientation. And we uh, optionally get the information coming from the, uh, the for the, the third degrees of the orientation. We optionally get this information from the vision, uh, but we uh, this this um, this part is extremely speeded up because the runs act actually uh, basically the outlier rejection scheme really gets help from the velocity attitude. Uh, UKF. So the velocity at UKF basically generate basically the sort of the motion model uh, for the vision system that is able to quickly reject uh, outliers, uh, and so it becomes extremely fast. Uh, so this is the case that we uh, basically uh, are running some of the trajectory. You can see that pretty much the vision of the camera is just used for the yo, and you can see at the bottom the velocities uh, as well as the orientation in the in the tilt and the uh, the yo. Actually, it's very interesting when we go at fast speed because faster we go, more the drag, um, more the drag gets its component um, uh, basically excited. Uh, let's put it this way, uh, and you can see that the uh, the we're able to estimate uh, this kind of variable. So this is really a comparison between what we get from a purely inertial system with the vision-based uh, one. Uh, we even went further. What about uh, if we can we combine the first two and get something all together? Well, the answer is yes. You can actually get also the inertia, the mass, and so on, just using the uh, the uh, inertia navigation system. And we went even at the lower scale. So we modeled the drag for each one of the rotor hubs uh, in the full system dynamics, and uh, that's that's this term here. And we also did it for the rotational part. So we noticed that. In the rotational part, there is, was a flap moment that was really playing a, build, a big role in the estimation. And this was visible be, because we did a comparison between the data of the MU and the data from the, from the model. And we, 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 we could see that there was a clearly a discrepancy that was, that, was you, that was due basically to this, uh, to this uh, flap. And uh, this was the last part of James Barsha PhD uh, thesis. And uh, uh, basically, uh, what we what what we do uh, is at this point, thanks to the rotational dynamics, we can estimate also the inertia, uh, in addition to other parameters, the mass, and so on. And these are some examples. So you can see that this is completely. You know, uh, of course, we do the flight in in Python, but this is completely running on board at the same time. Uh, inertia based uh, inertia based estimator. So it's just a purely uh, motor speed and inertial measurement unit, and you can see that the velocity is quite uh, uh, good compared to the to the ground truth, uh, and as well as we are able to estimate all the inertia parameters that in the previous case were not able to do uh, just using the uh, the translational model so we added basically that, that flap moment also into the uh, into the orientation uh, part uh, so this gives great uh, great uh, uh, so this gives really hope that basically better model at uh, at uh, for that are reasonably from come from a computational perspective can improve the informational knowledge of simple uh, kinematic based uh, inertia navigation system. Regarding the lightweight representation, what we are working on is to add basically the semantic information to the uh, to the geometric one, and we're focusing basically on semantic edges. Uh, this is a nice representation for robotic system because uh, compared to other semantic representation, we just classify basically the boundaries of the object. And uh, uh, that's basically what is really needed, in my opinion, to do a safe navigation. Basically, you just identify where the boundaries of the object are, and you try to fly or uh, 
uh, move around them. And uh, these are also memory efficient because you don't need to save the entire information of the object, but basically just the boundaries. And uh, my, one of my students made this neural network that's able to run basically on a desktop G GPU at 30 hertz and on a, and on a normal laptop and on a normal TX2 at 15 hertz. And compared to the uh, to the to the to the state of the art approach, basically we have that uh, we have similar performances in terms of uh, qualitative and quantitative results, but we have have, we are substantially faster than, than, than other systems. So we hope to add this kind of features into the next version of uh, our visual inertial uh, navigation pipeline, both for mapping and estimation. And actually, where is also that the IMU can play a role here? Well, uh, the IMU can play a role also in propagating the semantic information. So what we have done recently is that we have basically propagated the semantic information from one from the key frame to the current frame because in general it's it's very expensive also with the large backbone uh, to basically uh, estimate the semantic edges. So uh, so we created the lightweight detector, but another alternative would be okay. I, I want really the accuracy of the best uh, network. So the maximum speed is two hertz. So how can I speed up the entire system well the, you can basically do a detection on a given keyframe and do a depth estimation on a given keyframe and then propagate just using the IMU pose this is just we are trying to regress from the MU using 1D ResNet just the pose and then compute the flow and warp it to the semantic information of the original keyframe. And so really this propagates the semantic information from the original keyframe to the basically the the, the current frame and uh, really gives an idea. This is, for example, some of the trial that we did with the IMU based uh, uh, regression network. And you can see that uh, pretty much it's very close to the uh, to the ground truth. Some of these are qualitative results. And this is, for example, the comparison. So this is the original reference frame. At the bottom, at the uh, at the center, you see the propagated keyframe, the propagated information from one frame to another, and the, at the last row, you see uh, the 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 new detection. So really, what is interesting is compare the second, that's the propagated the semantic information, with the third one, that is basically the read the detection <clears throat> again, the semantic detection at the corresponding frame and from a qualitative. And now we have also some quant quantitative results. We can see that <clears throat> we are pretty close and we are able to speed up original uh, network, OK? That are very, very uh, heavy from a computational uh, perspective. Then I want to go on the last part that's related to the number of vehicles. So here the situation becomes really more and more complex because the number of vehicles means that you need to deal with a different system that needs to communicate, be able to communicate with each other uh, to reach a consensus, both from, uh, um, let's say, a perception perspective, but also from a control perspective. So uh, this is uh, like a little bit of a taxonomy. It's very difficult to get the taxonomy on a, a different kind of swarm system, but gen gen uh, generally what the, what happens is that we have a division in terms of sensing and computation, platform, uh, agent similarity, and also communication paradigms. For example, you can have a centralized system, a decentralized system, or a fully distributed uh, system. So where we really focus our attention today is on sensing and computation. So in the past, many solutions have been proposed. I mean, we started with motion capture system, then we went through ultra wide band system as well, and then also vision sensor. To go a little bit more into the detail, what we see is that we have a system that are based, for example, on external marker, like visually marker. So detecting this frequency, you are able to estimate the relative information from one vehicle to the other. Then we have a specific pattern. Uh, in this case, we are just not estimating at all the relative information between each other. This requires still some kind of communications despite they are, they are also in, in semi-distributed semi uh, uh, approach. So the, there is still a lot of bandwidth to transfer the information from one agent uh, to the other. 
So what we really would like to have is a, com is a com uh, what we're really trying to achieve at least on our side is to have a completely distributed system. So an on-demand system that as soon as you start to basically get information from the environment and you see the agent from a visual perspective, you are able to infer basically, you are able to infer their, their location, but you're also able to track them in time and space. I think this can really push uh, the boundaries in terms of uh, not only swarms uh, like uh, uh, you know multi-agent uh, autonomous navigation, but also in terms of human swarm interaction, uh, there is a lot of possibility in this case to uh, basically uh, push the boundaries outside the uh, the laboratory settings. And what we have proposed in our recent work, that just an ICRA work, is the ability to have uh, basically to detect and track target uh, without really communication. Uh, without requiring the agents to be in the field of view. And uh, we show it that it's uh, scalable and computationally also efficient. So we can track, um, uh, I would say, hundreds of agents at the same time. Uh, so this is based basically on an object detector that can be any object detector. In our case, we use a YOLO V3. The recent object detector are even more lightweight if you think about CenterNet or some other object detector. And then there is a two-stage process that runs in parallel. So there is a tracking part uh, that's based on a Bayesian approach that's basically able to get from the detector information, able to track the agents in the image. And then there is a six degrees of freedom pose uh, estimator. That's another deep uh, neural uh, network. Uh, so this, what, what do we achieve? We achieve robustness to occlusion and also misdetection. So to give you an idea how the system works, so we run basically the uh, tracking in the image just to save computational uh, part. Uh, so we have a four dimensional state that's basically the velocity of the center of the target and its position in the image. It's a constant velocity model where we also compensate for the rotation given, for example, by a user or another vehicle uh, gyros uh, information. Uh, at this point, what happens in the measurement update? Well, in the classic Kalman filter, basically it happens that you have a measurement and you try to have your innovation term multiplied by your Kalman gain and then update your, your, your new state from your previous state. Well, in this case, something similar happened. This is called the joint probabilistic data association filter. The only thing is that we consider all the possible information and all the possible, uh, let's say, um, uh, cases, uh, association between the measurement and a given track. So if you have a given track in your environment, what happens is that you can have multiple measurements, uh, let's put it this way, and its measurement will play a role in the way the, 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 the given track gets updated. So in the way the position of the of the of the uh, of the um, of the state gets gets updated. And uh, uh, the the um, uh, so, and each one of the measurement gets weighted during the update, in this case, with a given uh, factor uh, that is computed according to some association that I'm going to explain in the, in, the next, uh, in the next slide. And similarly happens for the covariance, where we have the predicted covariance influence in this case. And then we have the also a term that's related to the uncertainty of the association. So to recap, basically, you have a track, you have n measurement, and all the measurements play a role in the uh, basically updating the given track information just to, uh, using some coefficient. Of course, one of them will be very close to one uh, compared to the other, but this is automatically done by the uh, probabilistic uh, algorithm. So what you do is that you create basically the association matrix that has basically on the, on the column, basically all the possible uh, track, the track and on the rows, all the, all the measurement. And you try to beat the basically all the, uh, 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 let's say possible event, joints events, uh, which are represented by hypothesis matrices. So here you really try to understand what, what measurement is associated to which track in general. So you, you really write all the matrices uh, to reduce the computational uh, uh, requirement. For example, in this case, we just consider track uh, measurement that falls within the uncertainty boundaries of each track. For example, in the track M2 is just as can just be associated with the track. Uh, the measurement two can only be associated with track one and track two and so on. And then we do an update. So we compute these uh, basically the, the influence of the measurement J on the track T as the sum basically of all the probabilities 
of all the joint events uh, that were generated by the track team. So what you generally do is that you build a, basically a track with all the weights, with a, basically you build, you put all the weights into a matrix. And then for each column, you have uh, given uh, the, the, the corresponding weight. The cor so you have the weights of the given track for all the other, uh, for, for all the measurements that are available. So, um, uh, and uh, what we do is that, for example, we try this system in simulation with eight drones, and you can see that even if the paths of the drones really cross each other, uh, we basically are able to achieve, uh, we're able to distinguish the target in the image. So we are able to understand which target is uh, which, and not only to uh, look, uh, detect them, but also to track them and, uh, and localize, okay? So you can see this is a swarm of eight, uh, eight drone from um, number so uh, and this is also achievable in uh, in the reality so what you can see here that despite we miss measurement so you see that for example we miss one measurement despite we miss one measurement we are still able to track the 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 agent in time and space and so what we do is that despite uh, and the uh, the the we are robust to to for example to rotations. And we're also robust to occlusion. So the really nice thing is that even in real experiment, you can see that once the drones cross each other's path, we are still able to detect which drone is uh, is uh, corresponding to which kind of uh, of, of of agents. Okay. Then the final part I want to talk about is a little bit about the physical interaction. So the problem of multi-drone state estimation becomes even more complex when you have multiple vehicles collaborating with each other. And when we have physical uh, interconnection between the, the, the platform. So this is a really complex why, because uh, I mean, in normal system, each vehicle has its own inertial navigation system and everything works well. And one person, I mean, all of us think that, okay, each vehicle, we can put an inertial navigation system on each one of the vehicle, then uh, this should work quite well if we are able to detect also, for example, in case of the cable suspended load, the, uh, the different, uh, uh, the, the, the relative information, the relative pose uh, between the object and the vehicle. That's also a further complication that exists in, uh, for example, in aerial manipulation system. Uh, well, it's not that that uh, it's the problem becomes even more complex because basically the inertial navigation system have different types of drift. So it does It's not true that, for example, the vehicle one and the vehicle two have exactly the same drift. So what what happens in general? That the drift is different. The error is different. And so what you have is that that your system can be the the, the sp your control thinks that the feedback is perfect. So if you have no communication, what will happen is that the system, the, each vehicle will think that they have the perfect knowledge of the the, the the state estimate, and will try to implement their own control policies. And in the end, the system the, there are some discrepancies that will cause the instability of our controller because the system basically detects different different things. So this is really called, uh, cap I call this coupling of perception, uh, mechanics and control, uh, because these effects are also dependent on the type of mechanical connection that you have. For example, if you have, an, uh, if you have a cable suspended load, it's, uh, it's way less sensitive to, percep to perception errors compared to a rigid system. Uh, because uh, the, the 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 relative degrees of freedom between the payload and between the between the payload and the robot is way higher compared to a rigid a rigid system. So what is the approach that we implemented here is that we try to, for example, in this case, to um, extract the, to exploit the mechanical information to give further information to the inertial navigation system. So what we did is that we we implemented basically that the the rigid bar becomes a loop closure. Uh, between the two inertial navigation system that belong into each one of the vehicle. And so this is a permanent loop closure uh, that acts at any time uh, instant. And so you can basically continuously optimize uh, using this information between the, the two systems. In the other case, you can do something similar and we're working on it. For example, each one of the, ro the, the payload needs to follow within the, the spherical, uh, the, 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 the half of the sphere of each one of the, uh, of the vehicle. Uh, so it's basically an S2 constraint, but the real problem here is that we uh, want to achieve reliable performance, real time. I mean, reliable performance, real time, uh, using monocular vision and and um, 
and inertial sensing. So the uh, ability here is not only to transport the payload and consider it as a disturbance to the system, but the payload is really the main agent of the system that plans the trajectory and the vehicles moves accordingly. So the, 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 the state estimate is way more complicated in this case, because you need to understand the position and orientation of the load, as well as basically the cable direction and the velocity for this kind of system. So what we have proposed is, uh, for this challenging estimation problem is to use uh, basically for the uh, for the detection of the um, uh, basically of the uh, of the uh, basically for the detection of the uh, 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 for the cable direction and velocity we just use basically a single tag uh, that is very fast and efficient uh, other solution exists but they are not real time with this we get camera rate and then we feed this information from the IMU, uh, from the motor speed and from the camera, uh, all directly into the uh, in, uh, into our EKF that's able to estimate these kind of parameters. And then we would like also, what we have found is that it's possible combining this information as well as with the inertial information of each one of the robot to basically get the uh, position of the attach point and from the position of the attach point, we can basically detect, combining all the position of the attach point, we can basically get the position and orientation of the entire load. And this is what happens basically in the, in the, in the next slides. So from all the attach point, you can, you can find out the, uh, the, uh, the orientation. So, uh, and this requires a minimum three points. So it can really be scalable. If you have hundreds of agents, you don't have to share the information among all the agents, but three is sufficient. Uh, let's put it this way. Um, and once you have that, we are also able to estimate basically uh, the uh, rotation of the payload with respect to the word frame, as well as the load position. So uh, just using the position, the relative position between each drone and each attachment point, we're able to estimate the position and orientation of the load uh, in, the 3D, uh, in 3D space. Um, and uh, so this is the, the key thing that after that, we, we put this information into an, an aerostate Kalman filter and we get out of this also the velocity and, or, uh, and the angular speed of our payload that's needed for basically uh, control. And this is a video where we show basically our performance. Uh, so this is the camera view and this is uh, basically the, 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 the experiments with three drones running a monocular uh, inertial navigation system and, and uh, um, both for estimation of their own motion, but also for, for estimation of the, the entire system motion, which means the uh, payload and uh, as well as the entire uh, basically um, uh, vehicle. So it's the payload that basically generate the trajectory and the vehicle generate trust and moments to accommodate the payload, uh, the payload trajectory. So, uh, this is kind of the latest work that we're going to present also tomorrow at, uh, at IGRA from Juan Rui Lim, one of my PhD students. And, uh, uh, and to conclude, basically, uh, what I want to say is that uh, certainly action aware, uh, I mean, uh, having model where we can refine the information and can take uh, basically not only the kinematics, but also the dynamics. So action aware models basically can improve the accuracy and can also improve the, uh, the uh, information uh, uh, to the system. Uh, so can provide, for example, novel information compared to uh, kinematic based algorithm. This comes at the computational cost, of course, that's a larger state and larger computation, especially if you use an UKF, but these are still feasible of, as I've shown you on small computational board. Um, uh, uh, also, uh, these are not system that are only, uh, let's say, uh, can be either integrated in a visual inertial navigation system. So you can basically generate a completely new visual inertial navigation system based on this model, or they can also be complementary in the sense they can run on the back end and be used as a new initializer. For example, for your visual inertial navigation system, in case you miss cameras or you have some kind of, you know, uh, uh, information that is currently uh, like not available or you have you know noise at a given frame that prevents you to get a given accuracy. Uh, inertial data also can be leveraged to produce lightweight representation and I've shown you some how we propagate semantic information that we'll use later on for uh, our uh, state estimation. And the complexity dramatically increases when we consider multi-robot systems 
and uh, especially uh, in physical interconnected multi-robot system. And I think that there is a lot of research uh, to be done on that side in terms of uh, state estimation for uh, both swarms, but also for uh, aerial basically manipulation and transportation. And uh, thank you. I want to thank all my students that are doing a great job every day. Uh, I have a couple of PhD students and several master students and all the sponsors that are supporting currently uh, my lab. And thank you, I'm open to questions. And maybe I have just time for one or two uh, before my session ends. Thanks, thanks, and Giuseppe, that's a great talk. Uh, any questions? Let's see. Uh, oh, that's one. Uh, from Yulin. Um, Giuseppe, you can, I uh, just read out, you can also can, can read it yourself. The question is, for the system model of the math, the acceleration of the math model mainly contain non-zero components along each three part. Will this cause too large integration errors for system velocities and position? Well, uh, in our case, what we really integrate is the information from the motors. So the IMU is used as a measurement update at our stages. Not, maybe I was not that clear. So really what we, since we use the full system dynamics, the prediction stage is done by the motor speed we can, that we can actually measure. And then the measurement update is done by the information that's given by the accelerometer. So it's a little bit different. So we consider yes. that as a measurement update and not as a, a prediction. So we don't fully integrate like in class, like similar to classic base uh, kinematic system. I see. So basically you, you propagate based on the, the, the math dynamic model and the use yes. and treating the IMU as the measurements update. Yeah, so basically what we do, we do that now both for the translational dynamics and for the rotational one. Uh, of course, the, the caveat is that uh, you need to, uh, if you don't want to rely on a pose, on a pose sensor, you need to have enough drag uh, to uh, be able to, est to estimate the velocity. Otherwise, that gets basically, um, uh, uh, that cannot be captured, of course. Okay. Actually, um, it's also kind of interesting to me. Um, have you tried like propagate based on the inertial and try to use the dynamic model as the measurement? So I was not able to unmute. Uh, uh, no, actually, I didn't. Do, I didn't try that. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's, po it's possible, but that's a great idea. Maybe uh, should try. But in, what we really went to do this, we did. We did really this because we consider that the the motor speed is the real control input of uh, our system, basically. I see. Actually, there's another question from oh, Nicola. Uh, your colleague, right? Your former colleague. Are you planning to release an implementation? Uh, so yeah, so we are planning to release an implementation. We're finishing up the propagation through the through the IMU, and we must will release it probably by the end of the summer. An open source version of uh, of that uh, of the of that work, basically. Okay, great. And Patrick also has a question. Are you running into inconsistency to approximation in the propagation model? Uh, so yeah, so uh, that that I mean all the, the quantities that are in the state are quite, are quite observable. We didn't run much into inconsistencies. Uh, the boundaries that did, the students didn't put them, but I think they are kind of available in the paper. We put them for the first one, uh, for the where we show basically the effect of reestimating the parameters online. And that pretty much was within the, the uncertainty boundary. Okay, I think, great. I think that's all the questions we have. Thank Thanks you very again. much. That's a great talk. Thank you very um, much for, for the invitation yeah. again. <laughs> Thanks. Let's thank move. you, thank you. Yeah, all right. So let's move on to the next one. Kajia, are you online? Oh, yes, I saw, I see you. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, yes, so our next speaker is Ke Jian Wu, and uh, he's my former lab mate from Sturgis Group. He graduated last year, and now he is a chief scientist at Unreal, working on 
I don't know, working on augmented reality or mixed reality. Anyway, so working on, on, on mobile and devices and stuff. So, Kajian, it's yours. Okay. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, I do. That's okay, good. perfect. So I'll start. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for the introdu introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Kijian Wu. I was previously at the University of Minnesota at the Mars Lab. Now I am at Unreal, uh, which uh, is a company that makes uh, mixed reality glasses for everyone. Uh, today, my talk will be on my previous works on Vince and so far my experience in applying the Vince technology to the domain of mixed reality. So here's an outline of my talk. I will first talk about the Vince. I will focus on like three of my previous works. The first one is a, a very efficient VIO. The second one is efficient and consistent uh, a long term VI SLAM system. The third one is the observability analysis of a VI SLAM under special motions. And after that, I'll start talking about the Vince application in mixed reality. I will talk about uh, the, the, the definition of MR the VINs uh, as the tracking component for MR, environment sensing, user interaction, and eventually a little bit about the metaverse. So I'll start with the VINs uh, introduction. So as a motivation, uh, as many people has previously has mentioned, so I'll just briefly skip through this part. So uh, localization mapping in GPS denied areas has lots of applications such as VR, AR, MR, autonomous navigations, so on. And um, we use two sensors, as everybody knows in this workshop. The first one is the IMU that has the advantage of uh, a very fast integration of gyro and Excel measurements to get 3D motions with low processing cost. However, it has the problem of error accumulation due to the integration of bias and noise. And then we have the camera sensor, which has the ability to build three, to compute the 3D motion by tracking features and relocalize, which is loop closure based on previously mapped features. But the uh, drawback of using a camera is it requires slow motion to avoid image blur and it requires sufficient lighting and the same textures. So it is common to combine these two um, complementary sensing uh, mod mod modules together to achieve a small size and low cost uh, sensing capabilities, especially on mobile devices. Nowadays, mobile devices such as cell phones, uh, MR or VR, AR headsets or drones or have typically have IMU and the cameras on board so that we can use these sensors to um, uh, use, use them to compute the pose in real time of, the, of these platforms. However, because of these mobile devices typically have very limited processing resources, how to do it efficiently is the problem. So at the, uh, at the core of a VINX system, uh, everyone knows that it is the visual inertial localization and mapping or VI SLAM problem. And uh, we need to consider how to do it efficiently on mobile devices. It is well known that this problem um, under certain uh, assumptions can be casted as a bash least squares problem for the optimal solution. And this problem has lots of challenges such as the increasing size of estimated state vector with time. It's a highly nonlinear problem. It has high density of visual observations and uh, hence has a high demand for computational efficiency. Uh, more than SLAM uh, systems typically uh, consist of two parts. The first part is the short-term VI SLAM or AKA VIO, visual inertial odometry, where it estimates only a sliding window of recent poses and features, hence achieves constant and low latency over time. However, because it only estimates the sliding window of recent poses, it suffers to a uh, global drift after a while. Uh, so um, more than complete SLAM system typically also have a mapping backend that works on another thread um, in concurrent with the VIO front end. Uh, hence, with this scheme, it can accurately and efficiently localize that mapping with loop closure at the same time. Um, however, it typically suffers from inconsistent estimate uh, problems as, I'll as I will explain later. Um, 
So uh, I will start with uh, three of my previous works at the Mars Lab of University of Minnesota. The first one is an efficient short-term or VI SLAM or VIO with single precision implementation. The second one is an efficient and consistent long-term VI SLAM system. The third one is the observability of VI SLAM under special motions. So I'll start with the efficient VIO part. So I will skip through this very quickly as people have already mentioned this before. So the, uh, in the VIO problem setup, we only estimate a bounded window size uh, of uh, recent positive features for constant cost. And this problem uh, typically can be cast as follows. So you have IMU measurements between the poses, you have uh, camera observations to certain features. And once you collect all the states that what you want to estimate, such as the features, the pose, um, the, the clone poses, uh, some intrinsic extrinsic parameters and other states necessary for IMUs. Uh, and you use all the cost terms such as your prior information from previous marginalization steps, you have inertial measurement information and the visual observations. Eventually, this problem can be cast as a nonlinear least squares problem, and which where you solve the, the sum of all these uh, nonlinear cost terms with respect to your states. So within this problem, you only solve a sliding window of recent poses so that the computational cost is constant. To solve this problem, um, there are uh, typically different estimation uh, schemes. Uh, the, the, the most, uh, the, the, the people start with the standard EKF based SLAM and then becomes the work of the famous work of the MSCKF VIO work. And then uh, at the same time, people also start to look into uh, the Hessian domain methods, such as the sliding window filter or the, or in other words, is the uh, inverse domain methods. And eventually people are also come up with the optimization-based uh, methods. Um, I would like to mention that the optimization-based uh, methods is a close relative to the inverse uh, filter method where you, iterative, you iteratively uh, relinearize the nonlinear cost terms to uh, reduce the linearization error. And, and hence, because of the equivalence be, between the covariance and the Hessian filtering-based methods, uh, it can be uh, it can be proved that the optimization based worker uh, uh, methods is actually um, an uh, equivalent of the EKF or the sliding window EKF based uh, uh, slam methods with multiple iterations. And um, but also the same thing can be achieved of, uh, in the covariance domain, uh, which uh, the previous works of uh, iter using iterative EKF and the uh, iterative uh, common smoother have shown the ability of the covariance domain method to achieve the same relinearization abilities. Um, the drawback of using the either covariance or the Hessian domain methods is that because of the EO, uh, EO conditioning of the SLAM problem, visual inertial SLAM problem itself, it usually requires double precision arithmetic for these methods. Um, and at the same time, we know that these methods also have uh, the, its uh, square root uh, uh, equivalence. So for example, the covariance has have the covariance square root equivalent and the Hessian has the Hessian square root equivalent. And using the square root forms instead of the regular forms, either covariance or Hessian, has the following advantages. The first one is that it improves numerical stability because the condition number of the square root of a Hessian or covariance matrix is the square root of the condition number of the regular matrices. And hence it has better numerical properties. And because of that, it enables using single precision arithmetic for implementing a VI SLAM system, and especially our modern, um, uh, modern uh, mobile processors that are typically equipped with ARM Neon coprocessors, you can achieve up to four times speed up or 32-bit single precision operations. So um, in this work, uh, we propose to use the square root inverse form of the, uh, the estimator to solve for the VIO problem instead of uh, either the regular covariance form or the Hessian form, uh, which enables, as I mentioned before, the single precision implementation for speed on mobile devices. And also in this work, we designed an information selection scheme for the feature processing that uh, trades between uh, accuracy and efficiency. Uh, also, we achieved the significant computational savings by exploiting the 
uh, underlying problem structures of the VI SLAM problem. And eventually we compare with other state-of-the-art VI algorithms and show that we achieve higher accuracy and speed. Uh, next, I will briefly talk about the work itself and the, what we done in this work. <clears throat> so the overall uh, uh, methods of the square root inverse sliding window filter looks like this. It has three main major steps. The first one is the state augmentation where you use IMU information to augment new uh, poses. Uh, the second one is to update, basically you use um, the visual information to fuse the visual information with the uh, inertial information to get your pose estimates. And then the third one is marginalization where you basically remove certain states that keeps the constant size of the sliding window. Uh, I will focus on two parts of the system that uh, has uh, we uh, contributed in these domains. The first one is the, uh, the in visual information management where we uh, propose to process features with two um, different manners. Uh, first of all, we use SLAM features, a hybrid scheme of SLAM features and MSCKF features. And also we use a hybrid uh, scheme of uh, using the state and info information processing versus the state only processing. I will briefly explain the concepts here. So we first, um, classify the features into two groups, the mature features and immature features. Uh, it's simply defined as the mature uh, features are the tracks that currently starts from the oldest, oldest pose in your current window, while the others that do not start from the oldest pose are defined as immature features. So these mature features have the uh, characteristic that um, its track start from the oldest pose. So when you marginalize the oldest pose, you won't be able to relinearize and reprocess these features again. While the immature feature, since they have not reached the end of the window, it still has chance to be reprocessed to uh, relinearize and reduce the linearization error. And hence, uh, for those mature features, we examine the track length of these features. If the track spans entire, the entirety of the window, then it's likely that it, it will continue uh, longer than the window so that we add it to the state vector and process as a regular slam feature to use it as a local map to relocalize yourself within a short period of time. While for those features that have track lengths shorter than the sliding window, you can show that it is equivalent to uh, process either as a slam feature or MSCK feature, basically getting only the post constraints from these feature tracks. Uh, while this way is more efficient to process because you don't need to uh, add the feature state into your state vector. That is the beauty of the MSCKF feature processing. While for the immature features, since the track is still going on, you still have the chance to reprocess and relinearize its measurements so that we only process as a state only feature, meaning that we only use them to correct the states, but we do, we do not marginalize these measurements and absorb them into your prior so that the next time step, you can reprocess them again to reduce the linearization error. So that's the first uh, uh, contribution in terms of uh, the visual information management and processing. The second part is the numerical operations in this uh, estimator where we have identified uh, problem structures from the visual inertial VIO problem and take advantage of them to achieve computational savings. Um, well, one thing I would like to mention is that when you process slam features and MSCK features, you can process them in a uniform manner uh, as this. So you decompose the uh, cost functions of a feature track into two parts. The green parts corresponds to the, the information that only uh, provides information on the feature itself, while the second part, the, the blue, the in the blue part is all the information that uh, in the poses. This is using the left null space uh, technique from the original MCKF paper. Once you do this, the MSCKF feature only process the second part while the SLAM feature uses both parts to also estimate the feature itself. And within this process, you will see that um, when, you, when you do this, you will have the, um, you will have the, problem, uh, the problem structure, specifically the Jacobian, the post-Jacobian structure as follows. And uh, uh, when you use given rotations with a very specific order, you will obtain a Jacobian after the left null space uh, as what is shown at the bottom of this page. So you can see that this problem structure is interesting because the bottom left part is all zeros. And this will be 
taken advantage in the next step. When you have lots of these feature tracks and when you stack them together to form your big Jacobian, you will see that on the left, you will have all kinds of Jacobians that looks like this. And when you perform a row permutation, eventually you can uh, permute the matrix in the following form. And once you have this, you will be able to do a very efficient QR taking advantage of all the zeros at the left bottom part. So these left node space QR and measurement comparison QR are standard process in processing the MSCKF features and also the SLAM features, as I mentioned before, since they can be processing the same manner. So that this does not only apply to the inverse square root formulation, but since it's a Jacobian operation, it applies actually to all the SLAM estimators, if you want. And then after this, since we have upper triangular uh, Jacobian, it's very efficient to fuse information into your prior matrix. So here is some results uh, from the, uh, our VIO system. We compared on the UROC data set with state-of-the-art uh, VIO systems, including the Oculus, Vince Mono, and ISBA without loop closure. Here's how it looks like uh, between the ground truth and the estimated trajectory from our algorithm. Um, and here is the uh, quantitative evaluation in terms of the positioning RMSEs. So you can see that the, our system achieved the highest accuracy because of the uh, correct way of processing the features and uh, not dropping uh, any information from non-key frames as compared to other methods. And also in terms of running time, uh, it is pretty fast because we take care of all the problem structures and uh, we uh, process efficiently the MCKF features. Uh, so uh, to uh, briefly to conclude, our, uh, this VIO algorithm that I just presented um, it achieves improvement in both in tracking accuracy and processing speed as compared to other uh, competing methods. Uh, so this is what I would like to talk about the VIO methods. So to conclude, the VIO methods have constant and low latency over time because the estimate is only a sliding window of recent states. However, as I mentioned before, it, has, uh, it suffers to global drift due to the lack of loop closures. So next I will talk about the long-term VI slam systems where you have uh, two threads where the VIO front end is responsible for tracking in real time the poses, while uh, low frequency mapping backend is uh, responsible for um, uh, mapping, uh, getting a globally uh, accurate poses and maps and correct the global drift. Um, here is the second part. So typical systems, a typical slam, modern slam systems have these uh, two threads that I just mentioned. Um, where the key that I want to mention is that the when you perform the relocalization uh, part, uh, it is assumed that the key frames and features are perfectly known. Uh, this is in the estimation uh, theory, it is known as inconsistent estimates because these estimates have uh, certain covariances and the correlations with your current states while uh, you ignore them, so you get inconsistent estimates in terms of estimation. Uh, getting inconsistent estimates means that your estimated covariance, uh, either you explicitly estimate them or implicitly estimate the Hessian form, is smaller than your true covariance. This has two drawbacks. The first one is that um, you do not get a good measure of your current tracking quality because your covariance is not correct. The second one is uh, it will suffer from um, accuracy degradation uh, when you combine these current estimates further with new measurements because the weights are not correct. It's not optimal. So uh, in this uh, VI SLAM, uh, long-term VI SLAM work, our objective is to introduce a single estimator um, for efficient long-term VI SLAM using consist only consistent approximations instead of inconsistent ones. Um, let's revisit briefly the uh, SLAM problem structures. During exploration, it is well known that um, from the ISAM work, uh, the combinational cost is constant because uh, when you have the states uh, following the chronological order, meaning that the past stays to the left and recent states to the right, you will have constant cost updating the uh, square root factor because you only involve the some recent states. However, during the relocalization phase, it is well known that in the SLAM setup, it is uh, not efficient anymore because 
you need to involve lots of past days and both past days and recent states and hence introduce lots of uh, feelings into the factor. And as time goes on, when you have more and more loop closure measurements, the factor will be denser and denser. That is a well-known problem um, from the earlier work uh, of ISAM. So um, uh, since given this uh, fact that uh, we know that approximations are necessary to achieve uh, efficient uh, relocalization computations. So to apply approximations, there are two categories. The first one is the inconsistent ones that I mentioned before by assuming some previous keyframes or features to be perfectly known. Well, there is a second category where you have consistent approximations by selectively drop informations, where we do not assume any um, previously estimated states as perfectly known, but we only assume that uh, the, um, we only drop certain informations to get a consistent estimate of um, the system. Uh, to do that, there is a, a classic method called the Schmidt common filter, uh, where it only estimates a certain part of the state vect vector optimally, while do not update the other part of the state uh, estimates. By doing this, it reduces the cost from a square to linear in the size of the state. Uh, however, because the Schmidt common filter is in the covariance form, it has dense um, memory, which is uh, quadratic in terms of the state size. Uh, this, is, um, this is not good for the SLAM system as the time goes by and the system gets larger and larger, uh, especially on mobile devices, your uh, memory storage, will you will go out of memory. So, but at the same time, we know that um, in the SLAM VI SLAM problem is better formulated in the Hessian domain, the inverse domain because it has uh, sparse structures. So it motivates us to look into the uh, e equivalent of the Schmidt common filter in the inverse form. So uh, we, uh, in this work, we first uh, derived the exact inverse Schmidt estimator, we call it the ISE, uh, which is the exact equivalent of the Schmidt common filter, but in the inverse form. Uh, however, after we derive this, we find out that it still has linear computational cost in terms of the state size because it densifies the Hessian Cholesky factor. And hence we introduce further approximations based on the exact ISE, we call it the resource aware inverse Schmidt estimator, uh, where you have, where you do further approximation to the ISE. It has adjustable cost and maintains also the sparsity of the Hessian Cholesky factor to e achieve efficiency. And even eventually we apply this estimator to the VI SLAM problem to obtain the so-called system uh, right SLAM, uh, where we separate between exploration and the relocalization, where in the uh, exploration, we do the optimal approach of the analogous to ISAM. Well, in the relocalization phase, we apply RISE to improve efficiency while ensuring consistency because the RISE and ISE is a consistent approximation. Um, I will skip through these details. Um, basically, we derived the optimal exact uh, inverse Schmidt estimator and the further approximation, the RISE and we applied it to the SLAM problem, where in the, uh, re, uh, the, 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 the exploration phase, we use basically the ISAM, where in the, um, the relocalization phase, where you can see the optimal methods gets denser and the denser factors, while with the right SLAM system, we only uh, use parts of the information and the drop certain parts, so that to achieve an eff uh, efficient and sparse factor while maintaining the consistency of the method. In this small example, you can see that as compared to the optimal estimator, the right slam keeps a very sparse uh, uh, Hessian factor uh, when you have lots of loop closures. This is a uh, result of the system, again, on the Euroc data set, where it achieves comparable uh, accuracy as compared to other um, uh, visual inertial slams uh, systems while being uh, fast enough and have much better consistency uh, when you look at the NES results. Uh, finally, I would like to talk brief, very briefly about the uh, SLAM, VI SLAM observability under special motions. Uh, this is because when we apply the VI SLAM system to wheeled robots moving primarily on the plane, we typically see lower than expected accuracy uh, as compared to what we do in the 3D space. 
this is surprising. And then we start looking into the observability properties of VI SLAM under special motions. Um, and then eventually we have the following results. It is well known that under generic motions, the VI SLAM has four observable degrees of freedom corresponding to global position and yaw. When we have special motions, um, it is unclear that what kind of uh, extra observable directions that we have. In this work, we proved um, analytically that uh, under the general case of unknown, uh, unknown general biases, uh, we determine analytically the um, SLAM observability under some common special motion files for ground vehicles, where we concluded that the scale is unobservable if and only if you have constant local linear acceleration motions. For example, if you are moving straight on a line with constant speed or acceleration, or you are moving uh, in a uniform like circular motion, or the row and pitch orientation are also observable if and only if you have constant orientation, basically you do not rotate. And we experimentally assess the motion's impact on the VI SLAM accuracy by evaluating the scale ratio. And we will see that when you follow even an approximate um, special motion, you will have uh, with very weak information along the observable direction, and hence you will have errors drifting. So this is what I would like to talk about, uh, about the wings itself. And next I'll talk about its applications in mixed re realities. First of all, I have a very brief introduction about what is mixed reality. You may have heard the, con uh, the concepts of virtual reality and augmented reality where the virtual reality is where you see only the digital environment, while the augmented reality, typically on a smartphone, is where you see the world while you also have some augmented uh, contents. Or for the mixed reality is, you can consider as an extension of the augmented reality, where you first, you see the real world and is typically defined as optical see-through instead of the video see-through. And also we emphasize on the interaction between the understanding of the scene and the interaction uh, between the virtual objects and the real objects. So for example, when you have an uh, MR glass, this is the case. So for the VINCE applications in this domain, the first of all, the most important or basic thing is the tracking, where you consider the six stop tracking problem of your uh, MR glass, because if you want to render a, a virtual object and uh, let it appears uh, stable in the physical world, you would like to uh, track the sixth of motion in real time and with very low uh, latency of your uh, MR platform. So this is, for example, a very typical uh, VI SLAM framework as I have talked before. Uh, besides the tracking thread and the mapping thread, as I mentioned before, you typically also have IMU thread because IMU typically has very high frequencies and you use the IMU integration to get high frequency pulses to reduce the uh, latency and get your um, corresponding current pulses to, for rendering purposes. And then um, after the, the, the uh, during this tracking problem, uh, there are lots of interesting problems when applied to the MR uh, domain. Uh, uh, one of them is the feature choice. Uh, as we have known that there are classic features that uh, uh, performs pretty well in most cases, uh, such as the key point detection, including fast DOG and Harris, and well, the descriptor extraction, including SIFT, SURF, ORB, etc. cetera. Uh, while uh, the new emerging learning-based uh, features, such as a super point uh, and lift, for example, uh, they are all promising features that have shows more robustness and matching abilities uh, uh, when you have large viewing angle differences and the scene changes. However, these methods remains to be computationally very heavy and this is still a challenge when uh, people want to apply this into real time and low power cost uh, MR uh, systems. So this is one interesting and open direction for applying things in the MR domain. Uh, the other one is that um, the use of cameras, as you have seen that, for example, the famous uh, Facebook Oculus Quest has four environment sensing cameras and the HoloLens also have four cameras. While for example, our Unreal Light Glass only have two environment sensing cameras. So the choice of number of cameras uh, have um, a debate, I will say. So first of all, when you have more cameras, it is typically you can consider you have more robustness 
uh, if you, for example, have lots of moving scenes or low textures in front of you. And also when you have multiple cameras, it can, include, it can increase the scale observability to have more uh, accurate tracking results. However, when you have more cameras, you have definitely more power consumptions. So when to use which camera, if you want to use one camera or two camera or four cameras at the same time is still an open problem in the MR domain. Uh, the other interesting problem is the visual inertial mode selection for MR uh, devices. Um, we know that typically VINX performs pretty well on these uh, platforms. However, when you, for example, are in a moving vehicle, which have Excel for rotations and accelerations, the IMU will not work. So in this case, you probably would want a vision only system uh, in this case. So uh, how to detect and switch to the vision only system is a problem. Uh, the other one is that when you have IMU only system, for example, if you have a device that do not have cameras, or for example, if you want to save powers to uh, operating a low power mode, you may want to turn off the camera for a period of time and then use only IMU for a short period of time. But However, we know that traditional integration of the IMU only uh, suffers from um, position drifts uh, so that it cannot really give the correct six off post results for a long period of time. Uh, recently, there have been some promising uh, works that use deep learning uh, to perform six off uh, IMU post estimation. Um, this, I believe, is a still ongoing research direction, but this is a very um, interesting application for the uh, MR domain. Mm, the other one that consists the uh, considers uh, concerns the tracking uh, problem is the robustness of the um, MR device uh, MR tracking results. Uh, for example, you may have moving parts. You may have very crowded scene. You may have um, um, when you have motionless um, special motion such as you are hovering. Uh, the scale may be a problem. And when you have marked fast motions, your images may be blurred. And when you are into the low texture uh, environments and the insufficient lightings, all these are still real world challenges when you apply the VINs in onto um, uh, MR devices. And when this happens, you should be able to perform a failure detection to know that when your system is not performing well. And also uh, to um, one possible direction to solve this problem, but with certain costs, is to fuel the fusion with other sensors. For example, when you, when you have a GPU or UWB or magnetometer or Wi-Fi or TOF, all kinds of different sensors to occasionally compensate for the inability of uh, VI slab. Um, uh, besides the tracking itself, one question that we often ask ourselves is how to measure the accuracy of the MR tracking. So typical SLAM uh, measuring metrics in, um, include using a benchmark data set where you have lots of different scene changes and motion changes. And then you measure, for example, the position orientation uh, errors, uh, for example, the absolute trajectory error or basically the root mean square error of these quantities over a period of time. This is the uh, standard matrix for MR. Also, you can include scale into this problem since for VINs, uh, it is typically, uh, the scale can be problematic in certain cases. Uh, however, for MRs, we believe there should be more metrics that uh, what, what we uh, corresponding to the problems that we really see or really bothers us. Here is some example that we, um, propose uh, some sample metrics. Uh, for example, you may have the phenomenon of jitter. You may have drift, wonder, jumpiness, and the repeatability of your MR tracking results. And this applies to different, uh, for example, motion uh, uh, profiles. When you have general motions or different special motions, including repetitive motion or the stationary motions, you may have different ways of measuring the uh, what's really annoying you when you look at look through the MR uh, glasses. So for example, we define jitter as a high frequency and a small magnitude vibration in tracking errors within a certain period of time where you can see that the error has certain high frequency and uh, um, changes. This typically uh, appears in the frequency domain as a peak or certain peaks uh, in the magnitude response. 
the other uh, definition that we have is the drift, where you when when you see the during a period of time, the estimated trajectory continues to deviate from the true trajectory and the error becomes larger and larger. The third one is the wonder. When you are in the stationary period, the estimated trajectory continues to randomly work around a fixed point. And you also may have jumpiness, uh, which corresponds to a large jump in the trajectory error at a certain point in time. And you may also have the repeatability issue where you have the MR glass and you return to, a, to back to a fixed point you may see the content is no longer there or it's shifted. So it is useful to measure the repeatability under special motion, such as when you return back to a point or when you go through a repetitive, a repetitive motion. Um, so here are uh, some uh, example results that uh, after we define and compute these quantities, we compare our glass performance with the uh, HoloLens 2 where we see, for example, for the jitter, we typically have smaller jitter than the whole lens two, while for the returning back tests, we typically uh, slightly worse performance. And then for the, the standard ATE position and orientation, we see that position may be, for example, on this data set may be a little bit worse, while for the orientation uh, may be a little bit more accurate. All these are still developing and we are still looking to more uh, metrics to measure the accuracy of the MR tracking systems. Uh, the other application that when you use VINs on the MR is the calibration. Since we need to calibrate between the sensors, both spatial and the temporal calibrations, this typically can be classified into the offline and an online mapping process. While in the offline, you simply calibrate uh, the extrinsics between, for example, different sensors. There has been lots of famous works and um, one challenge that I would like to mention is that we observe when you have low cost devices and sensors, uh, the calibration results may be very sensitive to the different trajectories. So how to come up with short and accurate trajectories for mass production uh, remains to be a challenge. And also for the online calibration, um, there has been the great work uh, to determine what periods to select for calibration. However, for each selected periods, it may still uh, be necessary to select what parameters to calibrate uh, within this period of time. Um, finally, to evaluate the MR, uh, the MR performance, I mean to combine the tracking and the display all together, it can be still can be cast into a, a visual, uh, uh, visual tracking problem where you use cameras to uh, substitute human eyes and capture images of virtual contents to measure the accuracy uh, between your motion and the displayed virtual contents. The next uh, big application of uh, uh, inertial and visual sensing is the environment sensing ability, where you have, for example, you may have the online mapping for a small scale place, uh, which enables uh, relock and the loop closure for more accurate tracking and also enables persistent MR session and multi-user MR uh, scenarios. Uh, you may also have plane detection and the tracking that use either uh, geometric classic uh, based uh, classic methods or deep learning based methods uh, for accurate uh, uh, and fast uh, uh, plane detections with boundaries. And also you may have seen understandings and human pose estimation. The other one is object tracking for either for 2D images and 3D uh, modelings, uh, how to generate efficient and accurate models and the tracking very fast, uh, we believe it still remains to be a problem on low cost mobile uh, devices. And also to, uh, to enable occlusion, it is useful to estimate the depths of the scene uh, based either on depth sensor or the uh, camera setup. Uh, or using deep learning based methods to get relative dense depths plus the absolute depths from uh, sparse points of a VI slam to enable uh, uh, occlusion of the virtual objects. Then the next thing I would like to mention is the user interaction uh, using IMU and the cameras. Uh, for example, it is very convenient to have con controllers in uh, MR uh, setups because uh, you need to have user inputs. Um, for example, when you have IMU-based systems, you can do either 3 dof or sometimes uh, 6 dof controllings uh, using the IMU, and also you may have the visual, the visual based, uh, um, uh, the vision based, the vision based, the vision based uh, controller such as the Oculus Quest. Uh, 
Um, while for the MR uh, platforms, it is also convenient to have hand gestures, for example, to enable all these kinds of uh, user inputs. Uh, this uh, uh, requires the ability of uh, reading and tracking uh, hands, uh, either from a depth sensor or your cameras. Uh, this camera can either be a high camera or RGB camera, grid camera, either it can be single camera or multiple cameras. Uh, these are all um, started problems in the domain of MR, but I believe there are still rooms to improve a lot. Um, the last thing I would like to talk very briefly is the concept of metaverse, which is getting more and more popular recently. The metaverse uh, refers to a collective virtual shared space created by virtually enhanced physical reality. Uh, and it's, it has to be a physically persistent a virtual space where um, everybody can go into and uh, uh, share different uh, cool things. Uh, the key technology between this um, uh, concept is the ability of large scale mapping and localization, which also has been covered by some pre uh, excellent previous works uh, in, some, uh, in the earlier talks. So I'll just mention very briefly about the uh, large scale mapping and the localization. So first of all, in order to perform the uh, mapping process, you need to have data acquisition. Uh, you can either use the uh, camera platform, the IMU, and uh, other, uh, other sensors such as the LiDAR and the GPS. Uh, all these have different advantages and different advantages. When you have more and more uh, sensors, you need to consider the problem of very efficient uh, and uh, um, either computationally efficient and memory efficient solutions to these mapping processes. So there have been some ex, uh, great um, open source mapping uh, works out there. Uh, for example, the MapLab, map lab, CoMap, et cetera. Uh, all these are the great mapping works. However, when applied to the uh, long-term mapping uh, problems, there still have been a lot of challenges. For example, how to handle very large scales, either city scale or the planet scale how to do them highly uh, efficiently and accurately, uh, how, to map, uh, how to change and update your map to cover uh, different times, seasons, and the thing changes, um, <clears throat> how to perform the update either offline or online. Uh, we believe all this still remains to be challenging problems. And also when you have uh, lots of uh, map representations, for example, uh, 3D points, how do you efficiently store them and perform sparsification to have a very efficient representation with as few points as possible to enable either a low uh, storage and also a faster localization process later on. Um, another challenge is the dense representation. When you have a very, um, when you have the very um, dense maps, um, how do you um, represent them into a computationally and a storage efficient representation to enable, for example, some MR applications as occlusion detection, uh, occlusion and collision detection? And how do you maintain uh, high accuracy such, such as submillimeter details while keeping all this being efficient? We believe all these are still challenges in the uh, metaverse domain. Um, Finally, for the localization part, uh, the only thing I would like to mention is that it still has a lot of challenges, such as uh, when you have large viewing angles of your core image and between the core image and the map images, how do you handle large scene appearance changes? And how do you switch between indoor and outdoors, which may, may look very different? Um, while some deep learning based methods have uh, been very promising, uh, these are also still open problems in this domain. So with, like, with this, I would like to conclude my talk and thank you everybody for your attention. And that's it. Great, thank you, Kujie. Uh, we still have a few minutes for, for short questions. Let's see if we got any. Chat, not. And then, Patrick, do you see anyone in a question from YouTube? Uh, no, not from YouTube. There is one in the chat right now. Oh, yes, from David. Um, could you, you can also read uh, yourself, basically, 
Could you please also brief about some solutions to address the unobservability issue on the degenerate motions? Have some batch optimization based method been used to mm -hmm. solve this issue? Two questions. Okay, so the observability that I have analyzed is not only, it's not just for either VIO or whatever setup, it is an underlying problem or in, intrinsic problem of the VI slam itself. Uh, no matter what you, estimators that you use, either you use a slide window VIO or batch least squares, it won't change the observability of the system. So for example, if you have constant uh, local acceleration motions, the scale will be observable no matter what estimators you do. Either you use uh, batch least squares or use a uh, VIO sliding window estimator. It won't make a difference. So to alleviate or to solve this problem, you have to include extra information. For example, when you are with ground vehicles, you can use, for example, odometry uh, measurements or use map information if you have uh, existing external map. And for other, for example, for the MR uh, glasses, typically uh, people typically solve it with two cameras, for example. All these are basically introducing extra information to solve for these problems. When your motion is not under control, basically you have very little, um, you may have very little information along these observable directions if the user's information, uh, user's motion is just uh, uh, follows one of these special motions. Okay. Uh, uh, Patrick, do you have a question? Speak out. I can just say it. Uh, could you uh, like briefly discuss if it's more useful to consider framing the mixed reality problem as map, ba map based relocalization versus just a general visual inertial odometry with loop closure? Is that a more useful perspective or? Like, uh, what's your opinion on, uh, you know, one versus the other, or, you know, how it's applied to this, so, this MR um, space? To you, uh, if you use only the, for example, a local slam, either VIO or um, VIO plus a small map, because you have very limited the processing power, uh, it only enables you to perform local uh, MR uh, contents. For example, you can only, basically you are localizing relatively to some um, your, for example, your initial starting pose so that you can only localize locally and you, you can only put, for example, virtual contents in this thing and the track from, from that point. While if you have a local map, it enables you to have global uh, poses and then to display global content such as what is required in the metaverse. So definitely having a um, global map enables more capabilities of the uh, of the MR. However, uh, this requires you to, first of all, having the map, um, and these maps are typically super large, so it typically runs uh, on the cloud. It's not on your local devices. So, uh, for example, if you're in an environment without uh, a net, a network access, or you are in a new environment without any previous map, you won't be able to do these things. But eventually, if you want to do the metaverse stuff where you have you go out to the real world and have all the cool virtual contacts fixed to the real world, you need to have the map, yeah. Okay, great. I think also um, time to, we want to stick to the time. Uh, thanks, Kudya, it's a great talk. Yeah. I think Thank you. It, it, it really neat. Okay, let's move on to the next talk, which is uh, Maurice Bell from Oxford. Uh, oh, Maurice, you're here. Good. Uh, all right. Morris, can you share your screen? Yeah, okay. Oh. okay great. Morris uh, is a, a yeah, uh, good friend. And he's a, a, a faculty member at Oxford working on, on robotics, of course. And he will be talking about the much sense tracking. All right, Morris, it's yours. Okay, I'll uh, get started. Um, thank you very much, Paul and, uh, and Patrick for inviting me. I think we, a lot of people talk about long-term SLAM and long-term mapping. This is a long-term VINs workshop. So uh, um, uh, you know, you'll have a lot of pace to keep up to, to get through the next couple of hours. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about something that's in a slightly different topic space, um, but using the same uh, uh, technology as some of the talks that came before us. So I'm gonna talk about multi-sensor uh, 
odometry, multi-sensor tightly fused odometry, and, and a lot of it uh, I'm going to motivate in the DARPA subterranean challenge uh, in difficult, poorly lit environments that you see in the image in the top. Um, and uh, just a little bit about my background. So I did a lot of uh, work in John Leonard's group, um, working with Michael Case, who I think is on the call, and uh, Hordery Hansen. We, we developed um, large scale mapping technologies such as Holder's PhD work on the left hand side, uh, mapping seven floors of a building in, in MIT or nine floors is written there. And also uh, body mounted mapping where we're using um, laser sensors, as you can see in John Brookshire's uh, chest here, and to, uh, to build large scale maps uh, of multiple floors of, of buildings. So I went kind of from this kind of dynamic um, uh, uh, map what with whatever sensing that you receive kind of environment uh, and I, and that kind of motivated me to get involved in something that came out of left field which was the DARPA subterranean or DARPA or urban challenge or DARPA I'm getting my challenges made up DARPA robotics challenge which was a three-year multi-phase competition in which uh, we were given an atlas robot by Boston Dynamics and had to work to um, use it to uh, do a variety of tools so our variety of tasks so picking up tools drilling in walls crossing uneven terrain, climbing staircases. And my role in the competition was primarily state estimation. So I developed a legged robot state estimator that we ran in the robot uh, to give us an accurate motion estimate and then to use that to build up a 3D representation of the, of the rope around the robot. And also obviously used in the closed loop control of the robot. Um, this is one of the, the kind of more interesting things that came out of, uh, out of that on the research site, not fielded in the competition, but um, it shows continuous, which is a, a dense, uh, 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 volumetric reconstruction method that runs on a GPU that was developed by uh, Tom Whelan um, uh, to do dense reconstruction. Um, and uh, here we're using it and repurposing it to generate an elevation map for the Atlas robot. And then we're using it to plan footsteps. That was an interesting piece of work that tied together kind of state-of-the-art real-time sensing with, um, with state-of-the-art real-time uh, optimal motion planning. So when I started my faculty group or my um, my academic group in in Oxford, um, we sort of I focused on quadrupeds. It's, uh, four legs are better than two is an, an adage from uh, from Animal Farm. And uh, in this group, we work on a broader range of tasks from quadruped motion planning and control through to all of the tasks to do with perception that that involve robots and also sort of dynamic sensing in general. So where sensors are moving aggressively, and I share that group with Dr. Yanis Avutis. Um, I'll just briefly mention some of the the topics of uh, that are, are some of the topics of research that we do with quadrupeds. So here you can see um, a controller built by Sidahand Gangaparwala, uh, which is using reinforcement learning, which is trained in simulation on a variety of simulated elevation maps. And what the robot is doing here is using uh, its learned representation to choose body footstep placements, foot trajectories, and body postures, which then interact with a a whole body controller developed by Anibotics, the developer of the robot here, to, to do locomotion. So you, hear, you can see how the robot's body is, is um, adapting to the terrain. And that terrain representation is coming from elevation maps that are, that are being constructed using the downward facing depth cameras, the real sense cameras that are, that are under the robot. On the right hand side is something that's a little bit um, more sort of raw. It's, it's showing dynamic trajectory optimization. So this is planning multiple steps ahead using a series of knot points to capture constraints like foot motions and body motions, and then um, solving an optimization problem for the trajectory of the robot. Um, we also include perceptive constraints. So keep your, tor your body close to, the, close to um, for example, 25 centimeters above, or well, maybe it's, it's hard, closer to 50, uh, 50 centimeters above the, the underlying uh, uh, profile of the terrain. Um, but in both cases, an, an element of, of uh, or in both cases, accurate reconstructions of what's underneath the robot are necessary um, and um, to be able to achieve the, these kind of locomotion uh, performance. But which shifting and focusing specifically on the onboard sensors, as you can see marked out with these arrows, there are a variety of sensors that are inside these kind of state of the art quadruped robots. Um, so the Animal C, we have a copy of this in our, in our, in our lab. Uh, you can see uh, in orange in both cases uh, for the Boston Dynamics Spot and the Animal, uh, in orange is an IMU, usually a, a 
higher higher quality MIMS IMU. Um, um, red sensors are, are kinematic sensors, so joint uh, either force or uh, encoders, um, so position and uh, position and force sensing in the robot's legs. I'll talk a little bit about leg odometry in the second half of my talk. Uh, to begin with, I'll mostly talk about uh, external sensing. So we obviously have a, a lighter a velodyne in the uppercase and an, and an ouster in the, in, the, in the lower case, as well as a variety of cameras. So either depth cameras that are shown in green, uh, at, uh, spot comes with five, uh, the animal comes with four, although we've, we've, we've added this ground facing LIDAR. Um, so the, the robots, quadruped robots have a, have a, have a large array of sensors. Um, and uh, I'm gonna direct some of the demonstrations that we have towards DARPA Subterranean Challenge. We're involved in a team and the challenge involves uh, starting up outside of a, of a gate and marked with April tags. And then you have to go inside of the gate and explore the facility for one hour with as many robots as you want, with no GPS, and no Wi-Fi, unless you're able to uh, drop Wi-Fi beacons. And uh, the final phase of the competition is in September. And well, fingers crossed, or hopefully we'll be able to get to Louisville and Kentucky to, for the final phase of the competition. But it's driving forward state-of-the-art uh, autonomous exploration. And this is kind of what it looks like in, in, in the environment. So these are kind of the areas where we're looking to do uh, VINs and LiDAR fusion and also kinematic uh, odometry fusion. Um, so you can see that the robot starts at this entrance gate and it starts walking down the, the, the environment. It's using its own onboard lighting. So you have to deal with challenges like saturation and uh, simply visual features being very difficult to, to, to re-identify. Um, also on the ground, you can see mud, pools of water. So if you're trying to map terrain to give the idea, give the, the robot a, an indication of where to go, that's quite challenging. And you'll notice this, this particular tunnel is, is very, very long. So in, in, in this underground exploration challenge, many of the tunnels are very long so that longitudinal constraints are very difficult to extract from LiDAR. Um, we're involved in a team called Cerberus. It includes Costas Alexis, who's the, um, who's the lead of the team, uh, he, formerly in uh, University of Nevada, Reno, now in NTNU in Norway, um, Marco Hooter and Roland Ziegert's groups in, in ETH, as well as contributions from Berkeley, uh, flyability who make this uh, interesting protected drone, uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation. We're kind of a junior member of the team. And there's a variety of facets to the competition, but we'll focus pr today primarily on uh, localization and mapping. And I'll touch on a little bit of exploration. And the core stroke of what I'm going to talk about in the talk today is um, visual inertial legged laser navigation system. It's a bit of a mouthful, but uh, VLANs is a uh, a multi-purpose kind of Swiss army knife of, uh, of um, factor graph based estimation that fuses together uh, sensor measurements from all of these different sources. sources. Um, uh, primarily we'll talk about vision, LIDAR and legged odometry. Uh, won't talk about thermal. Uh, Costas' group actually did some interesting work on thermal odometry, but we de-emphasize that. And I'll focus primarily on presenting the the paper that's going to appear at ICRAN is nominated for the best student paper. Um, it's it's um, uh, led by David Wist, who's a, who's a PhD student. I'll start off with visual and LIDAR odometry um, because it's more general for the, this audience um, and broaden it a little bit with leg kinematics. The results will be demonstrated on, on legged robots such as the Animal C and also some on this handheld payload device that you see here. So it's a, a 64 beam ouster LIDAR with a uh, real sense D435i. Uh, the field of view are intentionally chosen to overlap so as to be able to transfer lighter depth to the camera um, and, and, and also to be able to do kind of joint fusion between the two sensors. So in effect, um, uh, we, uh, the, 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 um, the speakers today are gonna to talk about things like Vince Mono, Ocphase and so on. Um, um, and open 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 vins as well from from uh, from Patrick uh, and there these are very uh, interesting methods that are able to achieve very uh, accurate performance from using backends such as Windows smoothing and the MS EKF as well uh, but there there are some known failure modes so if you if you if you point the sensor at a blank wall then um, the algorithm is going to is going to very much struggle if that's for any extended period of time while on the lighter inertial side uh, algorithms such as Loam have this while achieving very good performance, um, are 
are only able to achieve uh, frame to frame tracking. Um, so they're only, only associating uh, minimal, minimal features that have been observed from one frame to the next and lack an ability to track over an extended period, periods of time. While fusion of all three sensor modalities is typically carried out in a, in a, in a loosely coupled manner, it would maybe, for example, a series of, of logical statements to say that if your vision is system is struggling, then rely only on your LiDAR system. If your LiDAR system is struggling, then fall back to vision, which is typically of higher drift rate. Um, and that hard switching between modalities is really a, uh, something that we've seen in a lot of the papers that have come out from the DARPA challenge, the DARPA subterranean challenge, which is something that we, we've built our system around truly avoiding. We want to track uh, low level landmarks from each sensor modality over multiple frames to jointly optimize them in a sparse and lightweight approach that allows us to naturally degrade between sensor modalities. So if we only have a small portion of the Im image that has visual features, then we can track those visual features, but we can rely on LiDAR constraints from the rest of the surround to fill in the information. Um, that's solved in a factor graph approach. We're working with, with purely with, with primitives that I mentioned previously. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we actually uh, manage complexity so as to be able to solve this in real time with GTSAM and the ISAM2 algorithm in the back end. Again, okay, welcome to experiments, obviously. Uh, as with all systems, we have a typical vector that's illustrated here, the rotation um, R, uh, the linear position P, the linear velocity V, um, um, uh, biases in the accelerometry and biases in the gyroscope for rotation rates. And uh, this is a kind of high level fusion, uh, illustration. So we, we, we obviously are, are carrying out pre-integration with the, uh, the Christian Forrester pre-integration module within, within GTSAM. We use that uh, combination with the individual constraints that are coming from the sensor modalities and solving with uh, winded optimization within GTSAM. And we have two outputs. One, one output frequency is at, at the, the frequency of optimization, which is typically, we typically use 15 Hertz from our camera system uh, or a free running propagation from the IMU. Um, and that's all solved within, it, within a multi-threaded algorithm that we call VLANs. Um, this is an illustration of the factor graph, um, again, uh, indicating that um, in green and in red are the constraints that are formed from primitives that are extracted from LiDAR. And you can see here the cost terms in the least squares optimization. So the, the usual customers for, for VINs are prior, the IMU and, 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 and residuals on the points, but, but to that we're adding uh, planes and, and, and lines from the LiDAR. So that, that, that's the, the main comparison to other methods is that instead of using um, instead of using costs such as uh, point to plane or point to line costs, we're directly solving for uh, the residuals of the error of projection of the lighter, or the lighter plane and the lighter line edges, as well as the tr tr traditional uh, reprojection error of the of the visual features uh, into the camera frame. Um, where possible, because we have chosen to overlap the LiDAR in this case, we can also take advantage of the fact that we have a very accurate source of depth. So this was something that was done in Vilong from Ji Zhang um, and Sanjeev Singh uh, about five years ago. Uh, here, we're also taking advantage of the fact that we have very good estimates of depth where there are LiDAR feature points, as you can see illustrated here. And, and where we don't, we will we'll rely back on the stereo depth that's that's estimated from the stereoscopic configuration that we use. Um, obviously these landmarks are, are extracted with uh, fast featured extractors and tracked with KLT. That's a kind of a typical VINs um, pipeline that, that, that you'll see in, in a number of the open source approaches. Going back over to the laser or to the laser, lone based methods, as I said before, extract from a point cloud, um, for example, a Velodyne scan. Uh, many, many small um, line edges and plane patches and then associate them over two frames uh, and then minimize the alignment between them. Instead, we're explicitly going to, to extract a line and a, a line segment and a plane patch uh, and carry that through from one time step to the next, search in the vicinity of, of that line segment and where we, where we can re-detect another line segment or plane patch, we're, we're forming a constraint between those, between those observations. And, and it's, it's that 
long-term feature uh, correspondence that allows us to be able to achieve some very good uh, tracking performance. Um, a second complexity is that, um, that these sensors aren't synchronized. So obviously, um, LiDAR, and, LIDAR and camera cannot be synchronized. Uh, so LiDAR is a continuously scanning sensor that uh, repeatedly uh, spins 360 degrees and, and feeds off LiDAR range returns. Um, in sensor in drivers such as such as in ROS, you'll get a LiDAR scan with an annotated timestamp that will correspond to the start of the LiDAR scan. However, that's that's kind of an arbitrary timestamp uh, um, there because the the the, um, the sensor itself measures range and, and bearing, um, and if you if you want to have interpreted it as an XYZ coordinate, then it's really the XYZ coordinate to the point at which the sensor had captured the return, not to the not to the point at which at the start of at, the, at which the starting timestamp was was allocated. So one of the things that you have to do is to is to account for that 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 uh, what we call motion distortion um, by being able to inc by being able to feed in an, uh, an initial guess of the of the motion of the sensor and then to correct for the self motion of the of the, the lighter sensor over the course of the scan. And the other issue, however, is because um, the sensors aren't aren't the lighter is, is and cannot be gl uh, globally synchronized. Well. Uh, we have a problem in which um, we don't have a synchronization of the constraints that are occurring from the sensor. So if, for example, we might have an in normal VINs approach, we would have uh, the nodes which correspond to the poses of the sensor at particular uh, uh, places in time. We can observe visual features and, and create constraints in the usual manner. The problem comes when we start incorporating these late LIDAR constraints. If we have an arbitrary timestamp that falls between X0 and X1, uh, this is the position where the lidar was at that at the, at at some intermediate time where the plane was detected. Then, to be able to incorporate it within the factor graph, we'd need to break apart the IMU constraint, and now we've got an extra node in the pose graph or the factor graph. Um, here again, you can see it being repeated as as sub, as subsequent lidar constraint is added to another timestamp, and so on. So now, we've, as you can see in this illustrative example, you might double the number of uh, pose nodes that would be in the factor graph, which greatly increases the amount of computation time. Instead, our approach is to take advantage of an observation that the LiDAR accumulates from L0, L2 to L3, that's the accumulation time of the LiDAR scan. If we instead motion, motion uh, correct the point cloud, so we uh, use the IMU pre-integration uh, module in, in GTSAM to uh, get an initial estimate of the trajectory of the of the sen sensor over the course of the lidar scan. We can then project the point, reproject the point clouds into an accurate three D representation, and then project them to be relative to um, a particular timestamp corresponding to one of the images. And in doing so, we have effectively created this virtual point cloud that was captured that we can we treat as though it was captured from the time instance of camera image. And in doing so, our factor graph can be much, much simpler. Now you can see our, the factor graph being created, where instead of there being these this set of additional nuisance nodes, we're, we're reusing the nodes in the factor graph, allowing us to solve this, um, this moving windowed optimization in a more, much more efficient manner. So we're, we're only adding uh, these extra individual constraints um, to the system. Um, otherwise, we have the same VIN's back end, um, and it gives us a lot of modularity that we can switch between configurations simply by dropping out the different modalities that we're interested in. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit of the results. So here's, again, going back to the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Uh, you can see uh, it's it, there's a lot of challenges. So you can see the robots walking in wood. There's some, some rubble on the ground. That, um, this bright light here is one of the other robots that was providing a communications link. And uh, you can see a puddle, and, and large parts of the, of the facility are actually entirely unlit, so the sensors on board were the only ones. Slightly less challenging is the uh, Bucolic um, New Cap College in Oxford, where um, there are these kind of traditional uh, uh, university quadrangles um, and some parkland area and open foliage. Um, so these are our two main test data sets. The New College data set. Um, Patrick mentioned it in his talk, but um, just to give you a little bit of background why this is an interesting data set, obviously we have the ouster sensor and the wheel sense 
um, uh, being collected in one unit that's that that um, is um, that is jointly timestamped. But we also put a lot of effort into building a large scale three D model of the environment using this uh, Leica 3D scanner, uh, this tripod based scanner. So it took about 10 hours to build it. This is about 400 meters by 400 meters, but it allows us to be able to infer ground truth of the motion of the sensor by effectively using the LiDAR point clouds to do ICP. And, and that, that's actually been the basis of a lot of our development. And as you can see, it's been actually used in, in these papers that are appearing in ICRA or have been recently submitted on archive. Um, and then just to show you the results from those two um, those two scenarios on the bottom left is on the on the left this is the DARPA subterranean challenge it was the uh, urban challenge uh, or, or the urban circuit in March 20 or February 2020 and you can see on the bottom left you can see visual features that are being tracked over an extended period of time their depth is by and large coming from the from the lidar or from the lidar uh, overlapping lidar. Uh, you can see green patches a little bit earlier. I think you can see many of them, which correspond to locally planar constraints that we can use to uh, in, to um, to form additional constraints and red edges, which con correspond to, for example, the poles and the the, the built structure in the scene. Um, and on the right hand side here, you can see the new college uh, environment. So in particular, it's quite clear that the yellow features correspond to the depth of the yellow features correspond to uh, the LIDAR, which gives us very accurate uh, uh, VINs plus light or VINs plus aided LIDAR uh, in built environment. And then you can also see the, 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 the patches uh, on the ground and on the plane, on the walls. As we move out into the natural environment in the, in the back of the college, and there's, there's a lot of trees. So you can see there are less of these red edges and we're relying mostly on the visual features to, to give us and um, give us the, the motion estimate. So uh, based on our analysis against uh, a loam variant that we use within the Cerberus team, uh, we're outperforming that in both translation and rotation. Um, and, uh, but, but our system at the moment is, is a purely odometry driven system and doesn't have a slam back end, which, would, which precludes us from, from doing like a sort of slam evaluation to some of the other methods. Um, to illustrate some of the sensor switching that we can do within our system. So this is a very, very bright day in Oxford and um, very harsh shadows that existed between, um, between the outdoor space and then the shaded space. And you can see in this part, portion of the data set, we approach a, a, a tree, it blocks a significant portion of the image. And as we pass past the tree, then the sensor just moves into a dark area where um, Due to automatic gain control, the front portion of the image here is entirely exposed. Only the right portion here, which is on grassland, on, on, a, on a piece of grass, is able to extract visual features. Um, and what you see is a sort of catastrophic fall in the number of visual features and the number of line features, however, the sort of greater and uh, broader environment in, the, in this space, um, walls or the ground plane can be tracked. So we're able to sort of switch between modalities and the exposure kicks in, and at a point about now, then we're able to recover back to visual feature tracking. The key point being is there was no hard switch to enable that. There's simply, simply the optimization, optimize the features that were available to it. They might've been visual features initially uh, with some lighter features, and then we primarily were relying on the lighter features. And just to illustrate a little bit of the sort of dynamic robustness. So this is really aggressively shaking the devices as hard as we can. Um, it's about uh, 190 degrees per second. You can see um, the, uh, the combination of plain patches, red edge constraints, and, and the visual point features. Um, now, that's th the last few things I wanted to talk about on the, um, the VINs approach was we were, the sensor payload that we're working on on the, on the animal actually is, um, it's, uh, being developed as a, as a development kit by a company called Seven Sense. So they make available uh, um, a synchronized capture unit with um, as many as I think six or eight um, fisheye lenses. And we're, we're looking at adapting the, the VINs infrastructure or the, the VLANs infrastructure to be able to support both stereo and monoscop monoscopic uh, monocular uh, tracking um, and to be able to do things like um, tracking individual features in, in monocular and then switching them in to become visual or stereo features and vice versa. 
Um, and this gives us the re robustness to scenarios where, for example, the legged robot might walk directly up to a blank wall, but we might be able to switch the visual feature tracking to, to sideward facing cameras. This is a handheld payload that I'll just show uh, some initial results. So here you can see um, uh, this green trajectory is the ground truth. You can get an idea of this is forward facing camera, left facing camera and right facing camera. And as the features from the forward camera flow out of the, the field of view, they're picked up on the lateral facing cameras, which allows us to be able to track them over a long period of time. So this is the initial work from another PhD student called LinkedIn Zhang. And here, here are some very aggressive motions where the sensor is heavily shaken. And here is a, a, an example showing um, the device um, moving in a, in a very narrow staircase through one, to uh, one of the um, uh, one of the quad, uh, one of the staircases in, at, at New College in Oxford. Uh, nonetheless, we're able to track up and down the staircase uh, precisely by effectively switching between the sensors without really putting that much care into where the sensor was pointed to. Um, then uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we're incorporating kinematics, not so much. So um, on flat ground quadruped robots, you don't really need a good estimate of your of your position. Uh, you're able to get your orientation from your from your from your IMU, maybe just running an AHRS. Uh, when you're able to estimate velocity by uh, using the contributions from individual feet that are in contact with the ground. And if you're able to, to, to measure velocity, if you're not interested in, in where you are in the world, as you, although we are in the DARPA subterranean challenge, you can get by without ha having an external sensing. Um, when you start to go up, up uneven slopes, as, as on the right hand side of this video from ETH, downward facing camera, you're mapping the world then what you see here, which is which is really quite impressive and showing uh, complete reconstruction of the staircase, it's, it's quite difficult to achieve that based off of only proprioceptive sensors because when your robot starts moving dynamically, as you can see in this video, um, you really need to be able to do better than just leg sensing because every time the robot might chip the side of, this, of a block or um, it might, um, it, it, its feet mightn't be perfectly modeled, then you really need to be able to, to, to bring in other sensor modalities. On the right hand side, you can see something from the DARPA Robotics Challenge. This is actually uh, about five centimeter thick mud on the ground. And the robot, is, whenever it walks on that ground, uh, it's kinematic sensing, it's joint sensing in its feet, kind of make contact with the surface. And I'll just show you this, and it sinks in such that the elevation map that you see on the right hand side is becomes a mess because, um, Compared to the ideal scenario where a foot comes into contact, we declare contact has occurred. And we're able to use the inferred velocity of the robot's torso to uh, update a motion estimate. In a realistic scenario, the foot is instead sunk in an in, and maybe if there's a uh, rigid body bending in the robot's torso, then uh, we get incorrect estimates of the robot's velocity and position, which uh, make it very difficult to do this kind of mapping that you saw. And that, that was exactly what was going on here on the right-hand side. The, the terrain map that's being built here, it's the robot. This is a sort of like forest of spikes is coming from the fact that every time we step in the mud, the motion estimate is struggling. Okay, um, so what we had done in, in about 2020 was to incorporate, was to look at, um, at some of the inherent behavior that we see. So if you walk on, for example, hard ground that you see on the, uh, on, the, on, on the side here, your contact classification is largely based off of a threshold. So you see the buildup of force when a foot comes into contact and then you declare a threshold and after that you, you hold the foot to be stationary. Um, and and th that's not very um, reliable if you change the, the ground properties. However, we did see a kind of behavior in which there was a characteristic drift that was observable when there was continuous motion. So if the material that you're walking on had a certain material properties, then the, uh, the, the drift of the kinematic estimation would be in a repeatable manner. So we, we incorporated the kinematics estimation within a factor graph approach in our in a publication in ICRA last year, but we also included a, a bias term, uh, this term here, which uh, allowed us to, to basically uh, put into the, the um, into uh, the optimization problem, the opportunity for the estimator to estimate the kinematics are, are, are biasing in a certain direction. So we have an overconstrained problem in which, which we have our vision in our IMU and we're trying to infer what the 
uh, origin of the of the of the non-Gaussian behavior is, and we're putting it down to the kinematics. And in doing so, we're able to infer linear velocity bias from the kinematics, and that behave that property is effectively um, pseudo continuous over time or pseudo stationary over time for the same material properties. We found that 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 bias estimate factor kind of varies incrementally or very slowly. Um, I won't go into the maths from, 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 the, from the slide from last year. Um, what we've done with uh, legged like robot estimation in the last 12 months is previously we're using an external estimator from Michael Blush, uh, same researcher who worked on, on uh, Rovio, uh, which, which is the default estimator within Animal. Um, it was running externally and then feeding into VLANs. Now we've moved that estimator moved our own version of that estimator within the robot or within VLANs such that we now have this kind of combined multi-factor estimation problem. So you can see we have the factors that I talked about previously, visual um, uh, lighter planes, lighter edges, but we also and we have our IMU constraints. We have um, perhaps ICP odometry is another module we can support as well as um, the leg odometry which now forms uh, which now forms relative position constraints between the um between the uh between the nodes and the in the pose nodes of the factor graph and then what's really important when you go back to the legged system is that um uh, you're able to do accurate terrain reconstruction over short periods of time to keep the local situational awareness of the robot up to scratch so that you're able to do things like footstep planning that you can see in the in these these videos and it's aided in large part by this um this um uh, multi-sensor fusion so it um the the uh, the boston dynamic spot for example is and does this uh, primarily based off of of a vision but we're, we've developed a system that can be, can use both vision and lidar interchangeably as well as the extra stability you get from from leg kinematic sensing and um, for the interest of time i think i'll skip forward from skip over this slide uh, Looking towards the future and some of the things that we'd like to do in 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 multi sensor bins or multi sensor uh, inertial navigation sensing, is we'd we'd like to take more make more use of the IMU. Um, you might be familiar with these works from from Nikki Dragoni's group in Oxford uh, in using IMU only do IMU only odometry. And there was a it was an inter, a very well presented work from. Uh, from a combination of U research from UPenn and also Facebook, in which they uh, were able to use batches of IMU measurements to infer relative displacement and use that to stabilize an EKF. So there's no vision sensing in this at all. Uh, and I was kind of, I, I kind of struck when I was reading reading uh, this paper that just recently came out from Sebastian Shearer's group in um, CMU. This is the DARPA subterranean team. Um, where they're, they're interested in fusing together both vision inertia and light odometry, kind of like what I talked about here, with a focus on constraining the IMU bias. So uh, in conversation with, with Frank Dellert, um, Frank has said, you know, this, the IMU is this wonderful sensor. It would be able to estimate, all by itself would be able to estimate the, the motion of the robot if you could only estimate their biases. So I think that more could be done in, in the VINS community of looking at the behavior of biases and how they evolve over time and um, effectively seeing vision and lighter as kind of uh, sensors that aid our ability to estimate those biases rather than providing this overwhelming set of constraints. Um, um, so we've been looking into this from the legged robotic sense. Uh, we have this um, kind of filter-based uh, odometry estimator that something like what I just talked about on, uh, um, uh, on the animal and using only IMU and, and joint sensing, so an extra sensor from the, the, the TLIO and the IO network on the previous slides, using those again within the same training framework as, as TLIO to infer, uh, or to build up a, a batch of IMU measurements and then using that batch of IMU measurements with a trained neural network to infer relative displacement, which we can then use to form a constraint or within the, the, the filter, whether it's Pronto or VLANs as, as would be our future work. So we train uh, the network based off of batches of IMU measurements taken from uh, the legged robot, as you can see, walking on a variety of trains. So uneven terrain, uh, soft sponge, 
this is a slippery ground with um, where we've actually lubricated it with hand sanitizer. So you're very familiar with like what being able to uh, being able to reach out and grab a hand sanitizer these days, but we're able to put it to scientific use in this in this work. And what you can see here is that the baseline estimator pronto, we've been able to reduce its drift rate quite significantly, particularly in the upwards and downwards direction by incorporating these learned displacement constraints. And we're, we're, we're this kind of ongoing work. Now, I have only a few more minutes. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some other work that are, is in the general space of VIN, so SLAM and reconstruction. Uh, obviously with very accurate motion estimation then we were able to do uh, to, to build and feed that into PostGraph SLAM. So here's a lighter based SLAM system in 3D that we've developed and have tested heavily on this new college data set. So you can see these green flashes correspond to place recognitions. And then we're doing um, the, using the ISAM2 algorithm um, to optimize the PostGraph um, and to build this large scale map of a, of a couple of hundred, uh, of a couple of hundred meters by a couple of hundred meters. Um, very reminiscent to, to work that I that I carried out when I was working with uh, John back in MIT. Um, so with that large-scale SLAM system, we also then, in a collaboration with um, with Stefan Lutniger, Yidu Yang, who's the only member of our group who's made it to, to ICRA this year, he's, he's, he sent me this picture today, um, we can do large-scale dense reconstruction. So um, we're building upon a module called Super 8, which is a very efficient way of representing representing the environment. So um, instead of densely storing the occupancy of every node all the way down to the, the smallest leaves in an occupancy map, it maintains at the leaves um, a series of representations with different resolution. And that allows us to be able to overcome aliasing effects. So this was, um, Stefan uh, talked about it earlier, it was the scenario in which you approach something and then go far away. And then as you, as you back away, you actually destroy your reconstruction we're able to use that reconstruction to kind of get the best of both worlds. We're able to raycast to long ranges and sparsely reconstruct the environment, as you can see in this gray representation, I'll just back it up slightly. Um, but then closer to the sensor, we're able to have a re reconstruction that's of much finer detail, down as far as maybe five or six centimeters. And that would allow us to be able to do things like finally uh, find, do fine um, path um, motion planning around local obstacles. So you can see here that there's this combination of uh, very fine reconstruction lo lo locally and then sparser and further away, we have a, a coarser representation. So you do work with um, Stefan's team to incorporate sub, uh, Super 8, this is the lighter based Super 8 within a Atlas graph framework. So this is a Atlas graph SLAM system. So similar to what Mike Bosse uh, implemented with, uh, with both Paul Newman and, and John Leonard uh, several years ago. Um, you can see here the poses which correspond to um, the nodes that are used to create local submaps. So there's a submap roughly every 10 meters. And then what we've done is to explore how can we avoid the uh, computation time that's used up, uh, um, or sorry, the, the memory consumption uh, scaling instead with volume as opposed to uh, with um, amount of time explored. So as we come back to the same same place, we carry out loop closures using our post graph SAM system, and then instead of creating a new submap, we instead um, we instead uh, reuse the submap and and then update the submap with new observations. Uh, I'll skip over some work that we did to demonstrate this in multiple floors with Spot. And um, it's in the review at the moment. I'll just briefly mention the last topic before I, I finish up is a little bit of work on visual teach and repeat. So um, uh, with a lot of the applications that we'd like to be able to demonstrate, um, this, one's, this video is nowhere near where I want to demonstrate, uh, we're operating in sort of industrial environments doing inspection where you might be moving narrow spaces between plant equipment uh, and you'd like to be able to use all of the sensors on, on board the robot to do visual visual place recognition. Uh, it's typically framed as a single camera providing a route that then the robot's able to follow. We've got multiple cameras, so forward and backward facing cameras in this particular work. We'd like to be able to build models of the environment around the robot, uh, whether it tracked well using the forward facing camera or the backward facing camera, depending on the, the visual features that were present and then to be able to actively switch between them. And I'll just show a little bit of this uh, result showing 
uh, our visual teach and repeat system using uh, real sense cameras, uh, tracking with uh, forward or backward facing cameras and being able to overcome occlusion. So Millet, uh, postdoc in our lab, is occluding the sensors as the robot's moving around, but we're able to use uh, other facing cameras to, to, to simultaneously or to switch between modalities to still be able to track trajectories despite the fact that uh, the cameras are occluded. Okay, I'll finish at that point. Pretty much used up my slot. And I uh, just wanted to thank in particular the Cerberus DARPA Challenge team who've been, you know, through uh, COVID, we haven't been able to meet up for any of our trials. This is, uh, this is the, the Oxford team, but uh, in particular, the ETH team have been uh, heavily supporting us um, in uh, getting data sets. And also Frank Dellert has been pretty helpful in, uh, in fielding our questions about errors and constraints or reformulating constraints in GTSAM. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Paul, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 great, great. Uh, thanks, uh, Maurice. I think you, you got a few questions from the chat and uh, you you can read yourself. One from Usik. Um, as you do, you can see the, the, uh, the cam LIDAR time offset when you transform the LIDAR point cloud to camera time. And um, yeah, so uh, we've been using commodity sensors. So, I mean, the data set with the handheld device that we've been using is um, RealSense and Ouster. So we've PTP synchronization with the LiDAR and the RealSense. The RealSense drivers, we've set up to date with them. They're, they're pretty good quality, but what we've had to rely on, um, certainly in post-processing, and it's something in real time uh, that, that we need a little bit more reliability is in fact, there are two IMUs on the two devices and you're able to use the IMUs and cross correlation methods to be able to infer the, the time offset between the lighters. So we um, we do assume that the lighters are, are the two sensors are quite precisely synchronized and we've been able to use IMU passive synchronization to achieve that. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think we, we do have uh, one more minute. Just. Just move yeah. on to the, the other question. And uh, Wuske does has a, a, another question, but let's move on to the, the other one. And um, okay. from John Wang Li, basically he wants you, if you can provide more details on handling slam for leg robots with respect to that for typical use use case. Okay, so what are, the, what are the use cases of legged robots? Yeah. Well, um, um, yeah, actually, I cut off the SLAM map, but effectively, uh, the, the likes of antibiotics and Boston Dynamics, uh, more, uh, one of their common use cases are walk the robot around an industrial facility, uh, use, use LIDAR to build a precise map of, of, of an environment, and then create a either teach and repeat or a hand teleoperated or hand trained uh, missions to do inspections. So the SLAM map is kind of the first stage. It's not, it's not, it's not used every day, but it's used on the first day to uh, to create a map representation. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I focused on on Vin's techniques because I think the, the common postgraph SLAM approaches are pretty mature for for um, they can transfer between um, you know uh, terrestrial vehicles and and, and legged robots. What aspects of, uh, make solving slam on legged robots hard? Well, we have the computation that the manufacturer put in the robot, so we don't have we we can't run we can't run super glue or super super point if we've only got a a, a low cost tes, uh, um, um, into our Nvidia uh, GPU that's that that's has low power. So um, it really does put a focus on real time systems that are that are that aren't squeezing out the extra 1% of performance, but they're focusing more on the reliability. So that's, that's, that's certainly a focus there. And, it, and it, it's also a motivation for, for students to actually get things running real time. We do have I7s, we do have I7s on the robot. So, I mean, it's not, it's not like gum sticks or anything like this. Okay, yeah. Right. Uh, you do have a few more questions, but uh, Maurice, if you can respond in a chat, that would be great. Okay. okay. The time. Thanks, Maurice. That's great. Thanks for the involved. Involved. Cheers. Okay, uh, Luca. Our next speaker is uh, Luca Carlo. Hey, Luca. Um, Luca is, uh, um, is of course, everyone knows us, I assume, uh, a faculty member from MIT. 
is we're talking about the, the open problems and challenges about the visual inertial systems, I see. Look, it's all yours. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm assuming you see my slide, you can hear me. So yes. um, th thanks for having me. And uh, I, I was here for the 2019, I think, IDOS uh, workshop on V in the previous one. And to be honest, I always look forward to these and I look forward to great presentations. I was in and out, but I was able to attend some of the presentation in the morning. I was able to catch the last part of Maurice's presentation. Uh, it, it's very cool, in particular for students and so on. I think it's a great opportunity uh, to think about the state of the art in, uh, in visual navigation and SLAM in general. So today, I would like to, to talk about the work I've been doing on uh, thinking about how to go from visual navigation and SLAM to real-time scene understanding. And I want to tell you, of course, about the contribution my group has been uh, doing over the last uh, few years, but also like, you know, try to use that as an excuse to reason on open problems and opportunities for the, for the community. So um, let me start with uh, just one slide overview of my lab. I'm the director of the Spark Lab at MIT. SPARK stands for uh, um, Sensing, Perception, Autonomy, and Robot Kinetics. And uh, of course, we work in the broad area of robotics and autonomous systems, but in particular, we focus on, uh, on perception and computer vision for robotics. So what you see in this slide is a summary along the three columns in this slide. You can see a summary of the three key research lines we are working on, uh, robust and certifiable perception. In the past, you might know that we've been doing a lot of work on uh, visual inertial navigation as well as uh, right now we're doing more work on uh, LiDAR-based SLAM for the DARPA Subterranean Challenge. And in some of the other workshop presentation, I was chatting about uh, certifiable algorithms for uh, computer vision and object localization. Uh, today instead for, uh, for this presentation, I want to cover the second line of research we are, uh, we are uh, working on in the group, which is high level scene understanding. And what people like Andrew Davison um, essentially defined called uh, spatial AI. Okay, and I'm sure that uh, you've heard from Stefan this morning, like, you know, also more about this point. Um, there is also another research line which I'm particularly excited about. In case you're curious about it, it's more about co-design in designing different aspects of a robot, including uh, computation, mechanical aspects, uh, communication, and so on. Um, if you're curious about it, we have a pretty cool work on soft area manipulation. You can look at the papers that are all on archive or, or published, and, uh, and there is much more on that line. So the plan for today is to cover two big topics. I want to tell you about Chimera, which is the effort we are doing on moving from SLAM to metric semantic mapping. Uh, some of you may, might have seen like, you know, work in, uh, with Chimera. I'm going also to cover very recent uh, modules or very recent work, which is adding on top of Chimera. So expect something new when I talk about Chimera. And the second part of the talk is going to be about uh, this new representation, which is called 3D dynamic scene graphs which is transitioning, taking a step farther from uh, metric semantic mapping to high level understanding. And uh, kudos to all the students uh, working on, uh, on uh, really leading the way on, on these two projects, including Tony, Marcus, Arjun, you, Nathan, Jingnan, and Andrew. They've been doing the heavy lifting behind this work. So let me start with Chimera. Um, and let me start just by saying that uh, uh, already from the presentations today, you should know that uh, as, uh, as a SLAM sub-community, we should be very proud of the work done over the last uh, two decades, I would say at least. Um, and right now, like, you know, thanks to this progress we made as a community, we have um, libraries such as Orb Slam, of course, like you know, many more that I'm not mentioning, Vinsmon, OpenVins, and so on. We have libraries for, uh, for more like, you know, denser map reconstruction such as SDO and also work on uh, new sensors, such as even cameras and the work from, uh, from Davide Scaramuzza. And uh, this great implementation, this maturity of the field is also leading these algorithms to transition into products, including, uh, for example, the uh, Skydio drone that you see here on the left, which is using essentially visual inertial uh, navigation algorithms. Uh, we already heard in previous presentations about uh, virtual augmented reality. And all these techniques are also uh, contributing to novel startups, which are both about algorithms and hardware. At the same time, a lot of the motivation behind the work we do in my group is about uh, really realizing that there is a huge gap between uh, what robots are able to do and what humans are able to do. So with robots, thanks to the research over the last two decades, robot, uh, algorithms for robots are able to reconstruct um, sparse or dense representation of the environment, let's say point clouds, voxel-based representation, 
Um, they can reconstruct maybe the presence of objects and the geometry of objects in the environment, as well as other type of maps, including lines, meshes, and so on. At the same time, if you think about human perception, I can convince you with a single picture that human perception is much more than that. If you stare at this picture for a few seconds, uh, just for a single, from a single frame, you can uh, easily understand what is the geometry of the scene that I'm picturing here. There is a road, there are buildings, you can detect objects in the environment. You can reason over the semantics of the objects. For example, you can understand that the yellow car is a specific type of car, which is a taxi. And you can also reason on the relation between the objects. For example, one car is behind the other, or maybe some of the pedestrians is trying to cross the street. Right? So we can do all these inference just with a single image, and that is still out of reach. This kind of high level understanding is still out of reach for, uh, for robotics. Well, why do we care about high level understanding? Why do we want our robots to have high level understanding? Uh, well, the short answer is that uh, the first reason is that high level understanding is key to interaction. In the future, I don't want to tell my robot, go to position X, Y, and Z. I want to tell my robot, go and grab me a cup of coffee. And this kind of high level instructions really require understanding of uh, metric, the geometry of the environment, as well as the semantics. And this is not only important for robotics, but also for other applications such as virtual and augmented reality. One picture that I like, like you know, my mental picture is that I would like to have a Alexa for which in the future I can, can ask Alexa, Alexa, where did I leave my coffee mug? And this future Alexa is able to say, coffee mug is on the table near the window in the dining room. Right, so these answering these simple questions uh, require such an advanced understanding of the environment, special awareness of the environment, which of course the current Alexa is not able to provide. Current Alexa will probably say, I have no idea what you're talking about. So high level understanding is key to interaction, but it turns out that high level understanding is also key to robustness, to robust perception. As humans, I can show you the picture, of course you have no trouble seeing that there is a car, but at the same time, if I show you the full picture from which I cropped the shape of the car. You can take a look at it for a few seconds and then you can realize that actually in this picture, there is no car, there is just a van. And probably your mental model is something like this. You look at the image, you detected the ground floor, um, you detected an object, you know, a car, you detected a van and you realize that these two objects cannot occupy the same physical space. So one of the two should be printed, should be like you know, drawn on the other. So in other words, what I'm saying is that robust perception relies on uh, high level understanding, relies on simultaneously understanding geometry, semantics, physics, and relations in 3D. And if you think this is a corner case, actually it turns out that you know, these kind of examples are a failure mode for, uh, for uh, neural networks and for object detection. In other words, the state of the art in neural networks uh, is not really able to reason over relation among objects and it's, it's just like you know detecting objects as in this case is not really a person but it's like you know, just printed on the van and these failure modes show up pretty much everywhere the the um, deep learning algorithms are not able really to reason over geometry semantics and physics at the same time so what i want to do next is really to uh, discuss ongoing work we have been doing in order to push for robots to have high level understanding and the first work I'm going to discuss is Chimera, which is uh, a library for real-time metric semantics slam. So the input to Chimera is nothing else than uh, visual inertial data. There, is, uh, there are camera images as well as some inertial sensor, which is inside the real sense in this case. And uh, the output of Chimera is uh, a dense metric semantic mesh reconstruction. So in other words, we have a 3D mesh, which is describing the geometry of the environment. But the physics of this 3D mesh have colors which are actually not real color, they're, they're semantic labels. For example, the gray here is the ground, the dark green is, uh, you know, represent the walls, um, light green are the chairs, yellow are the cubicles. And this kind of map is essentially providing the, the robot for uh, um, both an understanding of the 3D geometry and the presence of objects in the environment. That's what we mean by uh, real-time metric semantic slam. And if you're interested in that, uh, we are still like, you know, um, evolving this library, we're still contributing to this library, but you can find the fast multi-threaded open source implementation of Chimera on, on GitHub. So what I want to do in the next few minutes is to tell you quickly about the key modules in Chimera, and then I will get also to some newer module that we have been developing over the last uh, few months. 
And the good news is that uh, with so many presentations about visual inertial navigation so far, you will be very familiar with a lot of keywords that I'm going to mention. So Chimera is taking data from a visual inertial sensor. It has three key blocks. One is uh, doing visual inertial odometry and mesh reconstruction. The other one is doing a robust post graph optimization. And the last one is Chimera semantics, which is building the metric semantic overall mesh. So let's start with Chimera via UM Mesher. Well, here we use, we have a fixed smoothing approach, fixed leg smoothing approach for a visual inertial odometry, which is based on GTSM and on this theory of unipro integration that we proposed with, uh, with uh, Frank, David, and, and Christian back in 2015. And uh, the idea is that you deploy a robot in a completely unknown environment. The robot is extracting features in the image. And then this optimization problem is solving for the 3D location of the features as well as uh, the trajectory of the robot that you see in this image. And thanks to this pre-integration approach, we can essentially get optimal solutions, but still get real-time performance, roughly like you know, 20 Hertz for, for the keyframes and uh, just like you know, very fast uh, pre-integration using the IMU. Um, this also is something that is implemented, that we implemented in GTSM a while ago, which is an outlier robust uh, vision front end uh, using structureless projection factors, which is something connected to the uh, new space trick that uh, people uh, like you know are using in uh, on the EKF side. So we all know from this workshop that uh, odometry can be very very good, can be very accurate, but eventually will drift over time. And uh, so, in order to get globally consistent trajectory estimates, it's important to extract loop closures. So here I'm showing in uh, in red the odometric trajectory that is going to drift over time. So what we do is to extract, using place recognition, we extract loop closures in order to correct the trajectory. The loop closure detection is something that is uh, well known at this point. Like, you know, we're using an approach which is pretty much the same as ORB SLAM, is bag of words with ORB descriptors. Uh, <clears throat> the thing that we are doing differently is that we are using a robust post-graph optimization framework, which is able to uh, reject bad loop closures. And this is currently based on the work from Mengelson, uh, ICRA 2018, on pairwise consistency maximization. Just to understand how important it is to reject outliers here, um, the, the plot on the left is the trajectory reconstruction that you get if you don't do outlier rejection. Um, you don't see the ground truth here, but it's clear that the trajectory is really messed, uh, is really like, you know, uh, um, noisy, and this is because we have outlier loop closures. On the right instead is what happens, the trajectory you get if you enable the outlier rejection. So here you can see that the trajectory is very smooth and there are just few selected loop closures which passed this pairwise consistency maximization. The pairwise consistency maximization roughly will uh, reason over the cycles in the graphs and will uh, make sure that the uh, loop closures that you add to the graph are consistent along cycles. So they make sense along the cycles in the graph. So the other step is uh, the other module. And again, like, you know, one uh, nice thing about Chimera is uh, it's modular nature. You can use one of the blocks, you can combine them together. You can replace one of the blocks with another implementation. The last block here is Chimera semantics, which is uh, given the trajectory estimate from Chimera via U is reconstructing this metric semantic mesh. Here to reconstruct the geometry of the environment, we just use uh, uh, volumetric voxel-based approach from box blocks. What we do on top of that is to include the semantic part. So the semantic is essentially taking a 2D pixel-wise segmentation as the one in this uh, image, and is back projecting this 2D segmentation using ray tracing in order to, to assign semantic labels to all the voxels along each ray. And uh, then there is also a Bayesian update of the labels at each, at each uh, voxel. So this is an approach which in spirit is very close to, uh, to semantic fusion uh, back uh, 2017. The thing that is new here is that we're doing this all running on CPU and uh, with a fast implementation, with a fast recasting implementation, which is able to run in real time at 10 Hertz on a standard CPU. So I want to um, just introduce a new module that uh, we developed over the last six months. And uh, I'm pretty excited about this work. I'm, I'm looking forward to like, you know, hearing thoughts and questions about this. So the new module that we developed is called Chimera PGMO, Post Graph and Mesh Deformation. The basic uh, issue that we addressed here is that Chimera VIO, of course, is a visual inertial odometry estimate will drift over time. 
And as I mentioned, the drift is typically fixed using loop closure and robust post-graph optimization. In other words, if you have the odometric trajectory, you can add the loop closure in blue. And the presence of the loop closure will kind of deform the trajectory to, to enforce the loop closure itself. Well, the issue that we have is that uh, the 3D metric semantic mesh is built from the VAU estimate. And the issue is that if the VAU estimate is drifting over time, also the 3D mesh will drift over time. So the question is, how do we make a 3D mesh which is globally consistent, right? Ideally, we would like not only to correct the trajectory of the robot, but we would like to, to correct also the trajectory. So we would also like to correct the mesh reconstruction if we have, please, if you have loop closures. And uh, PGMO is the solution to this problem. It's something that we presented for the first time uh, in the journal version of the Chimera paper, which uh, has been online since, uh, um, since a few months now. Um, and I will give you just uh, the uh, one slide overview. Um, so Chimera PGMO uh, does simultaneous post-graph and mesh optimization. And the input to the PGMO is the odometric mesh, the original mesh, the odometry of the robot, and the loop closure detection. So the relative poses corresponding to loop closures. And the output is a globally consistent 3D mesh. So the key insight here is that we can use ideas from uh, um, computer graphics, including the idea of deformation graph. And the idea is pretty simple, actually. So we have uh, the poses corresponding to the trajectory of the robot. We have the mesh. And we would like to deform both together at the same time. So the idea is to create a deformation graph. A deformation graph includes the poses of the robot and includes a subset of the vertices of the mesh. Let's say we downsample the mesh. And for each of these subset of vertices, we attach a local coordinate frame, which is this one that you see in violet. So all these triangles here, they are all poses, either robot poses or mesh poses describing local reference frames attached to the mesh. And then we also connect these poses, these variables with ages corresponding, corresponding to nearby vertices in the mesh or attaching the camera pose to the, to the mesh vertices. And the basic idea is that we have this collection of poses and we can just solve a, an optimization problem, which is deforming at the same time as a response to a loop closure, is deforming at the same time the trajectory of the robot and the mesh, the 3D mesh. So as a result of a loop closure now, not only we deform the trajectory, but we also correct the overall mesh. So something cool here, I believe, there are cool, two cool things that uh, <clears throat> I see in this slide. First of all, is that we are, we're essentially generalizing post-graph optimization to include both the trajectory of the robot and the mesh itself. And the second thing that is something that we show in the paper is that uh, mathematically, the graph deformation approach is equivalent to standard post-graph optimization. So this means that you do not have to develop like you know, new tools for optimization. You just take the state of the art in, uh, in uh, post-graph optimization, and now you can optimize meshes, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, so PGMO, like, you know, just to contextualize that in the architecture, is essentially something that generalizes the um, robust post-graph optimization. And in the current library, you can enable one or the other, depending on like, you know, how much uh, you care about the mesh. Um, Result-wise, I think the, the video, the animation on the left is telling pretty much the entire story. Uh, this is a robot starting over here. Of course, the top view of the map is moving around, is mapping all this environment, is coming back, and is having a loop closure over here. And what you see in this animation is that uh, after the loop closure is, is uh, enforced, all the mesh is corrected. So the mesh is jumping around to, to enforce the loop closure. And the results that you see on the right here are uh, describing the result of uh, the post-graph and mesh optimization. So this is the Euroc data set, 3D reconstruction, color-coded by the reconstruction error. Before the, demo, the, the uh, deformation with Chimera PGMO, there are a lot of dark areas with large errors. After the deformation with PGMO, the dark areas are, most of them are going away, meaning that we reduce the error. <clears throat> okay, so, um, the other thing that we've been spent, we spent a good amount of time doing over the last several months is doing performance evaluation. We really want to, to improve Chimera and to make it a state-of-the-art perception library. Uh, so we spent some time uh, doing uh, evaluation on uh, real data sets, UROC, uh, an apartment at, um, in Cambridge, school environment, MIT Aero Astro, as well as photorealistic simulation, including a really heterogeneous set of environments. Moreover, we also tested a number of different platforms. We tested components of Chimera or Chimera itself on a number of platforms. Uh, for example, we created a sensor rig 
within Terrial Sense cameras at MIT. Of course, we tested on the Europe drone. Uh, we are doing application on self-driving cars. I cannot say too much about these. In the context of the DARPA subterranean challenge, we are working on uh, uh, deploying specific modules in Chimera for localization and mapping. And we're also testing Chimera on uh, the Jackal robot with the Army Research Lab. So uh, you can find all the details in the paper. I want to show you just one slide, a couple of slides, I think, about performance. And uh, here, um, what I'm showing is the Europe performance comparing a number of state-of-the-art approaches. Paul, sorry for not mentioning open beans here. And uh, on the rows, you can see different data sets for Europe. And uh, uh, in this data set, I would say that uh, one is also like, you know, a great, great library. We're doing similarly, probably a little bit better, but I would say we are happy like, you know, for the VAO part to be like, you know, in the same ballpark of very good implementation such as uh, Beansmon and OpenBeans, that's what we are shooting for. And on the post graph optimization, post graph and mesh optimization, Again, again, what we are seeing here is the trajectory error. So the lower, the better. And you can see that in bold phase are the lowest numbers, meaning that uh, the post graph and mesh optimization induces also better trajectory estimates for the robot. So I think if you want some uh, takeaway points from the experiments, um, we have Chimera VAO, which is achieving a very good <clears throat> estimation drift. Typically, the VAO drift. Uh, for Chimera VAO is, uh, is around 0.2% of the trajectory traveled. We have approaches to reject uh, incorrect loop closures. And I said that you know, our current approach is based on uh, uh, pairwise consistency maximization, but currently we're working to replace that with uh, um, an approach that we presented at TICRA 2020, which is called graduated non-convexity, which seems to perform much better. And lastly, like, you know, we also have shown that PGMO improves the quality of the 3D uh, metric semantic reconstruction. So since we want to, to run these algorithms on our robots, it's of course important to look also at runtime. Uh, Chimera uh, is using a multi-threaded implementation in which the vision front end is on one thread, the VAO back end is on another thread, and then the post graph optimization is yet on another thread. And in the first order information uh, from this plot is that uh, um, most of the things are running in around 50 milliseconds, except things which are running on, uh, on a slow thread, including post graph and mesh optimization or loop closure detection, for which really we don't care about running in milliseconds since they are on a separate thread. Uh, so this is done on a, um, on a standard computer. We also tested on an NVIDIA TX2, and depending on different configuration, we can still get uh, very good performance for uh, in terms of runtime. Again, this runtime in milliseconds. So you can see that depending on the configuration, we are uh, we are like you know between 50 milliseconds and 100 milliseconds for the back end, front end, uh, and front end keyframes. Okay, so um, another thing that uh, is an extension of Chimera we actually have proposed and is going to be presented at Tigra 2021 is what we call Chimera Multi, which is uh, a multi robot version of Chimera and is the first distributed approach for a dense metric semantic multi-robot slam. So the basic idea here is that you have multiple robots. Um, the robots are uh, uh, using like, you know, local visual inertia sensors to build a metric semantic reconstruction of this environment. You can see kind of a top view of the environment. And when they meet, they kind of have a distributed protocol in which they exchange information and they reach agreement on a globally consistent uh, trajectory estimation for all the robots. And what you see here on the left is uh, um, the architecture for each robot. So each robot is running uh, Chimera VAU and Chimera Semantics. But at the same time, each robot is communicating with the other agents, with the other robots to perform distributed loop closure detection, distributed outlier rejection, and distributed post-graph optimization. And then once the post-graph optimization is done, each robot can locally correct the mesh to make sure that it's globally consistent. So uh, I'm very excited about this. I invite you to, to listen to the full presentation. It's going to be uh, on Thursday, I think on this session at TICRA 2021, and is in collaboration with Yoon, Yulun, and John Howe at MIT. Okay, so um, the last part of the presentation is going to cover something that is going beyond Chimera and is about um, this idea of a new map representation, new uh, word representation, which is called 3D dynamic scene graphs. Um, I'm going to present what is a dynamic scene graph. I'm going to present algorithms 
to build a dynamic scene graph from data. And I, if I have time, I will also cover a bunch of uh, recent uh, work on using learning-based learning methods to populate a scene graph. Um, so what is a 3D dynamic scene graph? It's essentially a mental model for a robot. It's a new map representation for a robot. And uh, the intuition is pretty simple. It's a hierarchical model, including multiple layers. And each layer corresponds to a more and more abstract representation of the environment. So we start from a low level representation, which is uh, the metric semantic mesh that I was presenting in the previous part of the talk. But then you can move to layer two, which is including objects and agents. So this is including just the location of objects and the shape of objects, as well as humans moving in the environment. Layer three is including places and structures. Places are just uh, uh, free space location in the environment. You can think about it as a topological map of the environment. And structures are essentially walls, ceilings, uh, uh, floor, and so on. And if you go up in the hierarchy, you get uh, coarser and coarser representations. You get uh, rooms, buildings, and so on. So more formally, a 3D dynamic scene graph is a directed graph where nodes are spatial concepts. So any concept, essentially any concept that is grounded in 3D space, objects, humans, uh, rooms, and so on. And the ages in this graph represent spatiotemporal relation between concepts. For example, agent I is in room J at time T. So the key insight within this model is really to um, provide a unified representation for uh, <clears throat> low-level geometry, such as mesh reconstruction and topological mapping, and also um, these other representation, including collection of objects. You want to unify these into a single representation that the robot can infer. And this representation is describing the environment at different level, clearly a different level of abstraction, it's capturing dynamic agents in the scene, including other robots and humans, and include actionable information for planning and decision making. In particular, as we said, places are essentially a topological map, which is a very popular representation for, uh, for motion planning. So of course, like you know, in the in the paper, this is RSS 2020. Uh, not only we propose this representation, but we also describe the first algorithms to build a 3D dynamic scene graph from visual inertial data in heavily, pop heavily populated environments. And uh, uh, in hindsight, really, what we are proposing here is a transition from uh, standard from standard SLAM algorithms to what we call the spatial perception engine. Which is, an, um, which is a set of algorithms for, uh, um, that are providing high-level understanding to the robot, and they are able to infer geometry, semantics, and a hierarchy of high-level spatial concepts and their relations. So in the next few slides, I'm going to describe how in, uh, uh, in our work, like you know, we deconstruct the different layers of the, of the dynamic scene graph. And I'm going to start from layer one, which is uh, the metric semantic mesh, well, pretty much we already said that Chimera is going to do the heavy lifting for building the, um, the metric semantic mesh. At the same time here, we had some extra cleverness about um, how to improve robustness to dynamic entities using IMU aided feature tracking. It's really like you know minor uh, improvement on Chimera, but also how to avoid including things which are moving such as humans as part of the 3D mesh in Chimera. We don't want to do that because if you include humans as part of the 3D mesh, essentially they end up uh, creating uh, um, kind of artifacts in the reconstruction. And I think this is well covered by this. Um, so you see that the, in the top um, figure here, this is what happens if you include dynamic entities in the 3D reconstruction. Essentially you create kind of a halo of the human moving around. And what we propose essentially to get rid of the dynamic elements using something that's called uh, selective ray tracing, which is uh, called dynamic masking, such that we don't include dynamic entities as part of the, of the mesh. Layer 2 includes objects and uh, agents. And uh, um, um, let me start maybe by the agents part. So here we primarily care about detecting humans. And I believe this work is the first one doing uh, um, dense 3D reconstruction and uh, reconstructing dense model of humans over time. As you can see here in the video, we are actually tracking a dense model of the human working, walking around, as well as the trajectory of the human over time. And uh, the result is this kind of nice temporal models of the, of the dense mesh of, uh, of the human walking in front of the robot. 
so how do we do that? Um, so essentially we start from images um, and we use a deep learning based approach, which is called graph CMR, which is doing single shot, single frame detections of the human pose. And what you add on top of that, by the way, that's very cool work from the group of Costas Nanilidis is called graph CMR. And what we do on top of that is add uh, um, a temporal tracking dimension in which we, we kind of enforce smoothness of all these detections over time using again a, an approach which is uh, which is uh, a post graph optimization approach. Um, actually similar in spirit to robust, robust post graph optimization, which we're using for the, for the robot itself. For the objects, um, there is a distinction in the scene graph algorithms within objects, non-objects or rather like you know, objects of known shape and objects of unknown shape. So if uh, we do not have a shape prior on the object, we are able to segment the corresponding mesh but we don't do more than that. We just segment the corresponding mesh and we find we fit the bounding box to the mesh. However, if you have a CAD model of the object we detected, we also fit the CAD model to the mesh itself, as in this case, and essentially we have a much nicer reconstruction because we have a CAD model. And the result of, uh, of uh, um, this is kind of a constellation of objects that we are able to detect in the environment. For the fitting of the CAD model to the to the point cloud or to the mesh produced by Chimera, we also uh, we use an approach which is called Teaser Plus Plus, which we also proposed a couple of years ago. The very effective point cloud registration algorithm. Uh, in many other presentations, uh, uh, I typically talk about those. Uh, we have another research talk about certifiable algorithms, and Teaser Plus Plus is one of those certifiable algorithms for which you also have um, a fast C plus plus implementation. So for layer three, layer three is about uh, places and structures. Um, places again are just topological map of the environment, the skeleton of obstacle free location in the map, which is suitable for motion planning. So you have to visualize a graph like this in which uh, all the nodes are, uh, are uh, obstacle free location in the environment and the edges correspond to traversable paths, uh, obstacle free uh, paths between two nodes. And of course, this is a 3D graph because we'll cover like in all the space. And instead for the structure, we just separate everything else. We just have uh, walls, ground, ceiling, and so on. On top of that, we also have an algorithm to segment out different rooms, uh, which is using essentially the graph of places and is doing just a clustering on the graph of places, which you can see in this animation. You see that we started the graph of places in which all the places are the same, are, uh, same color. And as the clustering algorithm executes on this graph, we can partition the graph of places into different, different rooms. You will see the details of these in the paper, but the bottom line is that uh, with a combination of the graph of places and uh, a 2D section of the Euclidean science distance function. And essentially, if you pick the Euclidean science distance function at the right height in the environment, essentially what happens is that the Euclidean science distance function will be closed for each room. And we can use this information essentially as uh, uh, something that we fit to the, to the clustering algorithm, the graph clustering algorithm to separate the different rooms. Something that I want to, to stress here is that uh, in a dynamic scene graph, traversability is really described at different levels. There is a traversability between rooms. There is a traversability between the, um, the different places. And also from the mesh, you can infer traversability within different, different locations. This is a feature, rather than a bug, this is a feature. You want to represent information at different level of abstraction, such that you can enable different approaches for planning, which can be maybe faster and less accurate, or maybe like, you know, slower and more accurate. We're going to see an example about that in, uh, in a second. So the last layer of dynamic scene graph is uh, the building layer. Uh, we've been mostly doing a single building 3D reconstruction. So that's essentially a single node including uh, the entire, like, you know, encompassing the entire uh, scene graph. But I want to take this slide as an opportunity to zoom in on the object and agents layer and see that, that uh, um, the cool constellation of objects that you're able to reconstruct, as well as the trajectories of the humans moving around in the environment. So uh, this result that we're seeing here is a result that you're able to get using uh, a photorealistic unity-based simulator just to get like you know nice semantic reconstruction. Over the last several several months, we've been putting some effort into making this uh, dynamic scene graph idea. First of all, to demonstrate it on real data or real scenes, as well as improving computational aspects. 
And uh, here are the initial results, which again are in the, the journal version of Chimera. So uh, first of all, we have heterogeneous scenes in simulation in which we are able to reconstruct uh, nice mesh reconstruction of the environment, as well as segment objects, places, rooms, and building. And uh, Tony has been able to do, uh, first order on this paper has been able to do the same reconstruction for his apartment in Cambridge. And it's pretty nice to see that uh, just by looking at these two apartments, you know, it's, it's really difficult to say which one is simulated and which one is real. This is the real apartment, and we're still able to do the mesh reconstruction, extract objects, rooms, places, and the building itself. Um, disclaimer, Chimera is uh, real time. The scene graph construction right now is not real time. The construction, um, most of the Chimera and the mesh reconstruction is done in real time during the run. The construction of the full scene graph is something done at the end of the run, and it takes around in the order of 30 minutes to complete. Okay, not real time yet. Um, we had some fun for the paper also showcasing potential examples of use of, uh, of uh, three dynamic scene graphs. And one of the things that we show is that with the scene graph, you can essentially enable much faster hierarchical path planning. So essentially, you can decide whether you want to do path planning on the original mesh, which is typically very expensive, or you do path planning at the level of places or rooms. And um, here, uh, what you see in this slide are timing results in seconds for the time it takes to do path planning on uh, at the level of places, rooms, buildings, versus doing that on the original mesh, or if you want the Euclidean science distance function, the voxel-based map representation. And you can see that, of course, like you know, when you jump from ESDF to rooms, uh, any planning algorithm, I think we're using A star here, uh, gets like you know three or four orders of, orders of magnitude faster. So there is a huge potential for uh, fast planning and decision making uh, just by using these hierarchical representations. And of course, path planning is just the first application that comes to mind but there are many, many other applications. Um, so obstacle avoidance and planning I already mentioned. Uh, Human-robot interaction is really crucial. Uh, the, with the understanding, with the knowledge of, of uh, seeing graph, essentially a human can tell the robot, go and grab me the, uh, um, the cup, the coffee mug in the kitchen, and the robot will have knowledge of like you know, kitchen, mug, and all these aspects of the environment. And I believe that uh, dynamic scene graphs are going to be important also for long-term autonomy. Uh, there was a question about long-term autonomy in the previous talks about you know, which information to retain and so on. With the scene graph, maybe if you do not have enough, compute, enough storage or enough computation to, to keep track of the entire mesh, you can just store a high-level abstraction. You can just store the rooms that you visited instead of keeping track of the entire mesh. So it provides a very nat natural way to um, compress information and to drop information you don't care about. I believe that the 3D dynamic scene graph is going to be crucial for monitoring and robustness. After you have this graph of uh, spatial concepts, you can start reasoning about uh, compatibility and consistency. For example, if I detect, um, um, I don't know, a fridge in the bathroom, I can kind of reason that these two objects or like you know, these two places do not like you know really fit well together, and I can start like you know maybe detecting issues or misdetection in my uh, mental model in the robots mental model of the world and i believe that these uh, dynamic scene graphs are also going to be uh, important for prediction because they allow reasoning uh, both at high level like you know both in terms of high level goals for example a human is going towards the kitchen as well as low level motion planning so they are a great representation for uh, temporal prediction Okay, I think I want to spend the last like you know two or three minutes of this presentation to tell about a, uh, a very recent work about adding learning as well to 3D um, dynamic scene graphs. And this is an archive paper that uh, we literally put on archive. It's a very cool paper. Uh, I will not have time like you know to, to go into the technical details of it, but it's something that we put on archive a couple of weeks ago. It's very cool work. Go and, uh, and take a look if you're interested. Um, the basic observation is that. Uh, um, this is solving the following issue. In practice, in the scene graph that we constructed so far, some of the semantic labels, the, the semantic labels for some of the nodes are missing. For example, I showed you how to reconstruct this kind of uh, scene graph, but you see that uh, the robot at this point is not really able to say that uh, room one is the kitchen, room two is, uh, I don't know, the bathroom. We'll just be able to segment the rooms, but we'll not be able to assign a semantic, we'll not be aware of a semantic label for the rooms. 
And similarly, there will be like, you know, unknown objects for which the robot is maybe able to segment them, but does not have the, the semantic class of the corresponding objects. And same for building, the robot will not be able to, to say if a building is an office building or a residential building. So again, the issue that we want to address here is that uh, uh, in particular for the top layers of the scene graph, we do not have, we are missing semantic labels. While for uh, many of the bottom layers, we have the labels. We know if uh, an object is a chair, we know about humans, we know about other objects for which we have a neural network that can detect those objects. So why do I care about these missing labels? Well, again, it's important to have these labels for the same application I was mentioning before. If you want to do semantic path planning for a robot to understand the command, go to the kitchen, the robot has to know where is the kitchen. So really we care about filling in these missing labels. And the same for uh, kind of like, you know, human Q&A to, to, to answer questions such as where is the cake in the kitchen? The robot will, will need to know about rooms and other missing labels and in general for high level autonomy. So the insight that uh, we used when, uh, when uh, um, uh, addressing this problem of filling in infinitely missing labels, the intuition is that uh, nodes in the scene graph are highly correlated and we can learn co-currents. Let me give you a very practical example. Here I have a scene graph with a bunch of objects and uh, with a room, this one in blue, and actually there are different rooms. And you can see that here we have the labels for objects, but we do not have the label for the room. At the same time as a human, if I look at this label for the object, I see that there is a bed, there is a book, there is a chair, there is a clock. Most likely, if there is a bed, this is not going to be a kitchen, right? This is most likely going to be a bedroom. And that's exactly the kind of uh, correlation that we want to capture, um, we want the ro robot to learn. And uh, we've been working on this idea. This is a problem that in machine learning is called uh, um, node classification. And we have been uh, essentially working on node classification using state-of-the-art graph neural networks. But by doing that, we also came up with a new architecture, which is called the neural trees. Um, if you are curious about these, you like um, graph neural networks, you like probabilistic inference. The neural tree is a great model, which is bridging standard inference in probabilistic graphical models with the state-of-the-art in uh, graph neural networks. And, uh, um, the paper is on archive. Essentially, we show a couple of cool things. We show that in theory, by just changing the graph and structuring the graph as a tree, you can uh, just get performance guarantees. You can uh, guarantee that the neural trees are approximating probability distributions over a graph. The practical implication of that is just, just by doing this trick or converting a graph into a tree, you get 10% improvement on the accuracy of the labeling. So very uh, cool results, in particular in the test that we did on uh, 3D scene graphs. So we'll, uh, I want to leave a couple of uh, minutes for questions here. So let me conclude by saying that uh, we have to be aware that there is a large gap separating robot and human perception. And uh, we just need to go beyond SLAM and think about real time, high level understanding. And I would just propose, I'm not solving, really, we are not solving the problem. We're just proposing two steps, uh, hopefully in the right direction. The first one is Chimera, which is a real time metric semantic visual inertial SLAM library, which is modular and it's open source. And today I was also mentioning about new contributions, including post-graph and mesh optimization, multi-robot extensions, and the testing we are doing on, uh, on a bunch of like, you know, benchmarking and real data sets. We are shooting to release a new version of Chimera, which is much more robust than what we have right now. And the second effort is about uh, this new map representation, which is, which is called 3D dynamic scene graph, which is a general representation for robot perception in spatial AI. And today I mentioned uh, we're working on applications, we are working on learning-based approaches to infer labels in, uh, in uh, scene graphs, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get to a real-time implementation pretty soon. So this being said, I want to thank again the students leading this work. I want to, to thank the sponsors supporting this research, and I want to thank you for your attention. I look forward, if you have questions, to address the questions, and also feel free to follow us on the YouTube channel or just follow our research on Twitter. Thanks. Hi, thank you, Luca. Um, this is really great work, um, as always. Um, so um, do we have any questions from the audience, from the chat? If not, there's time for, I think, for one question. I certainly have one. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning the human level scene understanding. Um, how far do, we, do you think we are from that? Um, 
it, it years, that... decades, and, and, and <laughs> oh, maybe okay, quantify in terms of time, uh, and may, maybe have to quantify even what level of, uh, I mean, maybe not full human, but but something that's more useful than than current systems. Yeah, I can tell you what's missing. I think that uh, um, the, the question about time is a bit difficult to quantify because in my mind there is there is a question also about. Uh, do we have the right computation infrastructure to get human level perception? There is a question maybe that you know, we do not have enough compute right now or the right compute to get human level real time perception. Um, the good news is that, uh, is that uh, definitely like, you know, we, have, we have seen huge jumps ahead with the uh, SLAM, with uh, uh, things like you know, ISAM for the geometric part as well as uh, deep learning for the, for the semantic part has been a huge, uh, huge progress. What's missing, I think, is a tight coupling, serious tight coupling between these two parts, I think. Um, so semantics and geometry, we are uh, starting to have papers and works which are kind of coupling them, like, you know, coupling maybe discrete variables with continuous variables, but we cannot do that in a seamless way as humans do. Uh, as a human, uh, the detection of a table instantaneously is providing a shape prior on the table and is helping the geometric reconstruction. And the geometric reconstruction is kind of validating my understand my semantic understanding of the scene. Uh, what we do with robots is still very clumsy. It's really like you know not not as uh, as nice. And I believe that um, um, the other big issue is uh, robustness. As we are still fighting to get true robustness for SLAM in challenging data sets, let's say sub T data sets. If we move to high level understanding, the robustness challenging is even more is even more. So. I think that uh, that to get these to a human level perception, I don't think that uh, that we'll see uh, we see part of it, but I don't I don't think we'll see that within uh, within ten years. To be honest, like you know, might be pessimistic, but it's very hard to predict. All right, thank you very much for your talk. And um, so, in order to stay on schedule, let's move on. Uh, Jonathan Kelly. Thanks, Luca. Jonathan, are you on? Hi, Michael. Hopefully Hi. you can hear me. Great. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. You can try sharing your slides and I'll let me introduce you quickly. Okay. Right. Let's try this out. Uh, I did see somebody raise their hand. Go ahead and post your question in the chat if you had another question about the, the previous talk. Okay. One second here. Let's see if this works. Should work. Hopefully. Always have trouble with my keynote presentations. All right. Okay. Can you guys see that? No, Great. There should be just, just a logo. <laughs> yeah, there's still two windows on the bottom right and also show up that other than that. Oh, this is good. this. Yes, I've had this. Hang on. Let me see if I can fix that. Thanks, Michael. This is an this is a known keynote issue, I think, that these little these windows hang around. They're not supposed to. Okay. Let's try this one more time. <laughs> okay. There we are. Should be okay now. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Let me. Let me start with a quick introduction here. So Jonathan Kelly uh, is an assistant professor at the University of Toronto, and he's the director of the Space and Terrestrial Autonomous Robotics Systems Lab. Um, previously, he was a postdoc in the robotics, um, robust robotics group at MIT with Nick Roy. Um, that's also where we got to know each other. And uh, before that, he was a PhD student um, got his PhD from the Robotic Embedded System Lab at USC with Gorov Sukhadne. And so with this, he's going to talk today. Um, uh, yeah, so please, please go ahead. Okay, thanks very much, Michael. And thanks uh, to everyone for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I unfortunately missed the last one, so I'm delighted to uh, delighted to be here for this one. I'm also channeling uh, Nick, speaking of Nick Roy, I'm channeling Nick Roy a little bit. Um, I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt um, as part of the ICRA conference. I'm also actually in Hawaii at the moment, so I'm hoping my connection is stable. Well, fingers crossed. I had a little problem this morning, so we'll we'll keep our fingers crossed. All right, so it's great to be here. Thanks everyone for the invitation again. Um, I'm gonna have a, it's a bit of a niche talk today, but um, it's something that we've been uh, working on uh, over the past little while, and it was just um, the topic of temporal calibration in VINs systems, uh, and not just VINs, in any, in any multi-sensor system. So I'm going to talk about that a bit today and, um, and just revisiting how we actually approach this problem of, uh, of temporal calibration um, from a filtering perspective. So I'll tell you a little bit about this, but first, what I wanted to do is just actually bring up a recent uh, example that sort of fell into my lap uh, 
regarding um, the the interesting um, necessity to uh, potentially uh, temporarily calibrate your sensors. And I'll explain what I mean by temporal calibration shortly. So uh, let's take our favorite uh, helicopter, uh, Ingenuity, and uh, have, you'll notice I have this dangerometer on the bottom. I've had a bit of fun with, the, with this uh, presentation, so I hope you'll indulge me with some, some animations and things. So this helicopter, uh, it flies, uh, everything should be fine, um, but you'll notice that, okay, here it's, it's started on fire now on Mars. It, of course, wouldn't be on fire because there's no oxygen on Mars, but um, or very little in the atmosphere. But anyway, um, the idea here is that you saw at the end, the helicopter was making some aggressive maneuvers. And um, if you don't have synchronized sensors, particularly visual and inertial sensors um, that are out of time, uh, out of time step, so they, there's an unknown time delay between them, uh, or if that time delay varies, then uh, as motions become more aggressive, uh, you're going to run into issues where you're simply you're you're not able to compute proper error estimates because um, you're you're delayed. One one system is delayed, and this lag in the control systems is well known, uh, but it also extends to to sensor systems as well. So, okay, so we'll get rid of the fire. Um, so we put the fire out, but but actually, as an example of something that happened, I just wanted to, to highlight this um, the danger of delays. So this is actually something that just happened uh, a few days ago or a few souls ago. Uh, on Mars, uh, and it was uh, with the Ingenuity helicopter. This is a picture taken by Ingenuity on Sol 91 of the uh, of the mission uh, when it was on its sixth test flight. And there's a great blog post about this by the uh, the NASA uh, JPL chief pilot, which explains what went wrong in this particular flight scenario. So sixth flight, uh, Ingenuity was to take off, fly 150 meters effectively. Um, football field type length and then land. And uh, flights to date, uh, the first five had gone well. And then uh, I'll just play this video here. This this happened on the sixth flight. And you can see some, uh, th these are the images from the downward looking camera on board, uh, uh, on board Ingenuity uh, of the terrain surface. And you'll notice that there's, there's waving back and forth that's happening uh, of the surface. And you would expect normally if the camera was operating correctly for the surface to be nice and smooth. Uh, your state estimator, which in this case is an EKF, wants, um, wants that visual data to be nice and smooth and um, not have any jumps. So what happened in this case? Well, uh, it turns out with, without going into some of the technical detail, but uh, and and with my understanding of, uh, of what's been shared, is that they they lost a frame. They lost one video frame, um, and as a result of that uh, ejection of one video frame from the visual uh, and inertial processing pipeline, um, all timestamps for uh, future frames were shifted, and so the timestamps on the the images were inaccurate. This uh, inaccurate timestamp information was fed into the VINs uh, system, or VINs, I should say, and uh, the result that you saw in the video was pitch and roll motions of plus minus 20 degrees. Um, so this is, uh, this is close to losing the vehicle. Now, thankfully, JPL, brilliant engineers, they've built a lot of safety and redundancy into the system. Uh, and so even with pitch and roll values of 20 degrees from, from horizontal, which if you've worked with quad rotors, especially small quad rotors, you know is, that's a very aggressive, uh, that's a very aggressive uh, pitch and roll uh, amount. And it's not something you would you would want to see, especially in a vehicle that's flying on another planet millions of miles from you that you you cannot touch and fix uh, if anything goes wrong. So thankfully, nothing uh, nothing catastrophic happened in this case because the control system was robust enough to handle these large variations. And actually, you'll see at the end of the video that they they shut off a portion of the estimator, so uh, it is able to safely land, um, relying on visual data or sorry, pardon me, inertial data only. And so there was no um, there was no danger in the landing process, but they did manage to stay in the air. The upshot being um, they had a fixed knowledge of the time lags and delays available in the system. And when that was compromised, uh, the, the state of the vehicle was also almost compromised. So that just is an interesting example of a, a great motivating example, not so much for the folks at JPL, because I'm sure people have you know, heart failure or close to it. Um, but uh, it's a great motivating example for why you actually do care about time delays and maybe being able to, to identify those time delays online in multi-sensor systems, particularly in VINs. All right, so what am I gonna talk about today? Well, uh, it looks like a lot, but I, I promise I'll go through it fairly quickly. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the problem of temporal calibration, which we're also gonna call time delay estimation. And then I'm gonna discuss a little bit about some recursive filtering approaches that have been um, uh, 
uh, introduced in the literature to solve this problem of temporal calibration using recursive filters such as the extended Kalman filter in particular. Um, and then I'm going to introduce a simple, a very, very simple system model. You're going to laugh because you're going to say, this is, this is so simple. Why, why, are you, why are you looking at this such a simple system? Well, the reason is because we've, uh, in my group, tried to get VINs working with time delay or temporal calibration, uh, time delay estimation working. And we ran into a bunch of uh, issues, a bunch of problems with, with convergence. And so it led us to go back and investigate what was happening with some of these estimators. And the easiest way to show uh, some of the things that we've discovered is with this very, very, very simple system model, which will hopefully provide some intuition for what might happen with your bin system or your GPS aided uh, inertial nav system uh, on a larger aircraft, uh, for example. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about this, this interesting crux of the one of the, the issues is uh, the identifiability of time delays and what's required to actually discover a correct time delay in a system. And then go into some possible uh, gotchas that you might find in your filtering framework when you're trying to actually uh, determine time delays using, using filtering. Uh, we'll go through some simulation studies at the end just to show you some of the results we've got for this simple system that indicate uh, when you might run into issues. And then just briefly close with some alternative possibilities that might be interesting research topics for those for those watching the stream, or things you might want to investigate in the future that might make these systems more robust. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, okay, so temporal calibration, I'm going to call time delay estimation, temporal calibration, I'll use them uh, synonymously. What is the problem in a nutshell and how do we fix it? So the problem in a nutshell is that we have two sensors, cameras and IMUs in this case for VINs, and we, we often don't know exactly how long each sensor takes to process uh, the, the data coming from, uh, from the device. So this means that there's some, there's some unknown uh, lag in the system from, all, from both sensors, and the lag may not be the same, which means that relatively speaking, the, the time uh, outputs or the measurements from both sensors are shifted. There's one shift. It can be either a, uh, you know, depending on how you look at it, it can be a lag of the IMU relative to the camera, or it can be a lead of the IMU relative to the camera, depending on your system. So we'll just call them both delays. It's whether you consider the camera or the IMU as being the um, reference sensor. But either way, there's some delay that's relatively um, uh, inv well, involved and it's relative between the two sensors. Now, this, as I said, if you're trying to build an estimator is a nasty thing, right? We like to consider estimators that are just, uh, you know, estimating one thing at one fixed point in time that the system is perfect, there is no lag, which is never true in practice, but, you know, often is, is approximately true for lucky. And so one way to make that very much approximately true is to perform some type of hardware synchronization. So maybe um, if, you, uh, if you have a large uh, budget for your robot system, maybe you can afford to, to build a custom hardware synchronization um, module that actually keeps sensors from different manufacturers synchronized in some way. You may still have unknown delays at the sensor level itself, uh, but at least you can get them very close with this hardware synchronization. That's one way to do with it. Um, another way that's uh, for, for us academic folks who have less money potentially <laughs> is to solve this, and this is a terrible example, this is a terrible animation, but to solve this using some type of offline batch calibration approach. And I'm just going to, and this is like a, a curve alignment problem. You can do this with splines. So uh, continuous time representations, you can do this with um, uh, you know, a variety of different underlying um, optimization techniques. But the key here is it's offline and it's batch. So you're going to do this uh, before you fly your vehicle or before you drive your car. And then you're going to hope that the time delay just doesn't change, it just stays roughly fixed and you know you're you're thinking okay i've identified it offline great now i'll go out and, and fly and nothing will ever change and then you find out something like the mars helicopter uh issue uh, with uh ingenuity happens and you think oh wait maybe i should have tried to estimate this uh, this uh this value online uh during during regular operation maybe that would be a more robust solution and in general it, it, it can be especially when you have things like measurement jitter and other other effects that may actually cause these time delays to vary okay so uh, great. So offline batch. I mean, there are other there are other online approaches that I didn't talk about. There are some online sliding window techniques that are also possible, uh, and, and uh, can be implemented as well. But another approach that's that's very appealing, right, uh, is is to use recursive filtering. So we're all, I think, you know, preaching to the choir here uh, in in this uh, in the workshop about uh, the EKF, the UKF, lots of interesting and uh, um, uh, highly relevant. Uh, 
uh, filters that we're you know, we're all very familiar with, right? We've used them extensively. So, uh, hardware synchronization is potentially expensive. Uh, batch algorithms have to to run offline. Maybe there's some other kind of online approach with some kind of estimation lag. Recursive filters are nice because you know they update it every time step, and you get something uh, in terms of a, a, some kind of estimate um, at at every single step. So fantastic. So great. So why not use recursive filters? Could we just add? The time delay as a parameter to the state vector of a recursive filter and actually just modify the filter in a, in a number of small ways to try and estimate this delay parameter as well. Then the delay would be estimated online along with all of the other states of interest and we'd always have some up to date estimate at the most recent time step of what we think the delay in the system is um, and, and uh, hopefully be able to work with that um, to build a, uh, a robust estimator. And indeed, this I would you know I'd like to point out some some really nice I think prior work that I, I really liked um, on this topic. It's from, it's from about a decade ago now, almost. So uh, uh, Lee and Maricus have a really nice IJRR paper on this from 20, uh, 2013 uh, or 2014, pardon me, when the when the paper was just uh, released. And just a couple of years prior to that, uh, Skog and uh, Handel um, also published a nice paper on time synchronization that used a very, very similar approach. This is back from 2011, um, where literally just took, you know, but in both cases here, we they took an EKF, um, they added the delay, which was treated as the approximately constant uh, to the state vector. And then they, um, they implemented a, uh, a modified version of the filter update step that takes into account this, this time delay, um, this time delay. Uh, parameter that you want to actually estimate as well. So they're, again, just trying to figure out what that relative shift is between IMU and camera data or IMU and uh, GPS data in, in the second case of SCOG and Handel. So great. So it sounds sounds like a wonderful uh, sounds like a wonderful idea, and I think in 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 certain cases it does it does work well. Um, as I said, we had some issues in trying to tune it. Now I had to have Kalman just pop in here to to say, hey, neat, that's my filter. Now I don't think. Um, I just like a picture of uh, real uh, Kalman. He's <laughs> he was great, great, uh, uh, a great uh, uh, engineer, and uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to see his filter. It, this is not really his filter in the sense that it's EKF, but uh, extended in all kinds of interesting ways. And I don't think he would probably ever use the word neato, but I decided to use the word neato because I I think this is pretty neat stuff. So okay, so. All right, so as I said, we uh, in my group had spent a fair bit of time investigating um, temporal calibration on board uh, small robot platforms like drones. And we, we had a lot of issues where depending on the motion of the platform um, and uh, a number of other effects and factors, our time, the, the estimates just would not converge. Like strange things would happen with, with the time delays. And uh, and then also um, because of some issues with the time delay estimates kind of being wonky, we also had issues with the, um, the the state estimates because things become correlated as you run the filter, and so it was just it was strange, and we didn't really fully understand what was going on. Why some in some cases divergence or or um, apparent divergence to bias quantities would happen. So decided to to step back and and try to figure this out from a, from a very va very basic first principles uh, formulation which I'll tell you a little bit about now and please bear with me hopefully this is so it's a little bit of math and it, it is fairly confusing but I'll I'll try to talk you through it it's, it's not because it's complicated it's just there's lots of terms bouncing around all right so we're going to take a look at this this super simple aided navigation system and I'm claiming that what I'm showing you on this slide is the simplest form of aided navigation system so we're going to have a single state in our state vector, uh, which is going to be, we're going to call it the position X. Um, and the rate of change of position is going to be a function solely of a single control input, U of T, which in the case of VINs would be uh, an input from a high rate sensor, like an IMU, something that drives the process model forward. And this is almost always how we set these systems up, where the camera or the GPS uh, sensor is the uh, correction sensor and the uh, high rate sensor, the IMU or the velocimeter, I guess in this case, because it's a, it's a first order system. So it's a velocimeter really uh, drives the control, uh, drives the control input. Uh, and that, that tends to work quite well. Now for the thing I'm gonna get to next, we're gonna say that at, at some arbitrary point in time, T equals zero, um, we probably know the start, what we think is the starting state of the system, or we'll be given a state uh, X, which in this case, I'm using a superscript just to avoid clashes with subscripts later on. X sub zero is the initial, what you can call it the initial 
state of the system, but it's the state where we're given or we think we're in when we start. Uh, when we start the filter, that is not the initial state necessarily of the system itself, because we're going to assume the system exists for all time. Then we have our little delay parameter tau. Okay, so it's going to be a single parameter. That's our one delay in this fancy system. So there's a shift between the control and the, uh, the measurement updates. And that's due to tau, which we'll treat as a constant, but unknown value. And y of t is going to be our measured system output, which is, uh, you'll notice, a shifted estimate of the state. So a shifted estimate of position. So you can think of this as a, like, really, it's a super simple, super simple VINs uh, system. OK, and then we're going to take this. If I can just do this. OK, we're going to shrink that. And much of this is, is not um, overly relevant, but it's just a diagram that shows you, OK, when, when we're getting various, uh, various uh, sets of measurements. So we have some uh, discrete sample data system that models the underlying uh, continuous time system dynamics. And we're going to capture controls, which are from the high rate sensor at uh, certain points in time. Right? We're going to have our, our state estimate, which is going to lag in this case, because uh, we're going to call tau um, a negative quantity. And then our measured outputs, y sub k, are going to be also uh, spaced in time. But they're actually, and here y sub k is, um, or y of t sub k is the measured output, but it's of the state that you see um, with the golden colored uh, dashed arrow. So it's, it's, you're measuring at the time shown a past state. So that's why things are a bit tricky. You're going to feed this into your extended common filter, uh, which has this additional tau sub k hat term, which is the estimated time delay. And you're just going to loop, right? So this is the standard EKF uh, step, right? So a measurement update propagate the process model forward in time, and then uh, repeat, lather, rinse, repeat, as per the standard uh, recursive filtering equations. OK, so, so what is the problem with this? Well, I'm going to also try, and without any um, uh, convoluted additional formulas, try to explain one of the problems that, that might occur in your filtering framework uh, that is related to the, the time delay. Um, and it's intuitively straightforward, but it, it's not maybe obvious when you start, uh, start trying to fiddle with the equations. So the, the problem is this, actually. It's that if you step back and think about a time delay system where, where some, something in the system is shifted, delayed in time, it turns out that you, you actually can't uh, identify a, uh, a time delay um instantaneously of course then then this makes sense right so if something is delayed how how would you figure it out unless you you waited a little while uh and until after a delay period had passed and then you could you just could discover it so that's what i'm going to try and show you here and that's not very that's a kind of a very hand wavy opaque explanation but i'll try and make it a little more clear so the the key is that delay identifiability requires a finite period of time. And I'll tell you exactly how long. It's actually, you, you need exactly the amount of time um, that is uh, equivalent to the delay period in order to identify the delay. And actually, it's, it's fairly straightforward to show, and I'll try and do so here, um, that you actually cannot uh, instantaneously identify a delay. You can't identify a delay in a time that is less than uh, the actual delay interval in general, unless you have some additional information. Um, and this is going to play into our uh, our filtering problem because it turns out that uh, the EKF and most other recursive filters are built on the assumption that the underlying system is observable and identifiable at all times uh, effectively. So the underlying system has to be uh, observable or identifiable uh, for states and parameters respectively at all times uh, in order to compute principal error values. Right? If the system is not identifiable or observable, uh, even if there's some, some bounded value, which will actually will occur in this case, then it, the, the error computation that goes on inside a recursive filter um, is, is effectively not correct. And the, the amount of uh, deviation or inaccuracy is related to you know, how far away this, this set of possible reachable states uh, or parameter values is um, or how big it is basically um, in, in this sort of unknown space. Okay, so that's again, not a very mathematical concrete way to put it. So I'll try and explain it with this with this plot here. And I think hopefully the plot will uh, uh, um, produce uh, some, some easy uh, uh, 
easy understanding of, of how this entire uh, uh, delay identification problem crops up. All right, so what I'm going to show you here are uh, we're going to take two, two instances of that last system that I showed you, um, the, the very, very simple time delay system. And we're going to um, we're going to make them identical. I mean, it's a very simple system, right? So we're going to make them perfectly identical, except that I'm going to give you two different values of tau, tau and tau prime. And I'm going to say tau in this case is equal to minus one. And you can see this on the bottom and tau prime is equal to minus two. So we can call those minus one, minus one and minus two seconds. So we have minus one and minus two seconds of, of delays for the two different system. And I'll say that in this case, the true system, the true delay is gonna be, uh, gonna be uh, minus one second, okay? So that's the actual true delay in the system. Um, but I'm also gonna talk about the secondary system that has a different delay value. And the question is uh, for delay identification, the question is in a, in a time less than one second, and I'll say this carefully, in a time less than one second, can I discover the difference between tau and tau prime? Can I distinguish between these two systems? If I can, if there's something I can do in terms of a control I can apply or an observation I can make that will distinguish between these two delays, then the, uh, the delay tau, the true delay, is identifiable in less than one less than one second, which is the delay quantity itself, which we're gonna indicate here by, by tau with a little plus sign. That's the absolute value of the delay. Uh, if, if I can, that's great. If I can't, it means that I have a system that is unidentifiable at least for a certain finite window of time. That is, I cannot uniquely within an interval of say one second, uh, differentiate between two different delays. And if I can't do that, it means that when I'm writing down an error equation, for my filter update step, for example, um, I actually have to consider the fact that I, I can't actually identify this parameter um, in, this, in this finite period of time. And uh, as a reference to recursive filtering, you'll note the recursive filters always keep, uh, in, the, in the general case, an update at a single point in time, right? So they keep the state updated uh, and all the estimates updated at the same single point in time. So there's no knowledge of a past history right in the filter. Markov, it's a Markov filter, generally a Markov chain framework, right? So the EKF, the UKF, they all use the Markov chain framework. And you you always uh, just have this one estimate at this one point in time. So you basically marginalize out everything else and you forget. You forget past controls, you forget, you forget uh, past states. You only have your most recent update. So if I can't compute an error at that point, um, or if the error I compute is, is uh, prone to be say too small, or too large, because I, um, I have an unidentifiable uh, window, then I might be in trouble. And that's ex exactly what, what we're proposing here. Okay, so back to the proof very quickly, the proof in graphical form, I don't want to take too much time, I'm just looking at the time on this step. But here's the intuition behind this. So I'm going to give you these two systems, right? And I'm going to give you two control inputs. So here, one is in uh, gold, and one is in blue. So we'll say that the, the, the true system with the true delay of minus one second is shown in blue. And I'm going to give you a control input. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to tell you, OK, the system starts at uh, t equals 0 when I turn the filter on. And um, immediately, as soon as I turn the filter on, I can start recording u of t, the measurements of uh, u of t. With, we're treating u of t as a control input. But remember, it's coming from it's coming from some sensor that's at a high rate, right? So we're going to just call it a continuous time system, and we're going to measure that. And so um, I'm going to measure U of T, and I'm going to say, okay, both both of these systems I can construct in such a way that I can measure U of T and U of T prime in this pink little window region. I can measure those controls for for one second. So now note that both tau and tau uh, tau prime are are negative values. So basically. Outside of this little window, uh, in the pink here, right, is is control uh, control signals that I haven't seen that I, I don't know about because they happened before I turned my system on. So all I can see from time t equals zero is what's in the pink in the pink box or the light red box. All right, okay. So what does this mean? So and I'm going to talk about why this this uh, the gold control suddenly drops to zero in just a second. Well, that means when I'm when I'm tracking the states of the system. Uh, right, the state, as you saw in this very simple time delay system, is just an integrated control signal. So what we can do is we can simply integrate the signals that you're seeing up above, 
And uh, for this very simple, uh, very simple control input set, I'm going to bound my controls. I'll just say that my controls can go between minus one and, and plus one as control input values go, but they also include zero. So I can always input a control of zero. And so what you're seeing in the, the top plot is that for a portion of the input, um, the control, um, I'm going to just drop it to zero. So um, the, the, the idea here is that I'm going to try and build two systems that from time zero to time one look identical, have the same input output map. And if I can do that, right, then this is the definition of identifiability or observability or unidentifiability or unobservability, right? There needs to be um, distinguishability between two, two sets of, of states or parameters. And if I can't distinguish in a given time interval, then the states or parameters are not identifiable or observable uh, or uh, vice versa, observable or identifiable in that time period. Right? So as long as I can provably construct two systems that have exactly the same inputs and outputs over a certain window, then it is not possible to, to distinguish those systems. And so that's exactly what we're trying to show here with the second, with the second um, plot. So what you'll see is that uh, if you look at the, 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 the state estimate between uh, negative two and negative one uh, and negative one and zero for both systems, the golden and the, uh, the blue system, you will see that those integrated state values are identical. They're time shifted, but they're identical. And note that they both start at this point, we'll call X uh, superscript minus one. That's some point uh, in, in the, the state space in, in prior, uh, prior points in time. And they both end at X zero. Now note that in the, uh, the case of the second integrated uh, um, control, right? It, it doesn't change for a certain, uh, for a certain period of time. So uh, basically the system stays flat, but you'll notice importantly, I have, I have two sets of states that are identical on the interval intervals negative two to negative one and negative one to zero. And those are what we actually see as our measured outputs. Okay, so sorry, this is getting a bit, it's getting a bit tricky, but the inputs are uh, time shifted, except that for the golden, the golden tau prime uh, system, right? I've taken a one second gap where I just set the input to zero. That means that the states when integrated uh, look the same, except that the, uh, the second system with tau prime as the delay has a period where it doesn't change and then things go on to change. And then the final plot here shows the outputs. And so what, what are these outputs actually indicating? Well, these outputs are indicating that um, what I can see in my simple, simple, simple time delay system is the, the block in the lower plot shown in blue. And so what I can see is effectively um, that from, from my perspective as a filter, um, it looks to me like um, I can see the inputs in the shaded red box and I can see the outputs in the shaded blue box at the bottom. And they look, they look, uh, I mean, the, the inputs and the outputs are, are different, of course, because things are time shifted. But from my perspective, nothing I do from the input side can affect anything that happened in the past. And the outputs I see are identical, actually. Whether the delay was tau equals minus two seconds or tau equals minus one second. So over this one second window, which is the window uh, of the true delay, I actually can't distinguish. Right? It, it's, it's entirely possible that the true system delay could be minus two seconds or the true system delay could be minus one second. And within one second of observing the system, I cannot distinguish these two things. And so what that means is that unless I actually watch, and here all I would have to do is wait until just after one second, and then I would suddenly realize, then I would have the piece of information I need to suddenly realize, oh, it can't, and the system is now changing again. Um, oh, of course, okay, so the, the true delay must be one second because it doesn't make, it, now it doesn't make sense um, for, for there to be a two second delay, a two second lag. I can tell from the controls. And the reason is because 
after one second, the controls that I have observed, the control signal that I observed, suddenly has an effect on the measured output, right? The output, even though it's lagging, and the measured control that I put in, um, that I can remember, right, they overlap. Prior to that, they do not. So my claim here is that I can always create, in this case, in fact, in any case, an infinite number of systems that have different delay values that, um, for the absolute value of the shortest delay, cannot be distinguished. So they cannot fundamentally be distinguished in that time interval. And so the, the real issue here is then, how does this factor into the filtering framework? And what I'm gonna claim, and then and show you in just a moment, is that the way this is gonna factor in is in the, the way we compute the error in the filter estimate. And so when I compute an error, um, I'm depending on the fact that I have, an, I have some understanding of the uncertainty in the time delay, and I have some understanding of the uncertainty in the state. And the problem here is that because there are parts that are unseen that I don't know about, it's actually, uh, it's, it, it's non-trivial to compute that uh, error term. And the way it is typically done in the EKF framework, even with the tau parameter included, risks actually uh, computing an innovation term. So the difference, an innovation and an innovation variance or covariance that is potentially too small. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And so the upshot here is that you, you might be running into problems. Um, and then just to foreshadow slightly, the other issue is that when you incorporate process noise in these systems, right, you do it in such a way that um, the delay estimate is shifting over time. And that, to some extent, compromises the way you incorporate process noise, unless you inflate the noise uh, in such a way to try and cover all your bases. So I'll get to that in just a second as well. So let's start by um, just going through the, the actual uh, Did we lose Jonathan or is the problem on my side? No, I think we did. All right, let's hope that he can reconnect shortly. Oh, yeah, he fully disconnected. Let's see if he rejoins. I guess he was worried about losing connection from yeah. Hawaii. <laughs> I guess we only have a few minutes left to the next talk anyways, but it would be unfortunate if we couldn't get the end of, the, of Jonathan's talk.
Yeah, I guess we'll give him about two minutes or so to reconnect before we move on to the next talk. Yeah, this is too bad we, we don't see the end of the talk. So time synchronization is always a, a huge issue. I've, I've spent lots of time on uh, either trying to engineer the systems or dealing with the consequences of not correctly engineered systems where time synchronization doesn't work. So being able to actually estimate the, uh, the time synchronization and, and having theoretical insights into when that estimation is accurate and when not um, is, is really an essential um, contribution. All right, so I don't see I don't see him on the list. So I think um, we should probably move on. Maybe Abe, if you can start sharing uh, slides and uh, in a minute or so, I'll introduce you. Sounds good. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Great to see you. Yeah, great to see you as well. Yeah, I, I can also uh, commiserate with the importance of time synchronization. Getting it yeah. right is. Uh, Incredibly important. And time consuming, coincidentally, <laughs> yeah. to, to get right. Although I would argue that, uh, you know, hard relative to other hardware that gets built in, in labs and, and the sort of time put in, like it, it's often not that hard to synchronize mm -hmm. sensors relative to the, the time and, and pain that can be caused by, by not doing it. Mm. Yes. All right, so it's 3.30, let's get started. So I'm, I'm happy to introduce A. Bacher from uh, Skydio. Um, so A. is the founder and CTO of Skydio since 2014 has been there. And previously for one and a half years, he was at Google X Project Wing. Uh, and before that, he was a PhD student at MIT um, until 2012. Um, and uh, yeah, so he's going to talk about robust VIO uh, in the real world. And of course, everyone on the call is probably familiar with the Skydio drones. So I'm looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Michael. Um, yeah, so it's great to be here and uh, you know, really, really fun to, to get to share um, some of the thinking that goes into um, getting the, the, some of the concepts that uh, learned and, and sort of worked on as, as grad students and is being pushed by the, the research community out into the real world um, and, and where, where things are, are similar, where, where things can be different. Um, so, you know, hope many people are, are familiar with Skydio, but uh, a, a brief background, um, you know, as Michael said, we uh, are founded in 2014. Um, we have a, a sort of 250 person uh, world-class organization at this point spanning sort of hardware, software, and, and autonomy. Um, our, 
our vehicles are, are designed and built in the U.S. and you know that that is not cheap. Um, and uh, we've we've been fortunate to have backing of, of the you know all-star roster of investors and um, raised a significant amount of, of funding to um, push things forward. Um, our core mission is to make the world more productive, creative, safe, and safe with autonomous flight. Um, and we do that across a, uh, a number of areas, um, inspection and mapping, where we can help digitize the world with millimeter scale precision. Drones can be 10, 10x more effective and safer than the sort of legacy tools that they replace. Situational awareness um, in, in difficult or dangerous situations, you can risk a drone instead of a, a person. Um, and then obviously in, in sort of cinematography, enabling any, anybody and everybody to capture amazing moments uh, with a, a Hollywood film, film crew that fits in, in their backpack. Um, so we have, we have two vehicles on, on the market today, um, Skydio 2 and Skydio X2, um, target at more consumers as well as uh, commercial applications. Uh, and they provide their unmatched autonomy and, and incredible form factor. So um, one of the key unique things is, you know, that our vehicles have these uh, sets of fisheye cameras that provide 360 degree uh, awareness of the world around the, the vehicle. Um, and that that's really the key to enabling the sort of unprecedented ease of use that uh, autonomy can enable. Um, so uh, share a quick, quick video from some of our customers um, that uh, is always always really fun to see what what people use our, our vehicles for. There we go. Um, so as, as you can see, the you know our, our products have enabled a, a really broad set of activities and, and use cases that you know really really empower and enable people. These are uh, some of our favorite quotes um, of people's reactions to to getting to access to that that capability. Um, and you know, in, in addition to the sort of the, the consumer use case, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, more and more we, we see drones as a, an incredibly effective and uh, powerful way to transform a, a lot of commercial and, and enterprise applications, um, and public safety, um, and, and inspection. Um, and it, it's been been really heartening to see the, the excitement and what the, the broad platform of uh, autonomy that we've built can, can enable for um, all these other industries as well. Um, and, and, and at the core of it, it, it truly is the, the autonomy that allows that to be scalable. So, you know, with, with you know, there's been a, no shortage of excitement about what drones can, can open up and enable, um, but uh, with manual drones, um, that, that's just a, a not a, a scalable prospect. Um, you know, the training a, a drone pilot can be incredibly expensive. And even with highly skilled pilots, uh, people still crash a lot. Um, and the, the quality of data that they're able to capture is um, nowhere, nowhere near what, what's possible with the, you know, an autonomous system that, that truly understands the, the world that it, it's trying to capture. Um, and that takes a, a, a full stack approach. Um, so, you know, at, at Skydia, we're, we're building um, the, the hardware, obviously, but um, more importantly, the, the software at the autonomy core. Um, but to, to really enable our, our sort of applications and users to, to do what they need to do, um, it, it, it takes thinking about the, the full stack, everything, all the way up to the user app and the, the sort of 
the skills and, and higher level logic in, in between. Um, so obviously today gonna gonna focus in on the, the sort of that, that autonomy core of the system um, where we have real-time mapping, object recognition, obstacle avoidance, and, and motion prediction that all, all comes together on top of a, a, a robust core of, of state estimation um, to enable the, the advanced capabilities that, that our drones can provide. Um, so, you know, before diving in deeper, um, here, here share a, a quick video of, um, this is actually me riding my uh, mountain bike, um, uh, having, having fun and, and capturing my weekend activities, but, you know, really highlights uh, all the different things that sort of the, the system needs to be aware of and enabling. So in this case, the, the drone's following me in front. Um, obviously it needs to know where it is, what's around it. It needs to know the obstacles. Um, on the right-hand side, we can see the view from our six navigation cameras unwarped into a sort of consistent 360 degree panorama. Um, and then in the bottom right here, we, we have the, the output of our, our depth prediction system that is um, allowing the vehicle to, to understand um, where things are around it. Um, and that, that all needs to come together in, in real time. To, to enable the, the drone to make uh, make good plans, understand where the user is, and move move smoothly to capture a, a great shot. Uh, why is that? Come on, go. Um, and so, you know, as as, as I mentioned previously, it, it's it's not one thing um, that that allows us to work. We we have to be sort of solving a, a, an incredibly broad array of uh, algorithmic challenges to enable the visual autonomy for the system, everything from the core state estimation to depth estimation, object tracking, and, and motion planning. Um, and all of that comes together through vehicle controls and into the sort of end behavior of, of the system. Um, and, you know, in, in each of these areas, we've, we've had to, you know, in, invest a, a tremendous amount of, of effort and, and Leveraging the the sort of state of the art from from academia and in many cases um, pushing pushing beyond what was uh, available outside. Um, so you know, in, in terms of real time three D mapping, we um, you know, implemented an incredibly efficient uh, system that allows us to sort of fuse that, all the information about the world um, on object recognition. We, um, we're leveraging the the sort of power of over nine sort of onboard deep learning networks. Um, and all that comes together with, um, to, to enable obstacle avoidance and, and motion prediction and sort of the advanced workflows that uh, our, our drones can enable. Um, so today, gonna, gonna dive in on, on sort of the visual inertial odometry of, of the system um, and, and some of the sort of considerations that, that went into that. Um, so, so it'd be easier in, in a sort of more interactive setting, but you know, to, to start with, you know, curious, you know, we've all seen pictures like this uh, from papers, like which system is better? Um, which which state estimate is better? Is it the, you know, the, the green is the ground truth? Like is it the the pink, the red, the blue? Um, well, you know, it, we can see that you know they all sort of start out okay, but then this pink line sort of diverges. Um, the red line sort of gets a little bit further, but then then sort of falls off. Um, you know, which, which system's better? Well, I'd argue this is a little bit of an ill-posed system uh, question in, in large part, because one, you need way more data to answer. Like these could all be the exact same algorithm with just slightly different initialization conditions. Um, I think, you know, many of us have seen that the, these sorts of algorithms can be brittle um, and, you know, small, small perturbations can result in, in very large uh, behavior changes. In addition, it, the question of better for what, um, and you know, in, in a lot of ways, the, the end use case is is one of the most important questions when when thinking about these systems. Um, for for some use cases, um, the the different trade offs implicit that resulted in the the different performance of, of these systems may provide vastly different actual performance for for end users. And I, you know, I think that's that's one thing that it is is a I think can often be missing um, when, when people are working on things in isolation in academia is that, you know, you don't really think about for what, um, what is the system being used for? 
Um, and that's really important because, you know, at the end of the day, you need to balance system level trade-offs when, when making a, when making an overall system or actually using the output of state estimation. So, you know, from a research perspective, state estimation is interesting. You can work on it. Um, but for the most part, state estimation, state estimation is an input to in a broader system. And especially in robotics, um, you know, that that's often how the, the, the robot can, can understand and think about the world and, and move. Um, so, you know, when, when you think about balancing system trade-offs, like, you know, there, there's a number of things that you need to, to consider. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but, you know, like what states are you optimizing for? Uh, in the last talk, uh, John was just talking about sort of optimizing for, for the time synchronization, um, number of features, the minimum allowable feature quality. So, you know, when, if you let really, really sort of weak features into your state estimate, that, that can cause extra drift, that can cause uh, other errors. But at the same time, if, if you, it's, if you don't allow features in, then you may be in a situation where, where you don't have enough information to keep uh, estimating. Uh, is there a question? Nope, sorry. Um, and, and oftentimes, so, you know, you, you end up having to sort of trade off the, the speed and efficiency versus accuracy um, or drift rate uh, and robustness. So, you know, a, a lot of academia focuses on accuracy um, and, you know, I think that that's in large part because it's sort of an easy to measure, uh, an easy to measure quantity, or not that easy, but um, rel relatively easily easy. Um, but in, in practice, I, you know, I think it, for a lot of use cases, it, it, it may not matter as much as people, people think. Um, so, you know, sort of broken down, you know, some different categories and, you know, I'm, I'm certainly biased as, um, you know, drones, that I think, live off here on, on the right in terms of prioritizing robustness. Um, but, you know, if you think of photogrammetry that tends to be offline um, and the goal is to make as, as accurate and, and uh, realistic of, of a digital twin of the, the real world as possible. And so, you know, in general, you know, pull out all the stops to, to make things accurate. Uh, for AR and VR, um, you know, they, they tend to make somewhat different trade-offs than that um, efficiency ends up being really important, um, especially if you have like a head mounted product, you need incredibly uh, low power um, to, to sort of operate with a battery powered device, um, you need low latency. And you know, it, because it's a person looking at it and people are really, really good at um, noticing any sort of jitter or, or imperfections, um, accuracy is incredibly important. Um, and at the same time, you know, like, to make a product, it needs to be a, a given level of robustness, but the the downsides of your state estimation failing is that you know your your virtual teapot um, jiggles around a little bit, or you know it's it's not that bad. So you know, in general, those systems can be tend to be optimized for accuracy over robustness. Um, whereas on, for for drones, um, you know, if if your state estimate fails, uh, the vehicle is likely to crash, and that that has some some pretty significant implications for when you're thinking about the the trade-offs um, that you can make and sort of what that what that means in in the real world um, so you know for a lot of systems um, you know compute availability is is kind of dictated by by hardware we've, we've heard that from a number of places but so you know th there's not that much you can do um, uh, but you know any, anything that you can do to sort of optimize the algorithms get get extract more out of uh, the budget that you have can can lead to sort of significant boosts in, in the the other axes um, and you know if you're using it for control you know I, I would argue that you know local coordinate frames can can go a really long way um, and the if you formulate the problem correctly um, you don't really need incredibly low drift rates for for a, a very large set of use cases, um, and you know you, if you try and make the system, you can tolerate up to you know even a couple percent of drift rate. You know that um, you know when we were looking at sort of dashboard previously, like you know everything's down at you know 0 0.1, 0 0.2 percent, and you know that's great. Um, but as as a robotic system, do you really care about 0.1 versus 0.2 percent? I would argue probably not. 
ne neither of them are drift free. So, you know, if you actually care about, you know, closing long loops and, and whatnot, you're, you're going to need a different, different algorithm. Um, and so, you know, if, if you formulate things correctly, you, you can really just sort of turn, turn the knob towards robustness. Um, and for drones, you can really ha never have too much robustness um, because um, you're operating in the real world and you know, the, the state estimation is the, the underpinning of, of everything that, that lives downstream from that. And so, um, and you know, your users are gonna um, throw shit like this at you or um, you know, they're just out for a, a nice, nice skateboard. Um, admittedly, this isn't the most, most challenging for state estimation, um, but you know, users are gonna be completely oblivious to the challenges of a robotic system operating in the real world. Um, and you, know, you need the system to, to react and, and operate effectively. So this is an extreme example. Um, you know, there's uh, certainly an element of luck um, in, in some of these near misses, but uh, um, does speak to what, uh, what one needs to deal with in, in the real world. Um, and so, you know, when, when you're thinking about uh, making an a autonomous system that's relying on, on sort of cameras, you, you really need to sort of uh, think about the, the extremes. Um, so, you know, they'll, the customer will quickly gain kind of unconditional trust and, and push every limit that, that you, you may have in the system. Um, there's very few semantic priors that, that you can rely on. Um, it may fly everywhere from a jungle to a factory to mountain city center. Um, and you know, state estimation is, is the sort of the, the, the foundation upon which sort of all higher level autonomy can, can really rest. Um, and so you know, if that fails, the robot will either crash or, or fly away and then crash. Um, and so you need, to, you need to sort of tackle that, that daunting set of, of challenges and um, try and build a, a system that, that is as, as robust as, as you possibly can. Um, so, you know, these are, these are some of the sort of uh, core challenges. So, you know, sun glare, thin branches, stuff that's really close to the camera, stuff that's really far from the camera, um, large, large fractions of the scene that are moving, reflections. Um, many of these are, are, are sort of somewhat open, open challenges still, I think, you know, especially like reflective surfaces um, are incredibly hard and really require um, handling and with at a, at a higher level than the, the pure geometric reasoning that, that's often um, part of uh, robotic systems today. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a brief sampling of the, the types of considerations that one needs to think about when, when trying to make a product that, that's out there and operating in the real world. Um, and, you know, as, as mentioned, you know, state estimation is, is at the, the heart of that. So, you know, in, in our uh, vehicles, we have a, a visual inertial odometry system that, you know, operates on the, the six fisheye rolling shutter cameras. Um, and we uh, jointly optimized a, a, a lot of states of, of the vehicle to, to get to a, um, the, the system that works as well as we can. And you know, in the bottom right, you know, this is an, another example of an extremely challenging uh, environment with where the, the vehicle is operating literally inside of a bridge. You know, certainly can't rely on GPS, um, it's pretty dark. It's really confined um, and uh, has a lot of smooth and reflective surfaces. Um, so, you know, at a high level, you know, the, the visual inertial odometry problem is is pretty standard. You know, it, it's not that different from approaches that um, you know we've we've heard a, a lot about in in talks today, um, and one of the the, the keys are, are really in sort of how do you optimize it for, for the system? Um, so, you know, in our case, we optimize for extreme robustness and speed. Um, in our system, we, we obviously are optimizing for the position orientation velocity. Um, biases of, of the IMUs and, and sensors are, are incredibly important, um, but also the, the camera calibrations are, are incredibly important to, to get right. 
Um, and for each of these, there, you know, there is a key trade-off in terms of accuracy versus robustness. Um, anytime you add a state to your, your filter, you um, in, are, are making a trade-off depending on sort of how often that, that state is to change um, and how well you're able to estimate it. Um, obviously, there's a computational constraint, but there's also the constraint about um, a, a constraint on whether uh, you have enough motion, what the what the filter will do when uh, when that uh, state is uncertain. Looks like there's a question in the chat. Nope. Um, so you know, one of the questions is you know, like in in our system, we we uh, do everything, in, including lens intrinsics. Uh, you know, certainly that wasn't something that had really even crossed my mind um, in, in academia. But uh, um, you know, in, as we saw in, in certain situations, the the estimates that our, our system was providing um, were were sort of failing in, in sort of weird ways. And as as we dug in, we noticed that um, it the intrinsic calibrations were were actually changing. Um, so you know this is a it, this is a little gift that shows uh, one of our drones, uh, the cameras on one of our drones in a in a temperature chamber and uh, recording data as we change the the temperature from um, a, across the range. And as you can see on the top right, like there there's a pretty significant uh, number of pixels of motion. Um, and if you don't account for that, your your estimates are going to be uh, be wrong in in sort of subtle and, and unfortunate ways. Um, so in order to, um, you know, get the level of estimates, we, we have to, um, estimate everything, including the, the lens and trings that's online. And to some extent, it, it's, it's pretty amazing that, um, all of these states are sort of jointly observable and, and resolvable, um, in, in sort of real world flight. Um, another, another sort of core challenge that, we, we've tackled is, is sort of handling rolling shutter. Um, you know, when in Skydio R1, we, we use a global shutter sensors and in a lot of ways they, they make many problems easier, but at the big cost of, you know, size, weight and, and pixel performance. So um, rolling shutter pixels can be dr drastically smaller and, and higher performing than their global shutter comparisons. So at the camera and then at the, the drone level, you get, a, a much, much higher quality image. Um, if you can use a, a rolling shutter sensor, the, the downside is that the, the geometry of the scene becomes, or the geometry of the problem becomes a little bit more challenging. Um, and you have to sort of reason about that um, as the drone is, is moving quickly and, um, and, and close to things. So um, in, the, in the bottom right, you know, this is a, a gift sort of visualizing the, the impact of, of rolling shutter through an exposure period of, of our sensor. So, you know, white is, is sort of positive um, pixel motion, black is negative pixel motion. And so, you know, you can see that over the, over a frame, um, I, I forget what, what sort of speeds and whatnot, but this isn't that extreme. Um, there's, there's really non-trivial uh, pixel motion that if you don't account for can provide um, non-trivial errors within the system. So, um, you know, the, the only real solution is, is you know, making, the, making the choice to sort of carefully carefully model that and, and do that in a way that counts for both the, the translation and the rotation of the vehicle. Um, and, you know, accurate time synchronization is, is really key here. Um, if, you're, if you don't have properly synchronized cameras and, and triggers uh, or camera, and, and I'm used, then you know that that information won't line up and, and will be really hard to reason about. So um, you know we uh, have the benefit of being able to sort of take advantage of, of hardware synchronization, but even with hardware synchronization, as Jonathan was talking about earlier, there's there's a little bit more that you have to do to um, truly get things to to line up and and handle be handled appropriately. Um, moving objects are are another um, core challenge and. Honestly, this is an area that I think is, is still a, a relatively open um, challenge. I think you know, Luca's, uh, Luca's presentation earlier was incredibly interesting. Um, and I think is, is starting to scratch the surface about 
how do we how do we as as roboticists like really handle the the dynamics of the world um, for for most you know slam and and Vin systems you you make a static world assumption and you assume that that everything that's moving you you can just throw throw away well what do you do in a scene that where most of the scene is moving um, in this case you know the boat is probably the the best feature you have but it's definitely moving the water is down below it is moving um, you know, and as a person, you know, if your person was flying FPV, uh, they, they're certainly going to have a very drifty state estimate, but, but you can still get some information about how the vehicle is moving through the world, um, by the, the visual information there. And so, um, figuring out the, the right ways to, to formulate that and, and, and leverage the, the visual information that is there with. Uh, along with sort of the semantics understanding of the world is is a really key and an important problem, and I you know I think is is a really exciting area for an, an open area for for ongoing research. Um, fortunately, in, in areas like this, there's also um, other sensing modalities such as GPS that one can rely on, um, and you know when considering everything jointly, you can uh, make make systems that that work well together. Um, so uh, another sort of key challenge um, is that, you know, if there is a trajectory, a pathological trajectory for your system, your, your users will find it. So on the right here, we have uh, an example, of, you know, this is an, sort of an, an interesting scenario from um, a, a couple of years ago now where uh, our, our testing team took, was taking vehicles out to just do a, a sort of quick, quick test flight on them. Um, on a on a pre-planned sort of route at our, our test site, and um, all of a sudden we we started seeing these, these failures. So you know the, they would take off at this point here, they would sort of wander walk along here, and and then the vehicle would just sort of you know the the status would would fail and the vehicle would land over that pink X. And you now we we had one instance of this, and we we're like, huh, that's weird. Uh, maybe it was a hardware issue, it was a new vehicle, it was a little bit unclear. Uh, and then we saw another vehicle and then we saw another and we're like, what is going on? Um, and we, 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 you know, initially jumped to, well, there must've been a, a software regression, something, something must've jumped into the code to, um, to, to be causing this. Um, you know, we'd been, this was a very easy scenario. There were, you know, it was at slow speeds. It was um, plenty of texture in, in the environment and um, good features and, um, you know, we had done tens of thousands of much more, much more challenging flights that uh, previously, and this this shouldn't have been a problem. Um, so, you know, we assumed it was a regression. We we dug in. We we went back to sort of a you know previous uh, software release. We ran on those logs, and same thing happened. And and you know, it was, it was very reproducible in in the logs. Um, and it turns out that you know what 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 was going on there was that. There was a, a sort of a bug in the consistency properties of, of our uh, algorithm at the time where uh, it was choosing a, a linearization point uh, slightly incorrectly. Um, and that was allowing, uh, causing the, you know, the exacerbated by the fact that, you know, this seemingly easy trajectory, you know, went roughly straight for a while and then took a sharp turn. Um, and just, you know, th there was a, this, a, um, property of our system that was lurking under the hood um, that we hadn't seen in, in the sort of tens of thousands of flights that we had done previously, um, but showed up uh, in in this scenario. So, um, you know, and to, to some extent, the, the solutions here is, you know, I think, I, to be honest, when uh, I, I used to sort of, admit, I think, underestimate the importance of some of the analyzing the observability and consistency consistency properties of, of the algorithms. Um, you know, it seemed like in a lot of cases, you can take some shortcuts that simplify things that reduce compute. Um, but what that leaves you with is that there will be these pathological trajectories that you know, a user will find um, that can, can cause the system to fail if, if you're not careful about that. Um, and you know, uh, in addition, you just need to make sure you have lots of testing um, if you're trying to make a, a, a product to, um, to, to exercise and, and have confidence that 
you've, you've fleshed out as, as many of these types of, of quirks and problems as, as you can. Um, and that takes a, a lot of systems infrastructure. So you know, at Skydia, we're, we're really lucky to have the, the resources of a team uh, working on, on, on towards the core problems that, that allows us to invest a lot in systems infrastructure for both uh, efficient compute um, and, and um, libraries to make the, the development and implementation of our algorithms uh, correct and, and efficient, uh, as well as tr a tremendous amount of, of data that is from our internal testing and, and external testing that um, we, we can use to, to validate our, our algorithm. So we have a logbook that stores the, um, you know, that pretty much every flight that we, we've ever done internally um, and allows us to, you know, if we make changes to core systems such as state estimation, uh, we can rerun on um, hundreds or thousands of logs to, to make sure that we didn't, didn't change something in, in an unforeseen way that causes some of the older uh, an older uh, system to fail. And, you know, when, when making, making changes to the system, we, we need to evaluate across a very large number of, of scenarios to, um, for fix one problem, we may introduce another. And it, it's, it's a delicate balance game of really, really making sure that the, the system as a whole is, is robust. Um, and that being said, you know, as, as good as, as we, we try and make it, um, you know, intelligent error handling is an incredibly important part of making a robust and reliable product. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's a really difficult challenge. And I, you know, I think is often, you know, especially in academia, sort of an under, underappreciated part of um, the making robotic systems. Um, and honestly, you know, the sort of intelligent error handling and graceful degradation is what separates demos from, from real products. You, you have to get, get that right and, and have to think about the failure cases and, and make sure that when they do fail, that um, you, you try and fail gracefully. Um, that's especially true in the case of, of the state estimation and BIO. Um, and I think it, it, this is uh, another uh, kind of open question in, in terms of uh, how, how this should be done appropriately. So, and this image on the right, like, you know, your users are going to throw shit like that at you where, um, you know, it, it's basically dark. There's like a few point light sources and they're going to say, why isn't the system working? Um, and, you know, if, if you naively just sort of, you know, run your, your VINs algorithm, um, it's probably going to do something. It, it's going to try and um, try and estimate a state estimate, but it, it's probably not going to be very successful. Um, and you know, in a lot of ways, that's often because the algorithms are usually designed around success. They they try and you know optimize the the data that you give them. Um, and failure is not really obvious. Like you know, there's there's probably some some subset of the features that it you know can reject and and find a, a sort of you know, if you're using ransack or, or whatever, like it'll find some subset of features that are self consistent, and it'll you know twist the, the calibrations or biases around such that it can, can get a state estimate and you know, it, it'll sort of keep trucking and it'll be really unhappy or it'll be really unhealthy. Um, but uh, it, it would blindly be, be trying to estimate the, the state in, in this scene. Um, and if you're, if you're relying on it for control, that, that's really bad. Um, uh, so, you know, to, to really get to a reliable system, you, you need advance notice of impending failure. You need to, you can't wait until your, um, your, your VIN system is, is saying that, you know, the, the vehicle is, is traveling at, you know, a million meters per second. Um, and so, you know, in the case that, and the reason why you need that in, uh, notice of impending failure is that, such that you can do something about it. So in the case of, you know, if it is getting too dark and you need to increase your exposure times and that's gonna cause motion blur, well, you know, you can, you can try and have the vehicle slow down to, to minimize some of that. Um, or you can try and switch to other sensing modalities if, if they're available. Um, or finally, you know, the, the system needs to get down to the ground as fast as possible um, in order to not do a, a very high powered uh, control, uh, have the controller trying to track that, you know, completely bogus state estimation failure. Um, and so, you know, this is a really hard problem. 
Um, and, you know, I think you know, we, we've invested a, a lot of time in, in understanding the, the sort of the robustness properties and the, the ways that our algorithms fail. And I think is, is you know, I think this is more of a, a call to um, thinking about it and, and thinking about it clearly in, in the sort of research community. Um, you know, you, there's things you can leverage in terms of the in, internal algorithm metrics, priors about what the, what the system's capable of, um, optimization residual statistics features, semantics about the environment. Um, there, there's a, a really large number of features, but there, there's a really core and important underlying decision problem that needs to get made about uh, in order for making a decision about whether the, the system is working correctly or not. Um, and, you know, if you have a false negative, that's really bad. If you have false positive, that, that's bad. Um, and if you are late in detecting a failure, um, that's basically a false negative. Um, and so it's, it's really important to, to get that, that combination of, of understanding and, and the behavior of, of your algorithms correctly. And I think, you know, more, more so than, um, you know, pushing down the, at least for, you know, algorithms that are targeted towards being able to use for, for local state estimation, which most sort of visual odometry systems are, I would argue should be um, for at least, you know, ones that don't try and do loop closure and other higher level mapping. Um, it, you know, it's it, these sorts of properties of, of the system and how gracefully will they fail? How easily is it to, to detect when they are failing? Um, and how robust are they uh, when, when given sort of very poor quality data that I think is um, an, an incredibly important and an open question. So um, we, we certainly don't have all, all the answers here, um, but uh, um, I, I think there's, uh, we've, we've taken a, a pretty strong stab at it in, internally. And I think there's, there's a lot of really open and interesting research to be done here. Um, so with that, you know, I'd, I'd like to sort of switch gears a little bit um, and talk about sort of a different use case. Um, you know, I think this this highlights this is a, a our 3D scan system is something that we're we're building on top of the, the core autonomy, um, and I think is a good example of a very different sort of system level trade off that one might make that steers a little bit away from the you know robustness at all cost to you know really caring about sort of local consistency and whatnot. So. Um, 3D scan is, is, a, is a new product that, that we've been working on and we're, we're really excited about. The um, uh, goal is to be able to enable autonomous capture of digital imagery for 3D reconstruction. So uh, enabling inspection and, and building digital models of, of the real world. Um, and you know, the, the sort of key thing that, that our system can do is to um, uh, explore and, and, and ensure coverage with superhuman precision. Um, and make sure that the, the drone is able to capture the, the right data um, to, to facilitate uh, a, a good reconstruction after the fact. Um, and you know, it's really important to think about this in, in a very general way because you know, there, there's an incredibly broad array of things that people need to inspect on a regular basis. So everything from house rooftops and entire houses to transmission towers, transmission lines, dams, um, you name it, there's, there's an incredibly broad and varied array of critical infrastructure that, that we need to inspect as, as a society. Um, and drones are an incredibly powerful tool. Um, and the, the key is to make that efficient and, and scalable and, and easy. Um, and you know, generality is, is key given the, the broad set of things that we need to inspect. So the, the general workflow that, that uh, we, we try and enable with, with 3D scan is to basically allow an operator to choose an operating volume, set a few parameters such as you know, what mode they're in, how, the desired ground sampling distance, basically resolution of the model that they're looking for, um, overlap percentage between photos, which is um, important for downstream processing, and then hit go and, and watch the, the vehicle sit back and um, what just happened? Uh, sit back and, and relax and um, and uh, capture the, the data that they need. Um, so, you know, as, as part of that, um, we this is a sort of visualization of some of the in-app UI. 
Um, so uh, it's it's really important to think about things in a in a more global sense. So you know earlier when I was talking about the um, you know being able to handle a, a couple percent of drift rate um, in in a world where you're trying to build a consistent map and explore and inspect and use that map to draw this sort of AR visualization, you have very different system level constraints in, in terms of how you would think about your your state estimate, and it becomes really important to think about um, local consistency, closing loops, and and you make very different trade-offs. Um, and that's that's been really exciting to explore and figure out how we can do that in the constrained computational budget of, of, of our drones and, and enable um, a, a level of utility for, for our end users that, that's really powerful. Um, so, you know, the, the sort of core here is um, a sort of combination of a, a real-time structure for motion algorithm that builds on top of our um, online state estimation system, um, a real-time uh, 3D mapping uh, engine, and then a, a, a planner that uh, allows us to iteratively uh, compute optimal, or not optimal, but good paths um, that uh, paint the, the surface with, with imagery um, in order to ensure uh, correct construction. So um, you know, as I mentioned, so, you know, instead of just sort of the incremental online, um, uh, more conventional VIO system, we, we need to uh, make sure that we, uh, we minimize drift and, and we, we sort of are, do that by sort of more explicitly closing the loop between uh, a map and, and our state estimate in, in real time. Um, and the, you know, the keys here to doing that efficiently um, is to leverage our online system where possible um, and, and make sure that we can uh, leverage the fact that we control the flight paths and capture and, and sort of the shared deep learning core. So we're not doing duplicate work, but we're still able to lift up to a, a higher level view and make sure that we, we get good data. Um, so you know, an example of the, the level of capture that we're able to get. Um, so this was a uh, mute that um, a fully automated scan of uh, an incredibly complicated, um, uh, I think, semiconductor facility. Um, so this is the flipping back and back and forth between the the, um, the live data that the vehicle was capturing and the the three D model that comes out after. So I have to note that you know Skydio is not. Uh, using a, a third-party tool to build that model, but being able to uh, have the vehicle go in and automatic, automatically generate data of sufficient quality to make a reconstruction of, of this level is, is really powerful and, and really exciting. Um, I'll skip past this in the interest of time. Um, and with that, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave you, you know, we're, we're hiring. Um, there's an incredibly broad array of really exciting and interesting challenges that uh, we need to solve. We're pretty firmly, firm believers that, you know, as, as exciting as, as the products are, we're, we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. And, you know, as, as more and more of the intelligence and capability of real systems uh, transitions from, from research into the real world, we want to be at the forefront of that and, and leveraging and enabling that in, in real products, which, which is a lot of fun. Um, so with that, I'll open up to, to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abe. Uh, really interesting. Um, I, I, I would love to ask a lot of technical questions. I'm, I'm sure you cannot go into <laughs> algorithmic details though. But, but mm -hmm. in, the, in the chat, we have one question by Yulin. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting to find that temperature will affect the camera. Will both the camera distortion parameter and projection? Um, so, um, in, in the most general sense, that all of the um, all of the sort of camera parameters will will matter. Um, we'll, we'll, sorry, will will change with temperature, and, and to some extent, it'll depend on the lens design. Um, that when designing a, a sort of camera lens, that that is often one of the things that lens designers uh, optimize for is temperature stability. Um, but uh, the primary thing that we've seen is is focal length. That that changes. Um, let me see. Um, 
The 360 degree coverage, is this more important than overlapping views, which can provide depth information? Um, so uh, we, we have the luxury of having both 360 and stereo in, in most directions. Um, they're both really useful. So, you know, as anybody that's worked on uh, VIN system knows, like one of the most challenging uh, things to deal with is uh, not having enough field of view to, to have a visually rich environment. And so by seeing in all, um, in all directions, you, you reduce the number of situations that uh, you're, you're in that. So um, from a purely monocular perspective, you know, really big fields of view are, are really helpful. Um, it, but depth is, is also a, a useful thing that you can rely on to, to make things more robust when, when ob objects are within the sort of the, the range what your stereo base, baseline enables. Um, so next question there was, what do you use as ground truth in your regression testing and metrics evaluation? Do you care about what affects the end user? So um, it's, it's a really good, good question. And there, there's no one answer there. I think, you know, the, at the most, the highest level, um, the, the sort of metrics that we care about are a uh, number of flights or situations where the state estimate fails completely. Um, and by fails completely, you know, you can define that in, in a number of different ways. Um, but oftentimes that means that the motion estimated by the algorithm diverges from, from the real world and by, in ways that, you know, is, is outside of an, an allowable drift rate. Um, in situations where you have GPS, you can compare against GPS. Um, situations where you sort of come back to, you have non fiducials you can compare against that. Um, but oftentimes it, it's mostly just, uh, you know, you can rely on sort of user or tester feedback to, to get that, that sort of manual annotation and then, then dive in and run offline algorithms, online algorithms and versus your online algorithms and, and dive in, dive in deeper there to get an understanding. And, you know, it, it really is, you know, pouring over hundreds, thousands of flights to make sure that you, you are getting statistics at, at the right scale um, because you know drift rate on a single log is isn't that meaningful. All right, thank you. So in in the interest of time, we should move on to the next talk. Uh, there's still a few questions in the chat. Maybe you can answer. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to, and, to do that. Um, uh, the, the YouTube one, I can copy back to there, the answer. Great, great. thank you very much. Thank you so much, it was great having you. And so our next speaker, Zhao Guo, can you please uh, share slides? Great. Okay, so let me do a quick intro here. Uh, Zhao Guo is um, a tech lead manager at Google. Uh, he got his PhD in 2016 when Sturgeus uh, Sturgeus um, and he did his master's and undergraduate at Zhejiang University. Um, so he will talk about winds on unknown devices today. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Michael. Uh, I imagine everybody can see my slides, right? Uh, uh, slide okay, show. My name is, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Chao Guo. I work on AR at Google. Uh, today I'm going to talk about winds on unknown devices. Uh, I guess the first question is why do we need to run VINs on unknown devices? Uh, I will say as long as you are interested in developing a generalized VINs system, you may not know the device information where this system will be run on. Uh, but in particular, today I want to talk about ARCOR. So ARCOR is Google's platform for building AR experiences on Android, and it currently supports more than 900 million Android devices. Uh, VINs is a key tag there. So why running these on air call? It's so challenging. Uh, why is that unknown devices? So first of all, we have very limited access to device information. Uh, we don't really know the sensor model. For example, does the device have an autofocus? Uh, we don't have direct access to the uh, sensor calibrations. And also, these Android devices are not made for running these. 
honestly, and you typically see a lot of uh, data quality issues. Uh, just as a simple example, if there is some inaccuracy in camera image timestamps, it's not going to affect too many other use cases, but for beans, it's a big issue. Uh, another category of challenges is around, again, the diversity of Android systems. There are very different sensing capabilities, very different processing powers. Air call have many use, uh, different use cases. Uh, today, I'm going to first do a very short introduction of AR Core, and then I will focus more on how to enable wins on AR Core devices. Uh, so, what is AR Core? AR Core is a AR, AR platform for Android that seamlessly blend virtual object and the physical world. So, that allows you to develop a AR experience through Android devices. Uh, to introduce several key capabilities uh, coming from Beans. Uh, first thing is six of motion tracking and plane finding. Uh, once you have Beans running, you will also have a point cloud of the surroundings. You get planes from there. You can put virtual object on these planes. This is a fundamental technology for the immersive AR experience. Uh, next thing, cloud anchor. Mm. For Beans, we also have mapping. You can save these map, maps and then you share with your friends. You reuse it in the next session, becomes a persistent map. Steps from motion. Uh, with Beans, you, also, you get motion tracking, then you get the point cloud. You can also generate steps from the point cloud. Um, one great use case is shown here about occlusion. So from the red image, you can see we have the correct occlusion on the cat. So you see the cat is put behind the pillows. Uh, next thing, 3D image tracking. This is a combination of beans and also image tracking technology. Uh, you can see the augmented content is first put according to the image, but then when the uh, user moves their devices, they are still tracked and uh, word locked in the scene. So that's where beans show the power. Okay, uh, so those are more like uh, uh, fundamental capabilities. I want to show some concrete examples uh, about the use cases. So this is a use case got mentioned at Google's I.O. It's an AR SDT in search. Uh, in terms of uh, perception, you can see you first swing your phone, you get means running, you get plans, and then you uh, put an isolate on that location and they, they can show the activities. Mm, so I think one interesting thing to point out here is the best means system for such scenario would be something to rely on a local map because you kind of move your device in front of a fixed local area. Uh, I mentioned this because in the next use case, you probably can see a pretty big difference on what could be an ideal system, ideal means system. So here is another key feature, uh, AR in maps. I showed three use cases. First one is orientation to landmarks. Uh, so here you pretty much only need a three dot orientation estimator. And the second one is AR walking navigation. Uh, you see uh, from AR content pointing you to the destination. The interesting difference here is if you never get lost, you probably will not revisit a previous area and you will keep walking. So building up a local map it's not really helpful here because you're not going to see the map again. So here's the more important thing for being system is, is more around robustness, so you never got, got lost. Uh, another thing is for this scenario, you can leverage a lot from other information in addition to camera and MU. So for outdoors, you have GPS, you also have street view maps. And then to the third uh, scenario for AR in maps, this is a indoor navigation scenarios where you may not have very reliable GPS. You may not have street view data coverage, but then you need to uh, rely a lot on the means accuracy itself, plus some indoor mapping systems. Uh, after talking about these uh, concrete examples, I want to come back to our main theme today. So what's needed for running means when we say means it's visual initial navigation, but the data you need is a lot more than, than just the camera images and MU data. 
So uh, I put them under three categories. The first one is sensor model. Uh, what's the distortion model? Is that a rolling shutter, global shutter? Does it have an autofocus OIS? So these are the factors you do not have direct access. Uh, the second category is uh, sensor calibrations. I'm sure people are pretty familiar with different camera and, camera and annual uh, calibration parameters. The third important factor is data quality. So is the data good enough for running in this? Um, I think people already talk a lot about getting timestamps, but here is also about exposure time. And if we go into more details, does the device report exposure time before the image timestamping or after the image timestamping? So it's a, a subscription and a addition difference. Uh, a lot of other factors, if you really don't know the device much, how, how big is image blurring is when you start to move your device. Uh, when you go from a dark area to a bright area, is the image uh, quality still good enough for doing feature processing? Uh, I want to highlight another very interesting behavior we found on IMU. Uh, so for some IMU manufacturers, they want to do uh, kind of auto stationary period detection. If you put the IMU down, for example, it detect the viruses and automatically subtract that from the data they send to you. Uh, this is pretty probably good for some uh, other use cases, but for beans, we do properly measure uh, viruses and everything for IMU. If we get those filtered data, that's not great for running this. Uh, so you can see there are at least 20, 30 other informations we need to uh, we need for running this. Um, then I think the next interesting, the next two interesting questions are. So first of all, do we need all this information? Are they all equally important? So, and the second question would be, are they really available? Can we find all the available information? Uh, in terms of importance, uh, I think we can classify them into roughly two categories. One is uh, necessary or critical information for running beans. If you don't have them, uh, your beans can get really fragile. Uh, the second category can be good to have. Uh, some information, if you have, you will improve the precision, but if you don't have this one, you, uh, you will not have more continuous uh, means failures. From uh, another direction, the level of availability, uh, there are some information you can find by running these, right? And people already talk about calibration parameters, for example, but there are also other parameters you don't find without special user movement or special hardware. So for example, you may need a calibration target for doing particular uh, camera calibrations. So we can use this quadrant between importance and availability to classify uh, each device information required for running beans. Uh, ideally, we want to find all the necessary information and as much good to have information as possible. Uh, I guess today I'm not going to cover how we find all these information but I'm going to pick some examples uh, for each category. And then I will do a uh, deep dive into one area where we do uh, calibration because calibration is both important and there are literatures about how to get them uh, online. So the key there is how do we get it correctly? Uh, the first example I'm putting here is a camera model. So obviously that's pretty important. If you look at the original image versus the correct image, there's a huge difference. You don't have the camera model. Um, you pretty much not really can use the uh, camera image as well. So there can be facial distortion models, radio distortion models, and many other different models. So these are the things without a calibration target, it's very difficult to find online. You may be able to find the parameters, but first you need to know uh, what's the distortion model here. Uh, there's another thing uh, about uh, AF and OIS. AF represent autofocus. Uh, so this is um, the camera used to um, get good quality images when the uh, scene moves from far away to close by. So it adjusts the camera focus automatically. Uh, similarly, optical image stabilizer is also used to improve uh, the image quality. So when the device starts to move, it stabilizes the image. So you get a bit better image quality. Is that the camera center will change at the runtime. 
So if you're developing your system in a way that it can take varying uh, camera focus and varying camera center, it should be fun when the device has two, these two uh, mechanisms. You just need to use a correct camera center and correct focal lens. But here I want to give a bit more uh, details on an interesting fact, uh, what's called open loop controller. So this is about, even let's say I lock my camera lens and then ideally without the scene change, the camera focus should not change, right? But if it's an open loop controlled autofocus, uh, you can see in this video, the scene doesn't really change. But when you start to move the camera, the focus changes a lot because it's a loop open loop controller. Uh, and the lens could be driven by external forces. Uh, without special hardware, it's probably not easy to detect this problem and the severity of this problem. But let's say if you can detect it and you know the severity, you can relatively easy to model it by using the uh, external forces measured by MU. Uh, this is another example, uh, MU characterization. I have put uh, MU measurement model there. I think people already uh, went over it a lot. I just briefly go over it again. So AM is a measured accelerometer measurement. It equals to A, the real accelerometer minus the local gravity, G plus the accelerometer bias plus the noise. And then uh, the accelerometer bias is modeled at a random walk with a sigma and W A. Similarly, uh, the rotational velocity omega m measurement equals to the real uh, omega plus the bars plus nr, the so measurement noise. And the bars is, is also modeled as a random walk nw. So these are the parameters that are very difficult to find from the background. So one way to find these values is you just uh, leave the devices there for one hour or half an hour, and then you get to the PSD to find some modeling there. But let's say if the user just start to use uh, to run the on their devices, it's very difficult to find them out from the background. But on the other hand, uh, oh, another thing to mention here is a maximum minimal sensor readings. Um, you need somebody to uh, move the devices very fast to find the maximum and minimal sensor readings. It can be 4G, 4 gravity, for example, 16 gravity. Uh, these are things probably not easy to find from at the runtime without user involvement, but uh, it's as a, as a, um, critical information. I think they are probably not. If you have a correct annual characterization, definitely improves your precision. But let's say you just use some generalized values here. It's probably not going to make your wind system much more fragile. Uh, this is another example for into a different category, the image pixel noises. So there are literatures about how you can find them from even a single image, right? So they are available, but how important are they? So for winds, so most modern cameras have pretty standard pixel noise range. Let's say you can set it to be one pixel. Um, even if you don't have the real pixel noise for this device, it may not completely destroy your wind system. It may it will in, uh, affect your accuracy for sure. Um, both camera pixel noises and the annual characterization sigmas, uh, we can think of them as um, weights to compare, uh, to weight against, to weight uh, initial measurements against visual measurements. So when you don't have accurate weights, you don't have the best estimation, but that doesn't necessarily mean you will have a much more fragile wind system. Okay. So this is a topic I want to deep, uh, deep dive today. Uh, I think several presenters already mentioned similar topics about calibrations. Uh, I'm put, I have camera intrinsics, MU intrinsic, MU camera extrinsics, and time synchronization here. Um, there are already a lot of literatures on how you can compute them uh, together with beans in either a EKF framework or uh, optimization-based framework. Uh, so I won't go into details. Um, I think many people are already very familiar on how these are done, just at a very high level. Mm, you put them uh, in your camera imagine model or annual propagation model, and then you run your, run your estimator. You also compute 
the values of these calibration parameters. Uh, so for camera intrinsic, it's a, I'm not, I, I don't have distortion here just for synthetic, but for focal lens and camera, it's uh, parameters to project from pixel values to 3D positions up to scale. Uh, MU intrinsics, uh, just to use uh, omega m, rotation velocity as an example, it equals to uh, scale, uh, SG0, SG1, SG2, and misalignment MG0, MG1, MG2 times the real uh, omega. So the diagonal values represent the scale and the uh, off diagonal values, they are the coupling between the three axes of the real rotation velocity data. Uh, I will not cover uh, the actual meter measurement. They, fall, they, they follow the same uh, strategy, except there is also a orientation between the actual meter and gyro, and we put it in front of the axle. Uh, there is also a new camera extrinsics, uh, which we can uh, project points from the camera frame to a new frame. Uh, these are all, cal all the calibration parameters we need for running means, and we can, at a high level, just put them together with a means tracking framework and assess them using uh, different estimators. But today I want to show a little bit, a little bit insight on how it works in practice. Ideally, as long as you have the good features, you satisfy the system observability, then you have rich motions, they should all work out beautifully. But in practice, it doesn't always work like that. Uh, let me take camera center uh, as one example. So this is a testing result from four different motions. So here the uh, dot lines are the error of estimated values of Cx and Cy, the x and y direction of camera center. Uh, and the solid lines represent the three sigma bond. Uh, you can see that from the beginning it's not really consistent. The errors are out of uh, three sigma bond. That's because in practice, you may not know the exact uh, calibration errors. So you set a relatively reasonable uh, initial uncertainty for your camera centers, but it's not like every device, so calibration errors will fall under that uh, uncertainty. Uh, so four different scenarios. One, the first one, I call it calibration motions. You can imagine that's the motion you do when you want to do a good sensor calibration. Uh, a lot of rotations, a lot of translations, seeing this uh, scene from different um, angles. Uh, the second one is uh, a scenario I want to first um, try a, a worse motion for sensor calibration and then go back to regular motions and see how does the calibration parameter change over these scenarios. Uh, the third one is large rotation, but these small baselines. Uh, so that's kind of a scenario where we can see how the translational related parameters converge. Uh, the fourth one is, uh, is another very simple motion. It's pure translation along a straight line. Uh, so camera center is what I can call it uh, orientational related parameters. So for any orientational measurements, it will have uh, camera centers inside. So relatively, they are more observable. So you can see these all these different motions, they all kind of converge in the end. But the convergence rate and how, how well they converge, there's a pretty big difference. For the calibration motions, you can see after 20 seconds, the calibration errors become subpixel. And after one minute or 100 seconds, the calibration of uh, the camera center errors becomes almost a zero. On contrary, for the second scenario, when you start to small rotations, so note at this point, you don't have good calibrations to run these. So things start to diverge. You can see the estimated camera center goes to negative values. And at the same time, your covariance doesn't really decrease over time. When you transfer back to regular motions, it starts to converge better, but still in the end, you have relatively large uh, calibration errors. Uh, let me show another example about the focal lens convergence. Uh, with the same motions, they are the same data, just an uh, observation of different calibration parameters. Uh, 
let's start from cali uh, calibration motion. Uh, it's focalized. I think I can call it a translational related uh, parameters that in general less observable. Even with these good motions, you can see they do not really convert that fast. Uh, but in that, still converges to a very good value. Uh, just throw some of my <laughs> insights there may not be scientifically correct, but for the calibration parameters, if they could not convert very well into the true values, that also means probably that they are less important for running a high quality beans because of the system observability. If you start to have large reproduction errors introduced by these calibration parameters, for example, they will get corrected faster. Uh, as a comparison, if you look at the second scenario, you first do small rotations and then you do regular motions. So this is a very bad uh, online calibration section, I would say. The Fx and the Fy, uh, the focal lines along two different directions, they don't even convert to the same value. But we know in practice, they are usually very close. So we can pretty easily say this is a very bad resulting calibration. Uh, okay, if you look at the other two, uh, the focal lines convergence, still they are, they kind of, they can work, but not greatly as camera centers. Uh, so what's the instead here? So when we run, we, when we run beans on AR call, we couldn't control how users use it. And we also don't have all the device information. We couldn't say if you do calibration motion, we can get all the calibration parameters uh, very well in a very short period of time. So the strategy would be to take whatever data that's available and get the best use of that. Uh, some things we can do to improve the um, uh, uh, online calibration quality. Um, so just for one example, if you run one regular ETF in this scenario, because the initial covariance is large, you see a lot of uh, vibration of the camera center point estimate. And in the end, it doesn't convert to the best value. Uh, as a comparison, if you run a Schmidt command filter at the beginning, uh, just to uh, give a little bit of context on Schmidt command filter, uh, it's a common filter that you do not estimate the state and covariance for a subset of your state vector, but you still keep track of the cross correlation between this subset and of state and other states. So it's uh, still a consistent estimator, but you do not change the estimate and the covariance in this case for camera centers. So that's why for the first, I would say 38 seconds, there's no change on the camera center estimate. And after that, because other parameters get converged better, and then we start to estimate camera centers, you see the convergence is much better following this approach. Uh, so this is just um, some thoughts on what kind of estimator options you can use to potentially improve your calibration quality. Uh, to show some examples so we can get a sense on how well it works. Uh, this is a data set I put an Android robot on the table and I start to move around. You can notice that after this, only I would say five, 10 seconds motion because you do not have great calibration. There's a pretty big jump of this Android robot. This is because we have we were building a map on that table. Uh, there were accumulated tracking errors on the way. And then we, when we come back, we look at the same table, that error got corrected. So also the error got corrected in the end, but having this jump of the Android is not the best scenario we want to show. Uh, so as a comparison, so this is on the same data set, but we enabled the camera and MU online calibration. You can see that after this motion, there is no under the robot jump. So the anchor is pretty stable after this motion. Okay, what's the insight here, just as a conclusion? Mm -hmm. So first of all, under good scenarios, good means it's good for calibration. You have good features, you have good sensor motions, right? Your, your win system doesn't diverge for this run. Uh, we can see that the calibration parameters 
converge very fast and they converge to good values. But under more challenging scenarios, uh, the calibration parameters may still converge, but they may converge to local minima. What it means is they may not be the correct calibration values for that device. Uh, the third insight, uh, it seems like it always improves the tracking quality while well, it requires very limited uh, actual processing. This may be a little bit controversial. Uh, I want to give a bit more details. Uh, so when, again, in this lens estimator, we are minimize the uh, cost function from the camera reflection errors and also the MU propagation model. Uh, if you do not have a, even if you have a good motion, you can also use uh, this custom to optimize for your calibration parameters and you get a good calibration parameter. And also, obviously, together you get a good uh, motion tracking. But let's say this is not uh, the best scenario for doing calibration. But still, you are minimizing your cost function. And estimating the calibration parameters together will give you give the system more flexibility to adjust it to yourself. So in the end, you still get a smaller cost function. Although you may not get the best calibration parameters, but the errors may compensate between each other. So for example, the focal lens error may be compensated for. Uh, from some uh, annual camera extrinsic translation. But in the end, a lot of times we still see a better tracking quality. Uh, request limited processing. Um, there, there isn't that many calibration parameters. Adding that state vectors into our system typically doesn't change the processing cost a lot. Uh, in particular for a real system, the bigger processing cost is probably coming from opening the camera to capture images, feature processing, uh, mapping by time. So adding this little cost for calibration isn't really that big of a cost. Uh, so, and then the next question would be how to identify high quality calibrations. So until now we have been mainly observing how calibration converges in a single session, right? But if we can identify that this is a high quality calibration, we can use it in future. In particular, even let's say for good calibration sessions, it takes time for the calibration parameters to converge. But if you already have a good calibration state, you give a great means tracking from the beginning of the session. Uh, these are the factors impacting uh, calibration convergence. Uh, just to clarify, these are just some examples. Uh, they are not supposed to be comprehensive. Uh, so first of all, device motion. That's from the system observability. If you do not have any rotation around different axes, for example, you cannot get the action C calibration. Second one is the environment. You need a lot of features. Uh, theoretical number requirement may be much smaller, but in practice, the more the better. And you want features to be close by, so you get translational information. You don't want features to be very far away from you. So you will only get the orientational information. Uh, the third one is how Venus estimator works. I put two examples there. So left one, you can see that uh, the state and the covariance converge is pretty well, and the state estimator is pretty stable over time. On the right example, you can see a lot of changes on the state estimator, and the covariance doesn't really converge. Uh, also seems like the right one won't give you a great calibration. But these are all heuristics, right? How to implement a reliable uh, calibration qualification module from these um, heuristics. Um, there are a lot of literature literatures about that, and I won't talk into too much details about the best way to do it. But I want to give several directions that we have been thinking uh, all that has been published in the literature. One is a threat holding method. Um, you can just set a threat hold on each factor. And then you say this calibration is good if all the requirements are satisfied. So this method is relatively reliable, right? If you already have a threshold to say this session, you'll have enough lines, you have enough motion, a lot of features, tracking uh, works great. There's a very high chance you get a good calibration. And there's also, so this method has a, also a very low processing cost. In implementation, pretty much you have a sequence of if conditions. Uh, what's the cons? First of all, it's very difficult to find a proper threshold for so many factors, uh, especially if you consider AR call has so many different devices, very different calibration errors, very different sensing capabilities. 
uh, very different scenarios, how do you find a proper threshold for each single device? That's not easy. Uh, secondly, you cannot consider the combination of different factors. So you have a, a threshold on each single factor uh, separately. Uh, another way to do it is you can train an ML model to give a score on the computed calibration. Uh, you can have a time window of all the factors you believe that's important for calibration quality, and then we send them to a neural network, and the neural network gave us a score on how good is this calibration. Uh, there are certain pros of this method. First of all, it automatically set a select a threshold. You don't need to manually set threshold. Everything is in the network. Uh, also, it considers a combination of all factors together. Uh, the important, most important thing I would say is I provide a score instead of a yes no decision to the calibration quality. Uh, that gives you a confidence of this calibration, not only a yes no. Uh, I will talk about why this is very useful also later. Uh, several obvious cons. Uh, it requires very large training data. I mentioned different calibration errors, sensor quality. There may be even difference between what sensors are used for beans single camera, multiple camera, that's step sensors. And also very different running scenarios. We talked about the ideal system for AR SVT search and the ideal system for AR in maps. Probably can be a very, two very different systems. Uh, difficult to maintain, still be new device models uh, involving in use cases. And if you develop your means algorithm, uh, you are using the internal signals like covariance data and other things in this training model. So you, if your wind system has changed, then you also need to update this training model. So the maintenance cost is not very low. Uh, the third aspect is it also could be expensive. It depends on how you want to do it. If you want to use a very long time window, a lot of uh, different factors, it could be very expensive. Uh, we discussed about two directions. Uh, again, I probably won't uh, give a judgment call on which one is the best a lot of literatures on both of them. Uh, I want to briefly mention several other challenges I haven't got a chance to talk about, but very interesting problems. The first one is refine sensor calibrations over time. So until now, I talk about how do you uh, see the calibration conversions in a single session, and then you do a qualification of a calibration, that calibration to say it's good or not. But in practice, you actually want to refine this sensor calibration over time. Every time this device got to use, you want to get a better cal calibration. So to do that, you need a very reliable calibration score. So you just forgot, even let's say this is a good calibration, but you want to know if it's better or worse than another good calibration. Uh, the second problem is how to detect outdated or wrong calibrations. Uh, so no win system is perfect. There are singular cases, corner cases, uh, even with great calibration, your wins can have failures. So it's interesting and difficult to find out when these tracking failures are caused by sensor calibrations. So for example, you may not have a great moving object detection system and a huge moving object breaks your system. But how do you know if that's not because of your bad calibration? Uh, another thing is uh, identify permanent calibration changes from short-term calibration changes. Uh, the previous presenter already mentioned that thermal effect can change calibrations a lot, for example, the camera calibrations. How do you consider that versus something really happened, a firmware update or a sensor breakage that really changed the calibration? A uh, third interesting problem here is could we find the calibration for a device model? Uh, so for some, uh, let's say, uh, for a new device model, there may be thousands of or millions of users, right? Do we want to do calibration for each single one and then do them uh, independently? Or there's a way that we can do a federated learning by using data from all devices in the same model and then get a great calibration from that. So then the next, when the next user opens their new devices, they already get a good calibration to start with. Uh, I think these are new and challenging, uh, new challenges very interesting. Uh, to account. Okay, to ramp up in summary, uh, today I talked about AR call, beans for AR call. I went over the device and data information required for beans. I talked about calibration, calibration convergence, calibration qualification. 
and future challenges. Uh, I'm happy to take more questions if there's. Thanks. Great, thanks so much. Um, we do have uh, a question from the chat here. Um, uh, I, I see some questions I'm reading. So yeah, the, fir the first one is, uh, could you provide uh, in some example metrics which could be used to evaluate the quality of the calibration results? Uh, and they say that they, they would think that some possible examples um, might be using scores coming from NES or a covariance matrix, uh, but these are typically not possible if you don't have a ground truth. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you don't have a ground truth, you can use, uh, and also uh, it's not a scenario, you already know everything else. You have a consistent estimator, you know all the sensor information. This is a mean system that runs, but is many unknowns. So that's why we are applying a lot of purely heuristics on how good it is, is a covariance convergence, how well is the state estimate convergence. So instead of directly using NES these values. Great, we have another question. I agree, there is no great uh, ground truth information. So for most of yeah. the AR core devices, nobody has a ground truth uh, calibration information. Uh, just to throw another perspective here, there is also a user privacy issue where the academia uh, folks care less about, but uh, you're not allowed to really track the calibration for each single device because that could be uh, identifiable information for that device. Another question is from Yulin is, what's the high level idea on how to model the autofocus slash, I think uh, optical image stabilization Yep. And uh, and additionally, uh, in uh, the camera intrinsic simulation, is it true that fx is equal to fy? Focal lengths. Yeah, so for, for the first question, <clears throat> um, Android actually has an API to tell your focal lengths, for example. If that one works, you may not really need to model a real autofocus. Uh, autofocus is a controlled mechanism, right? You control the lens to compensate for uh, device motions and both uh, far or close by scenes. So ideally you get those information. If you do not get this information, you can also use online calibration to try to compensate for the changes in focal lens and camera center. But this could be very difficult because they can change very largely. So focal lens can change 50, 100 pixels uh, of, uh, of, uh, from a VGA image. So that's going to be challenging. Uh, but this is slightly different from the open loop problem I described. For that one, you could use, uh, you could model the external forces and use that to compensate for the changes. Uh, in the camera intrinsic simulation, it's true FX equals to true FY. I, I, <laughs> I'm not an expert on that, but I believe when those cameras are made, ideally FX should be equal to FY. And in practice, usually they are very close for modeling cameras. Uh, next question, what do you mean by saying uh, center point are rotational variables and focal lens uh, uh, translational variables to be taught? Could you please clarify a bit more? That's a great question. Uh, so these are just uh, heuristics. So uh, to, give a, to give some uh, thoughts there, if there are calibration parameters that will affect your orientational measurement, those are things that's relatively easy to obtain because when you measure the camera measurement, you get orientations. But sometimes you need to move your device to, to have translations and to measure the translation towards a um, camera measurement. That's where we call the translational related variables. Uh, next question, would it work to modify uh, internal structure inside the phone to apply autocollimeter or text like this down from I think that's an interesting question, but again, I'm not an expert on that. Um, I would say that's obviously possible, but probably more from the phone manufacturer, not from, uh, for example, Google, who makes Android software platform. How is the convergence of the distortion parameters calibr uh, calibration? That's, an, that's a great question. I haven't found any um, system observation analysis of calibration parameters. 
um, I think it's difficult. I've been doing calibration, uh, system observation analysis a lot myself back in PG study. But I also realized in that for calibration uh, distortion parameters can be challenging. In practice, I have seen that the biggest um, distortion parameters actually could be estimated online without a calibration target. But there is no theoretical guarantee. Those are just uh, empirical uh, values. Sweet. Um, we need to move on for the sake of time. If you could uh, answer the questions through the chat, that'd be wonderful. Um, next up, we have the, uh, the paper presentation sections. Um, so, uh, yes. uh, so there were seven papers uh, accepted. Um, the first one up is uh, iCalib. Uh, so if you could uh, share your screen, I will uh, unmute you. And each one of these presentations is 10 minutes. Hard deadline or hard, hard stop there. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, there's a bit of an echo, but uh, yeah, go ahead. Go share your screen though. Uh, we, we don't hear anything if uh, if you're trying to share the sound of this video. Oh. If you if you want me to play it, I, I can just play it. Okay, so so maybe you can play. I can't okay. find the the button. Okay. Hello, this is Yu Yang. My topic. Is I caliber? You guys are able to hear that, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hello, this is Yu Ling Yang. My topic is I caliber, inertial aided multi sensor calibration. This is a collaboration of University of Delaware, Army Research Lab, and Zhejiang University. Autonomous robots are equipped with multi heterogeneous sensors like the IMU, camera, LIDAR, and wheel encoder. When the robots are exploring the environments, the camera will be used to get images. LIDAR will be used to get a sparse point cloud. IMU and wheel encoder will be used to get high-frequency pulse estimate. In order to achieve this, we need the both spatial and temporal calibration of these sensors. The spatial calibration refers to the radio transformation between these sensors. The time ball calibration refers to align the timeline of sensor, LIDAR, camera, and wheel to a timeline of IMU. There are quite a few work on multi-sensor calibration. For example, Caliber. Caliber can perform only IMU camera calibration. Cam Adult Cal, MSG Cal, and Lead Caliber. They are optimization-based algorithms, but they are only for single pair calibration. No time of set calibration is performed for these two box. Mimic, Leak Fusion, and Vivo, they are filter-based method. They only perform online calibration to improve pulse estimation. However, iCaliber, iCaliber can perform all spatial tempo caliber calibration for all of these sensors. So we have two contributions. The first is we design iCaliber, an initial calibration toolbox that can handle a sooner's IMU, multi-cameras, LIDAR, and wheel encoder. 
we all study the determined motion for more recent calibration. Besides, we also investigate to use kinematics or bonding policies based on interpolation to handle external signals, more sensor measurements. Why we are called iCalibre? Because we use inertial information to build the pulse backbone for the graph. We first integrate the base IMU at the camera frequency to build up the, the base VR graph. After that, we will collect the odometry readings between IMU polys and integrate them to build the odometry edge. When the camera observes the point landmarks, the image pixel edge will be added. When LIDAR observes the plane features, the LIDAR edge will be added. Whenever we add the odometry edge, camera edge, and LIDAR edge, the calibration will be involved. So for this graph, we can see that we will optimize all the historical IMU policies, all the features, and all the calibrations. The IMU state include the IMU orientation, IMU position, IMU velocity, and all the biases. For features, it includes all the points and all the planes. For caliber, it includes all the camera states, liner, and wheel calibration. We want to uh, point out that for the calibration, it includes both the spatial calibration and also the time of flight. How to handle a similar sensor measurements? And our solution is linear interpolation. For example, for poles uh, at T0 and T1, the camera measurement happens at TS in order to relate the camera measurements uh, to the state of T0 and T1. We will first approximate the trajectory between T0 and T1 with the linear model, which assume the omega and V is constant. Then we find the corresponding IMU policies at TS. In this way, we can find the interpolated rotation and the position. We can see that uh, to find the omega and V is the key for the linear pose interpolation. How to find them? The conventional way is to use the bonding policies. We can use the bonding orientation, compute the omega, the bonding position, compute the V. Another way is, since we are using IMU, we can get omega and V from the IMU estimates. With the linear relation, we can add uh, a signal sensor measurements to a graph. For IMU, we can build the pre-integration cost based on uh, ACI square. For camera, we can build the image projection cost based on open winds. For LIDAR, we can build the point to plane cost from leak fusion to point zero. For wheel, we can build the 2D odometry integration cost from vivo. With all these costs, we can optimize the graph to get the best estimate of the calibration. In order to work on our system, we first design a simulation. We simulate one IMU, three camera, one LIDAR and one wheel recorder in a structural environments. We both, we both simulate 3D motion and 2D planar motions. All spatial tempo and intrinsic parameters are involved in the calibration. We want to point out that for all the sensors, they are designed with different frequencies and different time offset. We can see that under 3D motion, all the calibration the camera calibration, light calibration, and wheel encoder calibration can converge nicely. However, in 2D planar motion, the calibration might fail. For example, the IMU cam translation. Sometimes the uncertainty and estimate errors is not improved at all. Similar case uh, will happen for IMU light calibration and IMU wheel calibration. We further evaluate our system with real-world experiments on JECO. The JECO is equipped uh, with multiple sensors like one LiDAR, one IMU, one wheel encoder, and three cameras. We first perform IMU with three cameras for calibration. All spatial tempo can converge. And we convey our results with caliber 
and the caliber results is very similar to our results. We perform IMU camera LIDAR calibration. So IMU LIDAR calibration converges and our results is similar to the results we get from MSD call. We finally perform IMU cam wheel calibration. However, the IMU wheel calibration can work quite slow. So this is something we need to improve in the near future. Based on eye caliber, we also realize multi-visual immersion calibration, which can handle multi-asynchronous IMUs. And all IMU spatial temple and intrinsic parameters are calibrated. We all study the dynamic motions for multi IMU calibration. We perform two experiments, one based on max string IMU, the other based on real sense with a, with a low end IMU. We can easily see that the max string IMU has a much better accuracy than the real sense IMU. In summary, we design I caliber, a multi single calibration framework which can handle multiple IMUs, multiple gyros multiple ham cameras, LIDAR, and a wheel with both spatial temple calibrations. Uh, we all studied the different motions for modern system calibration. Both simulation and real world are used to evaluate our system. In the future, uh, we will investigate camera calibration and constraint motions and improve the wheel encoder calibration. Thanks. Great. Uh, the next paper is entitled RISE, Real-Time Iterative Scheme for Estimation Applied to Visual Inertial Odometry. Uh, I believe, Philip, you're here. Go ahead and share yes. your screen if, uh, if you're going to present it live. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. Um, so this, can you see my screen? Yep. Looks good. Okay. All good. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for the introduction. Hi, I'm Philip. I'm from the Robotics and Perception Group from Zurich, led by Professor Skaramutza. And I'm going to present RISE, our real-time iteration scheme for estimation. So as we have heard today, uh, state-of-the-art visual inertial autometry has come a long way. And actually, Bayesian estimation using nonlinear optimizations has proven to be an accurate robust and versatile approach for mobile robots. In our applications, we deploy drones for search and rescue scenarios, and lately also for drone racing. There, we need fast, agile, and precise drone flight. However, mobile robots, especially aerial vehicles, often undergo strict size and weight constraints. And this in turn also often limits their compute capabilities. On such limited uh, compute, accurate sliding window estimators are often restricted to low update rates and significant latency, as we have shown in our VIO benchmark from ICRA 2018. For a robot navigating the real world, this often means deteriorate control performance. And in the most extreme case, it can even jeopardize robustness in fast and agile flight scenarios. State-of-the-art vision-based drones have to trade off speed and agility against accuracy. <coughs> These state-of-the-art approaches can roughly be ordered by estimate quality and their computational demand in terms of latency. We can start with the very simple approaches using common filters and then the extended common filter, followed by its iterative variation as it is used for Rovio, for example. Um, we then arrive at the multi-state constraint common filter um, implementations from Murikis or Patrick Geneva. And just after that, we arrive at the sliding window uh, based estimators, which are the first nonlinear optimization based approaches. And on the other extreme, we also have the global optimization problem, for example, for structure from motion. However, not all of those approaches are relevant for a mobile robot. Often, we do not care about a global map or absolute accuracy, and actually, 
local consistency and environment relative precision is much more important. If my robot travels for one kilometer and then it misses a window by one meter, it has crashed, no matter whether it had 1% drift or less than that. Furthermore, filters, uh, sorry, our goal is to um, use these versatile, uh, our goal is to use the versatile sliding window estimator, but reduce its latency and increase its update rate um, to make it better suited for fast and agile mobile robots. Filters, when compared to nonlinear optimizations, have some disadvantages. Filters use fixed linearization points, which are typically given by a prediction which is not at the optimum. They perform complete marginalization of the past variables, and they are constrained to add measurements in temporal order. However, filters are computationally extremely efficient. On the other hand, nonlinear optimizations use repeated linearization given by the best belief of a state estimate, which typically converges towards the optimum. They allow arbitrary variable marginalization, and they give us a, a large amount of flexibility in residual formulation. However, they are computationally very demanding. State-of-the-art approaches often treat the optimization as a single closed update step in their pipeline, only after which an updated estimate becomes available. However, a numerical optimization consists of many iterations. These iterations refine the best belief of a state until the convergence criterion is met. Waiting for this convergence actually introduces latency until the next state estimate. Now, we propose a very simple little change inspired from the real-time iteration scheme applied in model predictive control. The only change is that we want to use each estimate after each iteration. This does not only uh, in, improve our up frequency of the state estimate, it lowers the latency tremendously and trades it off against the uh, um, against, uh, converging uh, accuracy of the state estimate. This means that we can basically trade off the computational time which we invest into optimizing a narrow state and therefore the latency against the asymptotically converging accuracy. For a robot, this also means that the subsequent systems can run at the higher update rate and with much lower reaction time. What's more is we do not have to wait for the optimization to converge before we can add new measurements. This means we can, for example, exploit high frame rates to have a high frequency residual update, giving us very good initializations and convergence properties for our optimization. We apply this to the visual inertial odometry problem by estimating camera poses, IMU velocities, and biases in a sliding window together with landmark positions. As measurements, we use the feature tracks, pre integrated IMU samples completed by some prior information. All of this we optimize using a Lindbergh Marquardt solver scheme. We evaluated our approach on some simulation experiments where we simulate feature tracks and IMU samples. And these perfect measurements we corrupt with noise, bias, occlusions, timestamp chitter, etc. We run our approach on 20 predefined and random trajectories at speeds varying from 2 up to 30 meters per second. Our preliminary key findings are that compared to the classic solving up to convergence, RISE can reduce latency in our VIO problem by up to a factor of nine, bringing it down to only a few milliseconds. This allows RISE to run and exploit higher frame rates, which reduces failure cases and increases robustness of the estimator. Furthermore, it allows RISE to optimize bigger state spaces, where we can, for example, incorporate up to 50% more features, again, increasing robustness and also accuracy. Uh, 
If you want to see the detailed numbers on our 20 trajectory evaluations, including latency, accuracy, etc., please check out the paper uh, hosted on the workshop webpage and later also on our archive. Thank you very much for your attention, and then I open to questions. Sweet, thank you. Uh, if people do have questions, you know, put that in the chat. Uh, but uh, we are going to move on to the next presentation, uh, which is for the paper Redesigning SLAM for Arbitrary Multi-Camera Systems. And go ahead and uh, share your screen uh, when you're ready, if you are going to present this live. Yeah, um, I hope you can see my screen and hear my voice properly. Yep, yep. Okay. Um, thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you everyone for attending the presentation. Good, good evening, good afternoon to all. Um, I am Manasi, and uh, I am presenting uh, this paper on redesigning SLAM for arbitrary multi-camera systems. And I'm a PhD student uh, at the Robotics and Perception Group. So we know in real world vision systems, um, often we use multi -ca multiple cameras for ro increasing the robustness. Examples such as AR, VR headsets, autonomous drones, and cars. However, adding more cameras greatly complicates the design of vision algorithms. In this work, we aim at designing a general SLAM system that adapts to arbitrary multi-camera systems. We want our system to be fully generic and require no tuning or code modification, even when the co camera configurations are very different. To this end, we revisit some of the common SLAM building blocks and propose several novel designs, including an adaptive initialization scheme, an information theoretic keyframe selection method, and a voxel-based map. As shown in the video, with our contributions, the resulting SLAM system can adapt to different cameras automatically and with no manual adjustment in the code or the parameters. Our adaptive initialization scheme determines the most suitable initialization method for the camera system. For any two cameras, we sample the frustum of the camera and project the sample points in the other camera and determine whether the camera should be triangulated directly or initialized separately. This method generalizes to arbitrary camera models and frustum shapes. Moreover, this process needs to be computed only once offline. In keyframe-based SLAM, a keyframe is selected when the map is not sufficient for tracking. New landmarks are then triangulated at new keyframes. This standard approach is used, uh, is, is used to uh, in a combination of heuristics as keyframe selection criteria. This approach is typically not easy to tune and does not generalize to multiple cameras since the heuristics such as the number of tracked features and the camera motion are very specific to the setup. Instead, we propose to use the localization uncertainty with respect to the current map as the only criteria. Here we plot the negative localization uncertainty with respect to time. As we can see, when the localization quality drops below the threshold that is estimated online, we select a new keyframe and the localization quality increases. Our method directly characterizes the localization quality and therefore does not depend on camera specific heuristics. In the tracking of the current frame, one of the standard practices is to select, is to collect all the landmarks from the overlapping keyframes and try to match them in the current frame. And with more cameras, sorry, these landmarks are not necessarily visible in the current frame. And with more cameras, this approach quickly gets complicated and inefficient. How can we do better? Let's forget about the keyframes. In our voxel-based map, we discretize the space in voxels And, the, and to get the visible landmarks from the voxels, we directly select the voxels that appear in the camera field of view. 
the query of the voxels is done efficiently via voxel hashing. Since our method works directly with the 3D space, it is independent of the camera configurations as well. In this video, we can see that with the overlapping keyframes shown on the left, the retrieve landmarks are distributed in a much larger area than the camera field of view. And with our method, we retrieve only the points that are visible in the camera frustrant precisely. Now let's see how the voxel map works. The map is stored as a hash table. Each entry in the hash table points to an allocated voxel. The voxel data structure contains its position and a list of points that fall within its volume. These voxels are accessed using a hashing function. The goal of voxel hashing is to manage 3D points efficiently and in a constant time, regardless of the map size. Since voxels are just containers for the 3D points, modifying the information in the voxel is trivial. A necessary function in the tracking in SLAM is to query the points that are possibly visible in the current frame. Recasting-based mapped query geometrically guarantees query points to be in the camera field of view. We directly sample the frustum in a recasting manner as follows. First, we sample pixels from a regular grid on the image plane. Their back, their back, projected, uh, the, their back projection creates rays originating from the camera center passing through the pixel. For each ray, we sample points along a depth range. This is done in the camera frame and is pre-computed offline. At query time, we use the prior on the camera pose to transform the sample points to the world frame. At these locations, if a voxel exists, point in the voxel is considered as visible, uh, are considered as visible points. We integrated the three modules presented in a state-of-the-art visual inertial SLAM pipeline and tested on various camera configurations, including standard monocular and stereo setups, different combinations of them, and multiple fisheye stereo pairs. We validated that the proposed approach generalizes to all these camera configurations with similar performance to the original pipeline on the standard monocular and stereo cameras. More importantly, our pipeline is fully generic. We can use the same parameters and code for all the camera uh, combinations. In this video, we show the performance of our pipeline on three fisheye stereo pairs mounted on a car. As we can see, our pipeline handles the information from all the cameras simultaneously to provide a reliable motion estimation. To summarize, we propose several novel designs of the common SLAM building blocks, which prefer principled method over heuristics. The result is a generic SLAM pipeline that works for arbitrary multiple camera systems without any need for camera specific tuning or code modification. We believe our method can greatly simplify the current design paradigm of SLAM and is a valuable step towards a universal SLAM system. I thank you for your attention and you can find the details in the paper which is hosted on the, web, on the workshop website and as well on the RPG website. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, for people that do have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. Uh, the next paper is entitled Periodic Slam using cyclic constraints to improve the performance of visual inertial slam on legged robots. Go ahead when you're ready. Great, can you all hear me? Awesome, uh, thank you guys so much for organizing this workshop. Um, yeah, today we're gonna be talking about uh, periodic slam um, and my name is Hans and I'll be presenting uh, with one of my peers, Joe. And here are emails if you have questions afterwards. Oops. Okay, so starting with some motivation. Um, so kind of our work in this paper focuses on dealing uh, with visual slam in scenarios that are kind of shown in this video where we have highly dynamic motion on legged robots so we see that um, even some state-of-the-art algorithms, so here we have ORB slam, can easily be induced to fail when we have fast camera pitching movements. Oops. 
Um, so motivated to solve this problem, we look to kind of take advantage of some of the underlying structure in the dynamics of robots. So um, on legged robots specifically, we, we have this periodic structure in the way uh, they locomote. Uh, so here I have a video of a hexapod robot, a six legged robot, and it's executing what's known as an alternating tripod gate where it moves three legs up and then three legs down and it kind of repeats this pattern. Um, so kind of the main hypothesis of our work is, can we leverage this periodic structure to um, improve slam performance um, in really dynamic scenarios? So in the next few slides, I'm gonna show a schematic to kind of illustrate our idea. Um, so here we have kind of this periodically pitching dog-like robot um, that's going up and down. And um, our method says that instead of trying to do the front end of slam uh, sequentially uh, between um, successive uh, dogs in this picture, uh, what if we did it periodically? So what if we kind of had different slam sessions for when the robot was looking upwards and for when the robot was looking downwards? And then what if we connected these different visual slam sessions with inertial constraints? And um, connecting all this together, uh, we could maybe um, use kind of this multi-session slam to do uh, slam on a single periodic robot. Cool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the effects of dynamic motion on existing state-of-the-art SLAM uh, methods. So the methods that we chose to compare against were VINS Fusion, MSCKF, VIO, and Orb SLAM 2, which we chose to represent a variety of different front-end, back-end, and sensor configuration combinations. So for some initial tests, we decided to just create this simplified uh, environment in Gazebo. Um, with this long hallway with intentionally a lot of features on it. And instead of using the complicated dynamics of a legged robot, uh, we're just using a wheeled robot with some joints used uh, that we selected to try to mimic the sort of motion that we would expect from a legged robot going through a more dynamic gate. And so for that uh, 10 meter hallway, uh, we performed 50 trials at a variety of frequencies. So going through that same sort of pitching motion, just at uh, different rates of pitching from 0.125 Hertz to 2.5 Hertz. And we considered it a failure if the absolute trajectory error uh, exceeded 0.5 meters or about 5% of the total trajectory. Uh, and as you can see on these graphs, as we get towards those higher gate frequencies, uh, all of these existing methods uh, start to fail. Uh, towards those higher uh, dynamic scenarios. And so um, we're sort of looking at what it is that's causing that to be the case. And it seems like it's mostly uh, feature tracking where in these very slow uh, dyna dynamic scenarios, we can see that almost every feature from one frame uh, is uh, tracked to the next frame and we're able to get a correspondence. But then as we get to these more and more dynamic uh, higher frequencies, uh, there's fewer and fewer um, correspondences uh, detected where that's where at this 1.25 Hertz, that's where some of them are still succeeding. Some of them are, are starting to fail. And then at the very fastest, which was the right end of those graphs, uh, there's no feature tracking whatsoever, even if uh, the, top, uh, fr uh, the top of the first frame might share some features with the bottom of the next frame, uh, there's no detection of that. Great. Um, thanks, Joe. So motivated to kind of solve this problem of um, inconsistent feature tracking at higher gate frequencies, um, our method tries to, instead of tracking uh, features uh, kind of sequentially, tracking them periodically and really utilizing this periodic structure that we know about a priori. Um, so to do that, we perform visual slam on different portions of the gate cycle. So um, while we, this can really be extended to any number of uh, slam sessions, uh, here we show how we might have three different slam sessions running at once. Um, one kind of mapping uh, while the robot is looking upwards, one while it's looking in the middle, kind of one while it's looking down. And we can connect these different slam sessions with um, inertial measurements with an IMU. Um, we can take this problem and put it on a factor graph. Um, so here we can see uh, this periodic factor graph where we have um, different states which represent the pose of the robot at some time i. Um, and as uh, we go around, around this factor graph in circles, um, each circle represents kind of a gate cycle for the robot. Um, and each spoke of this uh, factor graph represents um, states that are, uh, that are located at a similar gate phase. 
So um, they could be when, you know, the robot's looking downwards. And these are the spoke, these, the states located at the spoke are the ones we want to do visual, um, visual feature matching across. And, you know, likewise, we can introduce um, landmarks and make this a slam problem. Um, and here we show how we can have different landmarks for each different portion of the robot's gate cycle. Um, yeah. Um, and kind of here's some, you know, math behind it, but uh, this boils down to a maximum a posteriori optimization problem where we're optimizing the um, product, all these different factors, a visual inertial and a prior factor. Um, in this video, we kind of show a result of our uh, method working in a simulated environment. So the same simulated environment that Joe talked about, we have this pitching robot going um, up and down on, and um, we, have, we can see how it's mapping three different portions of the robot's gate cycle separately. Um, so each, the color of the landmark um, represents which part of the robot's gate cycle it was observed in. Um, and combining um, all these different sessions together, we're able to jointly create this map of the environment and also estimate the robot's trajectory shown in green. Um, yeah. Um, and here's kind of a summary of our method, but basically we took what was otherwise kind of a sequential factor graph and we um, introduced the structure, this periodic structure to the problem. And we were able to separate landmarks out uh, by uh, the portion of the gate cycle, which they were observed in. Cool. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, results that we got on a real world robot. Uh, for our data collection, we used a ghost robotics Minotaur uh, with a real sense camera that was giving us IMU data at 300 Hertz and global shutter stereo camera pairs at 30 Hertz. Uh, all the trials that I'm going to be discussing were captured in this motion capture area. And we added a little bit of tape design to the floor so that in these uh, more dynamic bounding gates, when a lot of the time the robot will be staring uh, pretty low at the ground, there would still be some features to track. So uh, all of the methods would at least have some chance at not uh, failing to uh, feature deprivation. So the first gate that we sort of use uh, is this easy walking gate where it's more or less just going forwards. There's a little bit of shaking from the legs hitting the ground, but it's not particularly dynamic. And in this case, we can see that all of the methods perform relatively similarly if periodic slam doesn't actually perform a little bit worse. But in more dynamic cases, um, such as bounding gates, uh, we can see that using these periodic constraints actually does improve the performance, where here we can see that the pink uh, track from periodic slam is significantly closer to the ground truth uh, in this bounding gate uh, than the state-of-the-art methods we're comparing against. And then just for good measure, uh, we ran it in the opposite direction, uh, basically the same sort of um, trial. And we can again see that periodic slam uh, is outperforming the other methods. And then just sort of to summarize all of these, we did multiple runs of each of them and we can see that uh, on average, periodic slam does about as well in the easy gates. Um, and then in these hard gates, it significantly outperforms uh, the other methods. Yeah. Um, so kind of just some future work for this. Um, you know, right now we're kind of hard coding that we have these three different slam sessions, but really we want a kind of smart way of determining the number and placement of different slam sessions. Um, the other thing is um, we believe that we can leverage periodicity to address other phenomena such as image blur and IMU saturation, which are big problems on legged robots. Um, so kind of if we know that we periodically are legs at the ground, we kind of know that we have this periodic IMU saturation that we can maybe take care of in a smart way. Um, the other thing is, you know, can we extend this method to non-periodic systems? Um, so anytime we really have a predictable change in viewpoint, can we leverage this predictableness to create another slam session and then do feature tracking within that session? Yeah, um, and with that, um, just some acknowledgements, but um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to hit us up in the emails that we have. Great, thank you. Uh, so the next paper is called DSEC, the Stereo Event Camera Dataset for Driving Scenarios. Uh, and go ahead and uh, share your screen and uh, start whenever you're ready.
Uh, I can't hear you. Give us the correct microphone. Uh, Oh, I hear paper. You can talk. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. So then let me go back quickly. Okay. Hopefully. Can you see this also? Yep. You're all good. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, today I'm going to briefly. Uh, give you an overview about uh, the dataset DSEC, uh, which is a fresh dataset data set about stereo event camera uh, for driving scenarios. So here you have a quick overview of DSEC. On the top left, you can see stereo event camera output. On the bottom left, global shutter stereo. And on the right hand side on the column, the LiDAR data that we also acquired for each camera type. So the distinctive feature of DSEC is the inclusion of stereo event camera data. Um, maybe briefly, why are we interested uh, in event cameras um, that we are featuring in this data set? So <laughs> if you don't know event cameras, they have um, very high temporal resolution and low latency. They have uh, limited to no motion blur, even in uh, difficult lightning conditions, and have a high dynamic range, often over 120 dB. And these kind of um, characteristics are um, relevant for autonomous driving and also for SLAM systems. Now, so now the question is, okay, why do we actually need this kind of data set? Um, you can see on the left hand side, the different data sets that are related to our data set, then the different specifications of frame cameras that are relevant and event camera as well as light and what kind of ground truth we have in this data set. So DSEC is our data set, and you can see that actually our data set is the only stereo data set with a wide baseline. So wide baseline is actually crucial for um, stereo matching in driving scenarios because you want to be able to see as far as possible. Then we are also the only ones we have um, which have global uh, stereo global shutter with color data, as well as three times higher resolution than the closest data set in this realm, which is EMISEC. And we believe to be the only data set with both accurate calibration and synchronization. <clears throat> so our data set uh, has some key components. So as I already mentioned, two event cameras with feature resolution. So this kind of a, a middle to higher range resolution for event cameras at the moment. We have two global shutter cameras at 20 hertz and a, a LiDAR with 16 scan lines. And we have both camera types uh, in a wide baseline stereo setup, and we also have RPK GPS that we collect. <laughs> and so finally, our data set um, consists of one hour of driving data set, mostly actually in Switzerland. Uh, so in mountain and urban environments, for example, uh, on this part, you can see the top left is the, is, uh, the area around Zurich and the top right is around, around central part of Switzerland where we drive in the mountains. Um, we have 53 sequences that are publicly available, uh, day and night sequences, also HDR scenes that you have seen actually at the beginning. And we provide uh, depth slash disparity ground truth from LiDAR data for this data set. And so I'm going to briefly talk about also how we acquired this data set, um, which might be interesting if you ever consider to also host a data set. And so one crucial aspect of uh, data set collection is hardware synchronization, especially you have different sensors that need to be synchronized. And so what we did, uh, we have a microcontroller that is uh, called MC here in the, in the central center of the image, and which sends trigger signals to the different cameras. Um, then this uh, microcontroller actually receives trigger signals from the GPS module, which is directly synchronizing with the LiDAR. So overall, this mic control combination with the GPS module allows us to associate the trigger timestamps with GPS timestamps, and therefore you're able to synchronize all data in post processing, which gives us um, microsecond accurate temporal synchronization. 
Then a crucial aspect of camera um, data sets is, uh, of course, calibration. And I'm going to briefly talk about camera to camera calibration. So this is actually not trivial in the case of event camera data because event camera you can see on the bottom left give you sparse information about illumination change in the scene. And this you cannot directly use to calibrate your camera. Therefore, what we did is we reconstruct an image. Therefore, we kind of synthesize a global shot image with a neural network uh, called e 2 bit And this image can then be used to do um, extrinsic and intrinsic calibration <coughs> between all camera pairs, um, uh, between all four cameras. And then finally, also camera to LiDAR calibration, because we want to be accurately registering the LiDAR point cloud to the um, stereo cameras. And how we do this is that we have um, we compute the point cloud from stereo matching using SGM in this case. Then we acquire the point cloud from the LiDAR system. And we, um, um, we compute the point to plane ICP, um, we use the point to plane ICP algorithm to optimize for the rotation only because the translational part we can easily get from the CAD model quite accurately. And this way we can actually do calibration very easily. Um, so I'm also going to quickly talk about disparity ground truth. So disparity slash uh, then, uh, depth, of course, if you're not intrinsic and extrinsic. So the objective of what we did with this data set first is to have as accurate and as dense ground truth for disparity as possible. And so how we do this is that we compute LIDAR to I, LIDAR IMU odometry and integrate this odometry over time. And then we create a dense point cloud. And this dense point cloud can then be used uh, to project it into the camera frames to get depth information. However, there are two problems with this approach. First, you introduce moving object artifacts because you integrate information over time. And also you have to deal with occluded points because again, you are integrating over time. And so uh, how we get rid of this is, um, so how do we resolve this problem? So first for removing moving objects, we compute the local depth map from LiDAR odometry, then the depth from stereo matching, again, using SGM, and then if, this local depth from, from LiDAR dormitory and from stereo matching disagree, we remove the points. And this you can see on the right hand side, you can see, for example, that the LiDAR, so the depth of this car that is moving here in front of the of uh, our car that is co collecting data has mostly been removed. Similarly, uh, this actually removes also occluded points. For example, here on the right side, you can see that um, we can successfully remove points to do this redundancy check. <clears throat> so finally, we also conduct a baseline experiment. So first we collect, um, we split the data set into training and test sequences, uh, 41 train and 12 test sequences. And then we train, uh, we implement a state-of-the-art event-based stereo network and train it for 200,000 iterations of the training set and then test on our test set. So what we look at is um, different error metrics, for example, the D1 and D2 error metric, which give you an idea about the percentage of pixels with disparity error higher than one or two. So the lower, the better. Then also the mean absolute and the root mean square of the disparity error. Um, and then also we have different areas in Switzerland. So Interlaken, Thun and Zurich City are just different parts of Switzerland and then different day times, so day, night, uh, and we compare that. So what we see in our uh, baseline experiments is that, as we would expect, right, higher errors of disparity during night. So you can see this highlighted in blue uh, in the table. Uh, this is to be expected because, as with any camera, the event camera is noisier if you have less light, um, for example, due to short noise. But what we also see is that uh, actually the approach is quite consistent over different environments uh, in Switzerland. And here finally you can see a short video. I hope you can see this video. On the top left, you can see um, the prediction of our baseline method. And on the bottom left, you can actually see a moving car approaching right now on the left. And the depth is still accurately predicted uh, in this data, uh, in this with this baseline model, or even though it was actually not trained on dynamic objects. 
And here's a prediction at night uh, where the prediction is also very good, even though uh, at night we have more noise. And so finally, um, if you're interested in this data set, I uh, urge you to visit our webpage, dsec.ifi.uch.ch. And I'm open to questions in the chat if you have any. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, the next paper is uh, entitled Tightly Coupled Fusion of Global Position Measurements in Optimization Based Visual Initial Odometry. I do see that you are here. Did you want to present it live? Or. Hi, Patrick. Yeah, did you want to, did you want to present it live or do you want me to play the video? No, you can play the video, please. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hold on. Okay. You guys should be able to hear this. Welcome to our presentation. My name is Giovanni Cioffi, and I'm going to present our work, Tidally Coupled Fusion of Global Positional Measurements in Optimization-Based Visual Inertial Odometry. Our research is motivated by the goal of achieving reliable and accurate state estimation in long-term autonomous navigation. Visual inertial odometry algorithms are locally accurate, but accumulate drift over time. As a consequence, global measurements are needed to achieve globally consistent estimates for long trajectories. In this work, we try to answer the question, how can we efficiently and accurately fuse global positional measurements in VIO? State-of-the-art methods rely on the loosely coupled approach. This means that the VIO algorithm estimates the relative pose updates independently of the global positional information. In this way, the correlations among all the measurements are automatically discarded, resulting in suboptimal results. We propose in this work an optimization-based tightly coupled approach, where the visual, inertial, and global positional measurements are jointly optimized in a slightly window containing the most recent keyframes. The proposed cost function contains four different types of residuals. They are the prior error obtained from the marginalization of the old states, the visual reprojection error, the inertial error, and the global positional error. To compute the inertial and global errors, we use the well-known AMI preintegration theory. The AMI preintegration theory allows us to save precious computational resources by removing the need of repropagating the states every time the linearization point changes during optimization. This is achieved by defining the pre-integration terms which describe the relative motion between two consecutive keyframes. They only depend on the AMIO measurements and biases. We exploit the recursive computation of the pre-integration terms in the derivation of the global positional residuals. The global positional residual is defined by propagating the state position using the initial measurement. We take advantage of the computation of the pre-integration terms. In fact, the term that appears in the global residual can be easily obtained during the recursive calculation of the pre-integration terms. The covariance of the global residual can be derived as the sum of the covariance of the initial measurements and the covariance of the global measurement. We refer to our paper for more detail. We evaluated the proposed method on two datasets. The first dataset is the UROC dataset, where we corrupted the ground truth measurement with zero mean Gaussian noise to simulate noisy global positional measurements. The table in this slide shows the absolute trajectory error achieved by the VIO only algorithm, that is, no global measurements are considered, the loosely coupled approach, and our proposed method with different values of n. n is the number of global positional residuals connected to each keyframe in the slightly window. Our tightly coupled approach outperforms the loosely coupled for any value of n. Increasing n till a certain limit helps to achieve lower translation and rotation error, as shown in the right plot of this slide. 
we define the processing time as the duration between the time at which the front end receives an image and the time at which its optimized pose is available from the sliding window optimization. Thanks to the efficient formulation of the global residuals, increasing the value of n only slightly affects the processing time. Our method outperforms the state-of-the-art loosely coupled on every sequence of the Euroc dataset. In particular, for the sequence shown on the current slide, the absolute trajectory error improves from 45% when n is equal to 1 to 68% when n is equal to 3 and 4. The second dataset used in our experiments contains three flight sequences from a UAV equipped with a GPS receiver. The table compares our method to the VIO only algorithm and two loosely coupled approaches in terms of position error. Our algorithm achieves lower position error than the state of the art loosely coupled approach. To conclude, we propose in this work a tightly coupled optimization based methodology to solve the multisensor fusion problem. The new cost function incorporates global positional residuals. We leverage the computation of the AMIOPRE integrated terms to efficiently compute such global residuals. Experimental results show that the proposed approach consistently outperforms the state of the art loosely coupled approach. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Great, thank you. Uh, if anybody has any questions about that, of course, put that in the chat. Uh, the final paper for today is entitled An Equivariant Filter for Visual Inertial Odometry. And uh, go ahead and share your screen and uh, go whenever you're ready. Right. All right. Are you able to see my screen? Yep. And it's a uh, full screen? Yep. Great. All right. So, um, Hi, everyone. Good evening for those of you in the States. Uh, my name is Peter Van Gogh, and I'll present to you today about the equivariant filter I've recently developed with my supervisor, Rob Marnie, for visual inertial odometry. So I won't introduce visual inertial odometry, <laughs> but I will introduce equivariant filters. Equivariant filtering um, comes from uh, applying two philosophies to filtering problems. The first is to respect system geometries, and the second is to find and exploit Lie group symmetries. So unlike traditional filter designs, such as the extended Kármán filter, the state of the observer does not lie on the state space. Instead, it lies on a symmetry group of the state space. And the goal of the filter design changes as well. Instead of trying to drive the estimated state to the true state, we try and we define an intrinsic geometric error and try to drive this to what we call the origin configuration. And if you read our paper, you'll see that this ultimately um, gives us an accurate estimate of the state as well. So what is the geometry of visual inertial odometry? Well, one of the key aspects of the geometry is the invariance to reference frame position and yaw. So as you can see in the diagram on the right, we have two choices of reference frame for the same visual inertial odometry state. Um, and choosing either one has no influence on the measurements received. So this has been recognized for a while and a few different solutions exist. Uh, our approach was a little bit different. What we did is we recognized this as a group action um, on the state of VIO. And that let us define a quotient manifold, which we called the VI slam manifold. So on this manifold, every element actually contains every possible choice of reference frame in the one element. So the choices shown in the diagram on the right, uh, any cho choosing zero or one, these would both be included on a single element of the quotient manifold. And this helped us find the VI slam Lie group, which is a symmetry for the VIO problem. So what I mean by that is that this Lie group 
has group actions on the state space, the quotient state space, and the visual output space. And so that's a that's the main novel contribution of our work. Um, there have been other symmetries found for the uh, state and quotient space, but not one that's also compatible with the visual output measurements. Um, and by compatibility, what I technically mean is that the diagram in the bottom right commutes. Um, and for more details, please see the paper. So this let us actually uh, implement an equivariant filter. Um, the equivariant filter is defined in continuous time. So we discretize the equations and then we implemented it using C++ with the Eigen matrix library. Um, we've developed it around being able to measure features. So we used uh, GIFT, which is a simple feature tracking library based on OpenCV to obtain features from images and pass those to the actual equivariant filter. So all the code we used is available on GitHub. Uh, both in pure CMake and as a ROS package. Here's a demonstration of uh, the performance on the UROC V102 sequence. So that um, you can see that um, the features are being tracked reasonably, but not perfectly. Um, and even though the drone moves very fast, the filter does a really good job of uh, keeping up. So at the moment, there's no uh, map reuse going on. As soon as a feature is uh, out of view, it's lost. Um, and you can also see that they all converge uh, very quickly to their final states, mostly around the walls of the room. So qualitatively, we obtain very high quality trajectories on, uh, on the four sequences shown. Uh, and this is with the same tuning parameters across all of them, of course. Uh, however, for the more challenging UROC sequences, uh, the challenge in the visual tracking of features uh, degenerated the feature tracker performance and as a consequence, also the filter performance. So this is clearly an area of future work. And quantitatively, uh, the EQF uh, our root mean square error of position is very accurate. Um, it outperforms other filter-based methods uh, on most sequences. Um, although, as I said before, right, this is with the caveat that uh, when the vision processing degenerates, so does the filter performance. So things like motion blur or changes in perspective or big displacements of features between frames or big changes in illumination, all of these can uh, really damage our filter performance. The other thing that's worth noting is that the filter is very fast. It processes uh, at less than six milliseconds per frame. Uh, of course, that is on a desktop computer, but it does indicate we'll be able to uh, adjust our filter for smaller hardware. Okay, and that's uh, one of the things we've been working on since, uh, since writing the paper is we've done some further outdoor flight experiments uh, with our own experimental drone um, so we flew the pattern of EQF in the sky above a farm, and uh, the filter did a really good job of estimating this as well. Um, however, I, I should note that, of course, the RMSE was a bit worse, uh, partly just due to the difficulty of estimating scale uh, when things are far away. So this was all presented at the uh, Arja Pilot Developer Conference, by the way, uh, which is all on YouTube if you're interested. To summarize the major contributions of the paper, we found a symmetry for visual inertial SLAM, which we're able to use to develop an equivariant filter or an EQF. And what's special about this symmetry is that it's compatible with the reference frame invariance of visual inertial SLAM, um, as well as the visual output measurements. Um, and what we use this uh, compatibility for is we define the geometric filter error on the quotient manifold um, which lets us avoid the traditional problem of unobservability of uh, position in your. So finally, our C++ implementation uh, is state-of-the-art in terms of speed and accuracy among filter-based methods, uh, but this is true as long as the uh, feature tracking uh, is of high enough quality. 
So thanks a lot for listening and uh, thanks to my co-author Rob Money. Great, thank you. Uh, if people do have questions, of course, as before, uh, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, and this will uh, conclude our, uh, our workshop. Uh, as a reminder, some reminders before uh, everybody leaves, um, uh, the entirety of the workshop will be uploaded to the YouTube. Um, additionally, uh, the slides uh, for presenters will be uploaded in the upcoming days to the workshop website. That's your go-to place for information and uh, details. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, thanks all for uh, all, thanks to all the presenters uh, that uh, took their time to come and present at the workshop, and then additionally to all the people that submitted papers. Okay, have a, uh, a wonderful rest of your day and uh, enjoy the rest of ICRA. <laughs>